Good morning, everyone, and uh, I'm really glad to see you, honestly. And uh, we probably need to, uh, to switch uh, to, uh, to switch the feed there to whatever we, uh, whatever we have at the podium. Awesome. So, restating the obvious, this is our first uh, in-person meeting since 2019. So since then, we had one IBC, two weeks to, to slow the spread, and 100 weeks of solitude. But now, we're, ba we're back, and we can finally meet each other uh, in real life and not over Zoom and Teams. Beyond that, there are uh, several news here and several firsts here. We're running now as uh, a separate ACM event, and I want to say uh, thanks to the ACM for uh, adopting us. As a result, we're able to do several new things. First of all, we grew, we grew significantly. We're now th a three-day conference. We added an all-new uh, startup discovery session, so there will be uh, 12 new uh, very, promising uh, very promising companies uh, that uh, we'll be presenting later today. We have an exhibition component, so uh, you can visit uh, people at uh, rooms 207, 208, and 210. Uh, and 210. Lastly, we're live streaming. For the first time, we're live streaming thanks to ATEM, Comcast, uh, Akamai, and Max. We're using only low latency dash, so, uh, so reach uh, HLS users. Uh, and we're using both AVC and VVC. Lastly, we'll have uh, our social, which is the first ever Alien Nerd Summit at the Mayo Wolf Denver. Please don't uh, forget to register and uh, uh, arrive there tomorrow. So, I want to thank all, our, uh, all of our sponsors and exhibitors, which is uh, uh, a synonym here. And uh, again, please go and uh, visit their uh, rooms and tables. We have three really exciting keynote speakers over this uh, the duration of the conference. You'll hear Jamie Miles uh, today. Ma uh, Madeline Nolan is going to be talking about ATSC3 tomorrow. And uh, Thierry Fautier is going to be uh, closing, the, uh, closing the conference with a, keyno uh, a keynote about the future. Speaking of the future, Please don't forget, uh, don't forget about our startup session. If anybody is interested, what do they see uh, on screens outside uh, this room? So, uh, next to our camera, we have, uh, we have an attempt at an edge contribution encoder. Uh, we're using SRT to go up to AWS, and we're running uh, attempt Titan live there and generating an ABR ladder for both AVC and uh, VVC. Both are pushed using the Dash F uh, ingest protocol to Akamai and, so, uh, and served in case of uh, the AVC output to the, to the Max player, in case of uh, VVC uh, to a variant of uh, MPV. Please, uh, uh, please uh, DM us if you, uh, if you want to get a link to it. Lastly, I uh, want to say, uh, to say thanks to our uh, committee co-chairs uh, so the steering com uh, committee, Ali Begin, uh, program committee, Christian and, uh, the, uh, and Dan Groys, both of whom will be, to will be talking soon. Apologies, let me kill this. And uh, industry outreach committee, uh, Eli Lubich from Beamer, who made much of this happen. Thank you so much, and here is Christian. Yes. Also, good morning from my side, and I'm really happy to be here and that I made the travel. Uh, over over the bond to uh, to Denver here. It's also my first time here, and uh, as Alex introduced, I'm one of the two program committee chairs. Uh, the second one is Dan, uh, who I know is online, and he will also uh, address a few, couple of things to you. When I was asked to uh, be the program committee chair for ACM Mile High Video uh, Video uh, Video Conference. Uh, I was not quite sure what will happen because it, the plan was here to have, you know, trying to close the gap between industry and academia uh, and give industry ways to demonstrate their tools, but also academia uh, to present newest advancements, innovations that then maybe in a couple of years will make it to industry, also to have a communication between these two, I think, distinct groups. And I think uh, as such, ACM uh, Mile High Video will become a unique, I guess it is already a unique event uh, in, in both industry and academia. 
That's why also we implemented a review process for all the submissions, both coming from industry and academia, uh, giving the industry people also to have a chance to have at least the one picture being published in the ACM Digital Library. This will create a, uh, I think, sustainable uh, documentation of the event that later on, even in years, 10, 20 years from now, people will be able to go back and see what we have done here the first time in 2022 and I guess beyond. So we received quite a good number of submissions, I think more than 100 submissions that we have received uh, this year. Uh, every submission was reviewed by uh, people from the program committee coming from both industry and academia and Dan and myself, uh, we really spent quite a significant amount of work to manually assign the reviews based on their backgrounds of the reviewers to really get good feedback also for, for the submissions. And then later on, we even had a full paper submission uh, where people could present their ideas a bit more in detail. Again, it was peer reviewed again. And in the end, we had about uh, 57 papers accepted for being presented here, and you will hear them later on. And then uh, 53 made it in the Final proceedings, we are still on the way submitting it, and I guess uh, that will become available uh, in the next couple of days or weeks. Uh, also, like to thank Dan here, who will show up hopefully next and pretty soon, and he will present a few more details uh, about, about the program, about the sessions. Uh, but I will stop now, and I wish you all a good, interesting, fruitful discussions in the next coming days. And now then, it's up to you. Let's see if that works. Yes, here he is. We cannot hear you. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Go ahead. So first of all, I'm happy to welcome all of you at my High Video 2022. And I'm happy that in spite of quite many concerns, they actually made this physical event possible. So, as you know, Mile High Video Conference started as a small event in 2016, and I'm personally attending it from 2017, and it has grown fast into one of the leading conferences in the video coding and video streaming field. So, this year, Mile High Video Workshop officially became the same sports and conference with hundreds of registrations. So, this is a really significant achievement. We have designed a very interesting program with great oral presentations, posters, keynotes, tutorials, and many additional activities. And also, we have a startup discovery session later today featuring very uh, promising startups. Now, I would like uh, uh, to briefly overview the program. Uh, I don't have much time, so today, right after I finish, we have a main program started with a streaming video streaming session one focused on cash and clients and deployment. After two hours, more or less, you will uh, have a short break. Uh, then we will have keynote, and after the keynote, we have a second part of the program focused on networking analytics. Now, uh, right after the lunch, which will start at 1.20 p.m., we will have a, a startup a discovery session at, at, at 2 o'clock and 40 minutes. So this startup discovery session will be featuring a special speaker, uh, Yaveta Karnal from uh, GC2 Ventures, and we will be uh, have a presentation of uh, 12 uh, very interesting startups, Vimers, Vitrifle, Computer Labs, uh, Codeven, Wave One, Small Pixels, RTTV, Magic Distillery, Netint, Live, uh, Peer, uh, Secret, and Fast. So we have really, really impressive startups. And finally, uh, it's, uh, the day of today will be concluded by Happy Out, sponsored by Focus and Dasha M. Okay, so this is really, uh, okay. uh, we have a lot of different nice. events and I'm sure you will enjoy it. Tomorrow, we will start our program with a tutorial focused on uh, Dash, on MPEG Dash. And uh, after the tutorial, we have a keynote. Uh, and after the keynote, we are starting the second part of uh, main sessions. Uh, we are focusing on uh, video coding. Uh, can you hear me? Because it seems to be stuck. And so we, we... Okay. 
Okay, so we will have a video coding uh, part one uh, with updates on uh, standards and uh, video codecs. And right after that, we have a poster session. Now, it's important to, to note that poster session will have two parts. So all posters will be presented twice, in the morning and afternoon, okay? So it's important for the speakers for this poster presented to appear in both sessions because I suppose you'll have many questions and uh, you, you should be ready to answer all of them, okay? Now, just before the lunch, we have an additional session dedicated to video coding, particularly for tools and optimizations. And uh, after the lunch, we continue with video streaming, okay? So to, to, uh, uh, before, just before the second session of posters at uh, 3.40 p.m., we have a second tutorial, very interesting tutorial, focusing on introduction to ISO DMFF and CMAP, okay? And finally, it will be concluded by social event, uh, event story and the award ceremony. So these are, these are basically two first days, very dense and uh, very focused. So I'm sure you expect you are expecting a really interesting pro, uh, uh, program. Now on the last day, day number three, we will start a, a, a day again with a tutorial uh, focused on advertisement and content replacement ecosystems. Then we will have a third part of a uh, main program with video streaming for uh, uh, based on focused on deployment and low latency. And we will have second poster session with a second set of posters. Each poster session generally 10, 11 posters. So it's quite a lot of information. And uh, uh, just before the lunch, we will have an additional main program session dedicated to video coding and specifically to video quality. Okay? After the lunch, we will have a last main program session with all the presentations focused to content discovery, distribution, immersive technologies, low latency, and the day number three will be concluded uh, with a happy hour sponsored by Amazon. So as you can see, it's a lot of different interesting stuff. Now, uh, I would like, by this opportunity, would like to uh, send, because many people have been really involved in all this uh, to make the program, uh, to make this event happen and to prepare this program. So I would like to personally send steering committee, technical program committee, industry outreach program chairs, video block award chairs, proceeding publicity chairs. You can see it's a lot of people involved and this, as well as additional reviewers for the hard work. Without you, the Malha video conference would not take place today. And my personal thanks to my colleagues, Alex Giladi, Ali Begin, Yasser Said, and my program co-chair, Christian Timmerer. Thank you. And of course, I wish, could be, I wish I could be with you today at the conference, but due to the travel policy, I couldn't get to Denver. And finally, I will be really happy if you can uh, uh, provide me with a detailed feedback at the end of the conference. So I'm very interested to hear your opinion, your response. So please drop me an email. It's all. Thank you and enjoy the conference. All right, let the show begin. Uh, get to be the opening act for this. So behind the scene delivering 4K Olympic Games, when I submitted this as an idea uh, in the middle of last year, I didn't know what direction I was going to go with it because um, there's a whole lot that this could encompass. Um, and I settled on something that I think is going to be hopefully interesting to all, and it's, a, it's focused on a partnership between NBC and Comcast. So. At Comcast, we've been working closely with NBC, uh, you know, throughout the, my involvement with, with Comcast uh, for a while and using the Olympics as an innovation platform. Um, started in, you know, London 2012 in the 4K realm, we, there, there were 4K cameras. Not a lot happened there. Things were recorded, uh, things were learned, but uh, it, it was, really kind of a what is this this new thing called 4k and then Sochi uh, Sochi Olympics um, we there was cap the content was captured it was sent back via tape or other method and we used it for demonstrations and, and viewing events um, it taught us uh, you know a little bit more about uh, you know, the challenges of 4K, the, the panels that we were using in 2014 were probably made in 2013, a lot of 8-bit displays, and we learned a lot about banding and things like that. 
um, but didn't go too far, um, you know, but it, it, it's progressing. Rio Olympics is where things really started to happen. We did a proof of concept of live linear, um, where from the Rio opening ceremonies, uh, back all to Stanford, it was done, captured in HDR and with, with Dolby Atmos, but it only went out to some specific viewing events. But it was a, a true end-to-end -end test of what could be uh, the future. Um, we also did a VOD delivery to, uh, to specific smart TV applications um, and, and learned a lot there as well. Uh, Pyong Chang, um, same sort of thing uh, with the VOD delivery. We, we didn't do a proof of concept for, or anything to uh, move forward on live linear, but we did um, uh, deliver to our customers as, uh, as VOD content. And it was 4K HDR uh, with Dolby Atmos. And then in the 2018 to 2020 timeframe, uh, we um, evolved our, our live linear platform and uh, using things like Women's World Cup. Now the interesting thing about this is Olympics being every two years, it kind of creates a forcing function, a man on the moon if you will, and usually you spend about one year after an Olympics trying to lick your wounds and then the next year trying to figure out what are we going to do next, how are we going to innovate and what are we going to push forward on. Um, for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, we were at a little bit of a, a, a standstill about trying to figure out what we could or couldn't do. We delivered live linear for, like I said, uh, Women's World Cup, a number of college um, uh, football games, things like that, but those were all delivered as national content. The Olympics, um, the Olympics primetime, the most compelling content, uh, arguably, is delivered by broadcasters um, and NBC stations. And NBC rightfully doesn't want to try to compete with that. So a national model wasn't really going to work. So come that, that one year of kind of planning and trying to figure this out prior to 2020 um, didn't give us enough time to, to build something that we thought would, was going to work. So we were going to be limited in the content that we were going to be able to deliver. It was going to be not prime time, or prime time would be to the next day, or anything like that. And if there's one thing we learned in the previous two Olympics is people like to watch live sporting events as actually as live as it can be, not the next day or two days later. Then along came COVID, and suddenly we had another year. They pushed out the 2020 Olympics to 2021. We put our heads together to come up with what could we do. Well, the, the end result of this is we delivered something that was pretty amazing with Dolby Atmos, Dolby Vision, a bunch of, of stations. The how we did this is really uh, shows kind of the partnership with NBC and the heavy lifting of this. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to diminish what Comcast accomplished because what we did was, you know, we, we had continued to evolve the platform in so many ways. What NBC did and what Grant is going to talk about is I would call more revolutionary. It was a kind of wholesale change about how uh, stations receive their content. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Grant. Good morning. Uh, my name is Grant McGilvery. I'm an architect at NBC Universal, and I'm going to go over a lot of the challenges and workflow adjustments that we made for the Tokyo and Beijing uh, Olympics here. And first, I'd like to kind of refresh the audience on the NBC local station model because it is, um, like Derek mentioned, super important to the story. So today we distribute NBC uh, over, over satellite to our local stations and they integrate local news, local advertisement, local master control, and then distribute to their ATSC transmitters and MVPD partners. Um, that is kind of a model that is set in stone and is hard for us to adjust around. So when we think about how we offer UHD to our viewers, we kind of have to fit that model. However, upgrading um, all of our local stations to UHD to pass native UHD through uh, is cost prohibitive for us and um, a logistics nightmare. Right? We have almost 200 stations across the country. So we had an opportunity here heading into the Tokyo Olympics to refresh not only our 
existing HD distribution model, but also uh, add a, a compelling UHD distribution option as well. So I'm gonna talk a lot about how we changed the model. Um, this is a workflow conversation. There's a lot of technical details under the hood that I'm happy to talk to uh, after this conference, but I'm gonna try to keep it as high level as I can. So uh, I apologize for acronym soup or, or brushing over some complex ideas here, but this is a, this is a workflow presentation. So we had an opportunity uh, heading into Tokyo to refresh our HD and UHD ecosystem. And what we did was really take, uh, take the concept from the ground up. What are some of the ideas, the, the tenets, the rules of the road that we wanted to employ when rebuilding a HD and UHD ecosystem? First of all, we wanted to extend our IP uh, ecosystem all the way to our local stations. NBC is produced in 2110 IP video. Our master control, our MUX distribution, everything is an IP uh, component at this point. And we, we, we thought this was a compelling point uh, to, to bring IP video to all of our affiliate stations. Next, we really wanted to be standards-based. So what I'm gonna show here is, is a very standards-driven uh, workflow approach. We're using SMPTE 2110, we're using SCUDI 104 and 35 messages. We're using SCUDI 224 and ESAM um, scheduling and communication. And, and it's really built on commodity hardware. This is off the shelf server components, switch components, um, to really give us a, uh, a flexibility down the road to replace or upgrade components as needed. One of the things that we care about immensely is video quality, and I think Derek would agree. And so we wanted to make sure that we enhanced our video quality for our, our viewers. To that effect, this UHD strategy is effectively an encode once strategy where we are encoding at the local site and distributing all the way to the home. And I'll go into more detail on that. But last but not least, what we really needed to do was maintain localization for our local affiliate stations. Um, they have local ad revenue, they've got breaking news, they've got EAS events, they've got weather in market, and we needed a solution that really protected that local feel uh, for these stations going into a UHD simulcast event. So how did we do that? We started from scratch. We rebuilt our HD distribution platform. New compression, new satellite transponders. This was right, right about the time of the, the, the C-band uh, migration. And we installed new hardware at all of our, our local stations. The current model is very linear. You'll notice origination on the left, kind of feeding through the station to HD distribution on the right. And in order to get our UHD content um, distributed in, and created in the way that we like, we actually had to bolt on terrestrial connectivity. So we connected to a, a 100 gig nationwide video backbone. And this was really instrumental in both HD distribution for OTT, as well as UHD distribution. So without the, without the terrestrial connectivity, this whole solution kind of falls on its face. So what used to be a, a linear distribution model um, using satellites is now a bi-directional IP terrestrial model. Next, we bolted on a new ENCODE uh, localization engine at the edge, uh, and this allows us to really respect the local station's uh, content, and I'll go into a little bit more detail there. And lastly, we centralized our handoff of the UHD content at our core sites of Inglewood Cliffs and Dry Creek, using these, these, these backbone uh, WAN pipes to get all of the nationwide local signals back to a central distribution point was crucial for, uh, for folks like Comcast to, to pick up 52 stations from one, uh, from one connection. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about what exactly we installed at the edge at each of these local stations. Um, and I wanna emphasize that this is a platform that supports multiple workflows. UHD is obviously <laughs> uh, at the top of our minds right now because of uh, Tokyo and Beijing, uh, but this is also the future of our HD distribution. So keep that in mind. So what we have at the edge is um, a software-defined workflow. These are kind of the components here that I'll go into, um, but really it all flows down from the main schedule and main origination on the left there. We're encoding into a StatMux, uh, but we're also pulling in schedule data as SCUDI 224 into a data PID in the MUX. So we're, we're distributing video as well as scheduling data all the way to our affiliate, um, our local stations. Um, there at the local station, we use an IRD to demodulate and decrypt that signal and provide unencrypted un IP video to our software decode platform. 
that um, decides what HD content gets distributed to, to our local station. We pull off the SCSI 224 schedule data and load that into uh, an LRM decision manager product. This is a CTS product that's um, an eSAM interface for us. Um, so that decision manager lives as a Docker container on our local environment at each station. And the result is an output of 2110 video that is available on a network switch at each station. Um, knowing that most stations are not ready for the IP conversion, we also do a, a decapsulation to SDI uh, as a service to, to our affiliates. Um, that signal goes to the station's master control where the local news and all the local content gets, gets integrated. And this is where the two-way street comes back, right? So we take the, the air path from our station and we come right back into the same software and hardware ecosystem. It's converted to 2110 and we encode our OTT HD experience um, and, and distribute it over an ISP. So what we have here is a green workflow for HD distribution and an orange workflow for OTT uh, backhaul. And both run um, with an eSAM decision manager kind of telling each local schedule what to do. So we took this foundation, which is the foundation of our HD workflow, and bolted on a UHD component. Um, because we're in IP environment now, we can really embrace 2110, and we simply connect another server to the same network switch, do another multicast join, and away we go. We've, we've DA'd the video. So we installed a Harmonic XOS uh, encoder, or pair of encoders for X and Y redundancy, at each affiliate, and did a multicast join of the station's HD signal. We brought that into that encoder and upconverted it to our UHD HDR um, spec, you know, 2160 with full uh, Dolby Vision uh, color space. We fed that into a switch, effectively a two by one switch, an AB switch. Um, and, and that is the local contribution for, um, for our, our UHD workflow. This is in case of local news or, or, or local advertising. Um, coming in from the left, we actually do a simulcast and we feed a high quality MES stream from our uh, production facilities to each station using the terrestrial WAN. And that comes in as a, a UHD signal uh, at full resolution and, and makes the other input to the switch. Now, we switch back and forth, and I'll get into how we do that. But the output of that switch is then run through the, uh, an HEVC encoder, where we make a, a four-tier ABR ladder. It's not packaged. It's just four discrete SPTSs. And we feed those four streams back across our WAN to our central distribution. So what you kind of see here is three workflows all working harmoniously or on the same hardware in the same IP environment and really brings the compelling story for how all these systems can really um, synergize. So to review, we've got uh, the purple line originating at the main schedule. And for uh, Olympics prime time, it's actually a, a UHD simulcast. We are originating uh, our content in UHD in Tokyo and Beijing and down converting it to HD for a national HD distribution. That's why the purple line feeds into the green line. So this is a true simulcast model. And what we're doing at the edge is then switching in programming rather than advertising into uh, that, that feed. So when uh, UHD content is available, when it is scheduled, when it is cleared, um, the, the harmonic encoder switches between an upconverted HD content from the station and this native UHD content distributed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the control interface for all of this. Um, but really, it's, it's localized switching using SCSI triggers. Um, we, we've really leaned into SCSI 104 and 35 as a standard that we are embracing for, for controlling all sorts of things in our workflow. To this effect, we're inserting program start and program stop triggers for UHD content. And inside those SCSI 104, well, they originate as SCSI 104, but they're SCSI 35 at the edge. Uh, but those SCSI, those SCSI markers contain all the metadata we need to drive a schedule. So the XOS encoders at the edge will pull in a 2110 HD feed from the station and look for those embedded frame accurate SCSI triggers and bounce them off of the LRM decision manager using eSAM. The response will be do nothing in most cases, but during UHD content, they'll get a response that says, hey, this is a UHD event. Feel free to switch over to the UHD national feed if available. Because SCSI is frame accurate and in, embedded in the video, 
uh, we, we had a very clean, very uh, frame accurate switch point to make those, those switches. So you can see here a switch from uh, HD national content to a UHD national event and then a switch back to the HD national equivalent at the end of the program. And this is simple start and stop triggers that we are decorating in our content already. So we didn't generate any new triggers for this experience. We simply utilized what was already there. On the bottom you can see two uh, bluish lines and this is um, kind of the visualization of the rules engine at work. So at the bottom we have an HD native policy. We, we really wanted to protect the local experience so the default rule set for this whole environment is up convert your HD signal for the station and distribute that. Worst comes to worst, we're just distributing the local station in an up converted manner. When possible, we apply a rule on top of that. We call it the HD content rule. And when this UHD content is available, that policy is activated. And when the program end trigger comes in, that policy is removed. So you can see that kind of layer cake happening there. So what we have are nationalized triggers that are in our national HD feed that are driving localized UHD switching using a local rule stack. And really this was the secret to, to doing this whole project uh, economically for, for this, this many stations. Um, it really kind of is um, dynamic ad insertion except dynamic program insertion um, and more with uh, live to live switching. So it's something we're really excited about and something we, we intend to grow in the future. So you may ask, well, how do you protect local ad content then? And we do the exact same thing for local breaks, right? Um, we're in an HD event. We want to go back to the local uh, station for their, uh, their local break, their local ad inventory. What do we do? We start a break with a, a break start trigger. That trigger applies a new rule. We're calling it the HD commercial break rule. Very self uh, descriptive here, which actually goes back to that up converted content. When the break stops and we get a break end trigger, we remove that policy and we fall back to the underlying UHD policy which is still active. So this is how we can switch into UHD and then back out of UHD pretty seamlessly using uh, our SCUDI 35, SCUDI 104 triggers. Um, and this really is the, the key to protecting that local experience. Um, I don't have a slide here but we, we also offer each of our local stations a physical interface to, to bypass this whole process. And, and that is simply um, another rule on top of this entire cake. It's the, uh, the oh no button, right? The, uh, the uh, na na breaking news, I need to get, get out of the UHD event. And so when they press that, they actually get a, a, a fourth rule that trumps everything, right? The, the bypass, the entire system button. And that uses um, ESAM, SCUDI 104, and um, the same rules engine. So everything exists inside this environment, even, even our our bypass options. So once we've decided whether or not you get UHD content and when, we really wanted to maximize the experience to the viewer. And this was something we care deeply about. We've got a whole crew of video quality experts and analyzing this and audio experts uh, listening to things. And so what we, what we settled on was a, a four, uh, four profile ABR ladder, la sorry, ABR ladder starting all the way at the top at a true 2160p, um, you know, 5994 um, rendition. This has uh, full Dolby Vision uh, 8.1, which is also back backwards compatible to HDR10, as well as Dolby Atmos surround sound. So this is uh, what we call um, a 5.1 plus 4. So it's your regular six channel surround sound plus four overhead speakers for that really immersive audio experience. So we're, we're, we're providing four renditions uh, of this UHD content um, as individual SPTSs. And this was important to us to try to maintain um, flexibility for all of our MVPD partners. Um, they may not all be Dash or, or have a packager of choice. So what we wanted to do is just provide the raw materials for uh, a partner to distribute on their own platforms. And this was as close as we could get. Um, we landed at 18 megs for the, for the highest bit rate. After some exhaustive VQ testing, we really didn't see, um, you know, demonstrable improvement above that as far as our end viewers are concerned. And as it happens, 18 megs fits nicely into a QAM. You can put two into a QAM. So we felt that was a good um, middle ground for us to land on for, uh, for, for video quality. We also had um, true stereo descriptive audio for the first time, which I think was, was pretty cool and, and a great addition to the immersive audio experience. And, and I want to reiterate that this, 
this encode was not a, uh, intended to be an MVPD handoff. This was intended to be passed all the way through to the viewer. And, and Derek will talk a little bit about how that was accomplished. But this is the encode one strategy that really maximizes our video quality from our local stations to the home with the idea that this never gets transcoded again. It doesn't get knocked down to fit on someone else's platform. The, the, the idea here is that we're providing the raw materials that each partner can take all the way to, to their viewers. So Derek, do you want to come up and talk a little bit about what Comcast was able to do with these signals? Sure. Thanks, Grant. So from the Comcast side, this is architecturally, it's a pretty small change. Um, where we used to um, take all the, the transcoding in-house, and that's what works and still works for a national, it wasn't scalable to do for every NBC station that we were dealing with. So having this kind of a handoff made sense to us. And it's an architecture that's not completely foreign to us. We had what we called a remote single gen, which was our um, attempt to get the highest quality output by doing uh, SDI handoff at broadcasters and stations and, and deliver something that had only been encoded once so that we didn't lose any, any video quality. What we did do with this is we handed over control of that transcode uh, to the station. Um, we did a proof of concept for this um, in the fall of 2020. And, we, and then while NBC was building this out, we uh, worked closely with them to test what they were doing. We knew that with a good network, uh, this just works. And then all the networking pieces that Grant was talking about uh, came into play. And there was uh, some consternation along the way, but it ended up coming up really well. We took a, a very conservative approach for Tokyo for how we presented this to our users. Um, and we learned a lot along with NBC, but it was overall, it was a resounding success. Because of that success for the Beijing Olympics, we kind of released all the gates um, to how we presented this to our customers. We have what we call auto-tune. And it, historically, it's been if you landed on an SD channel and you had an HD capable device, you went to the HD version of the same piece of content. We extended that to if you had a 4K and HDR uh, capable uh, set-top box and display, you were auto-tuned to the NBC equivalent to that, uh, the UHD equivalent to that NBC station. So it was a fairly aggressive approach, and it went extremely well. Um, so we put things in the grid guide. We did everything we could to promote this. And overall, uh, for Beijing, something that I didn't know was going to necessarily happen when I originally started the idea for this paper, but it went really well and uh, I, I think an overall huge success. So um, Alex or, or Christian, I don't know what if we do Q&A or save Q&A for later since we probably went much longer than our allocated time, but um, uh, we are both around if you'd like to ask. Go ahead. I think Alex is getting a microphone. So from, uh, from Dry Creek to the local stations, you did a 100 gig backhaul, uh, terrestrial WAN? Uh, we, we have a national 100 gig backbone already in place, and uh -huh. we installed uh, tail circuits to the, to the next closest. You closest. answered my question. Yeah. Thank you. It, it's, a, it's an A and B redundant network. Yeah. Thank you. Question over here. I can do it with that mic. Okay. Um, I'm a PH station, and I see in the diagram that it was 2110 at the gate of the station, and I've had a switch. Is there a PPP on the idea, or is it just a free one? Your questions around PTP? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, PTP at the edge is always difficult. Uh, we do have PTP running at each one of our local stations to support the 2110. How it's derived kind of uh, changes between each station situationally. But yes, we, we operate in, inside uh, the NBC's ecosystem as 2110, 
and then we decapsulate to SDI for an SDI handoff for the affiliates, and then they uh, in turn hand us an SDI and we encapsulate that. Um, for that solution, we, uh, you know, we have a Mellanox switch and we're actually using uh, embryonics or Riedel SFPs to do some of that NCAP decap locally in the switch. Yeah. So make sure I, under, I heard the question. So with AutoTune, do we have any statistics for how many times that it was successful versus? Just like how many devices were there? Do you have like how percentage of your viewership on your 4K versus on your Yeah, I think um, So we do have statistics for uh, essentially every bit of that. Um, I, I'm not sure where, what, uh, what yours, we, so we have, only two 4K capable set-top boxes of our entire X1 uh, platform. So the eight, you know, all of those that don't even have a 4K set-top box are going to be limited to the HD version uh, because of that. But within the ecosystem of 4K set-top boxes, then it becomes whether you have a 4K HDR display attached, which is reliant upon EDID and getting the right color space information back uh, over EDID. Um, the percentage of displays that were attached, we have uh, fairly good metrics on that, and that's really what tended to drive um, how, how many of the, the percentage of those that tuned. So did that answer your question? Sort of. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Dolby Vision Live workflows, were, were those video signals native Dolby Vision, or did you kind of piggyback off of what TEC had been doing with like HLG and then converting those to it's, it's a great question. So in the harmonic encoders, um, it uses the Dolby LDP uh, functionality to do real-time analysis to create the, the metadata. Um, as far as the, the lookup tables that are used throughout this workflow, because we're mentioning about upconverting and then also taking something that was uh, created as, as HDR and delivering it as SDR through the HD lane, um, we're using the NBC uh, LUTs uh, throughout. Um, so it's, it's not the BBC LUTs, uh, the, the NBC LUTs, and it, in, in my mind, it looked flawless. Um, you know, I, knowing when things were going to change, I could keep a very close eye on the screen, and I could, I could see resolution shifts, and I could see upscaling artifacts if I really paid attention. I never saw any color changes that were, that were noticeable. Yeah, we're really proud of the LUTs that we developed um, specifically to make, you know, the, the 4K HDR content as captured in Tokyo and Beijing look as good as possible on the HD side. Um, so down, down mixing, down converting was just as important to us as making UHD look good. Those LUTs are great. Yeah. I had a, a question on the transport side. Is um, uh, it's uh, basically to VMVPDs? Uh, it's a, basically a fourfold increase in TS outputs. Um, over basically unmanaged internet. How did uh, NBC work on that problem uh, to packagers outside of the organization? Yeah, so um, we leveraged our, our nationwide backbone to get these streams back from the local station back to Dry Creek and Ingua Cliffs. Uh, from there, we met a, what we call a meet me switch, which is a, a, you know, a meet me point for all these signals. Between our dry, our dry Creek centralized distribution and our and our affiliate is, um, it's a managed connection. So we have a lot of control there. For this, we actually used SRT. We liked the idea the idea of you know re recovering those packets and latency wasn't as much of, a, of an issue for us. Um, but you know going into the next Olympics, the next innovation of this project, I think transport and how we get the signals across the country is absolutely something we're looking at. Did that answer your question? Oh, last question? Last one. Yeah, so on the um, content creation side, so like in uh, Beijing and in the uh, Olympics, what sort of revenue did you have to ensure was in place? What was that kind of process for setting up the actual video uh, context to be able to treat it? 
Yeah, so the question was about what kind of infrastructure goes into creating the 4K signals in, in venue. And um, we have a whole group within NBC called NBC Sports, and that's like their prime focus. And they work with the Olympics groups. A lot of those cameras are pooled, and there's some you know, communal resources on the international level. So really, it's an agreement at that level that you know, all the cameras and all the, all the recording devices and all the graphics machines are going to kind of meet a minimum spec. So from there, we did our LUTs and down converted um, to, our, to our HD distribution model. So yeah, it was an agreement kind of at that higher level. Thanks so much, everyone. And if you want to reach out, um, Thank you. we'll answer some questions offline. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful first talk. Let's move on. All right. Ah, good morning, everybody. I am excited to be here to talk to you, uh, primarily about Dash HLS interop specification, uh, <laughs> but I promise we will have a little bit about the deployment of it, too. Um, I am Zachary Cava. I work at Disney Streaming. I am a senior principal software engineer in the media engineering organization, so everything that makes streams come true. Uh, I'm also the chair and editor of the Dash HLS interop uh, group and the CTA WAVE project and the co-chair of the SVA Advertising Working Group. So I actually get to talk to with many of you in the audience, so super fun to be back in person talking to you. Uh, today I want to kind of give you background and overview on the uh, Dash HLS specification, reasons for it, um, and the outputs that, are, that, that came together in the first edition, and then talk about how this is really practical um, from an industry standpoint and, and um, in actual practice. So let's get started. Uh, that clock's not running, but we're going to wing it. Let's see what we do. OK, CMAF and interoperability. Now, I don't think I need to explain to this audience what the common media application format is. <laughs> Pretty well known here. Uh, you know, We all love and know the CMAF presentation, the selection sets, the switching sets, tracks, headers, uh, fragments, and all the very fun things that make up the constraints for it. And you know, the reason we put together the CMAF the uh, CMAP format was to bring a higher level of interoperability to our deployments and devices and distribution, right? Um, and so then you might be asking, okay, you already have a spec about interoperability. Why did you make another spec about interoperability? And it actually comes down to what CMAP explicitly says it doesn't want to deal with, and that's the manifest formats, right? In the CMAP specification, we have a great detail about the um, encoded, addressable, and logical objects, but the actual format for addressing and accessing these things is not specified. And those formats can actually bring in a lot of different constraints and profiles. And here's just a few that I'm not going to rattle off, but you, you get the picture. And if you only had one manifest, uh, CMath manifest format, everything would be great. We wouldn't have to worry about this. I wouldn't have to be here, and you wouldn't have to listen to me. But Turns out, we as an industry have two. <laughs> we have Dash and we have HLS. And these two formats actually bring differences in uh, their definition of media profiles and functionality and how to address content. And that means we need a hot, another level of interoperability because ultimately those definitions affect those CMAP presentation. Right? Um, and if it's if it's this is a little bit of a feral question as to like what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you a little quiz. So feel free to write these down. I'm not going to collect it or, or grade it. I'm no longer a TA. But uh, here's some questions that kind of motivate this. Right? When we talk about text components, and you're in, in the situation, you're, you're building a, you want to distribute to a Dash HLS uh, ecosystem, uh, and you want to make this content packaged once. Uh, so when te your text components, what profile of IMSC should you be using for authoring these text components? If you're using encryption, and particularly CVCS encryption, what pattern and size of IV allows for the maximum device compatibility? And then finally, the fun one, low latency live. Should low latency chunks be authored as standalone objects or byte ranges and segments? Right? These are questions that are all enabled by the CMAS specification, but they're bound differently in the Dash and HL aspects. Right? And so it was questions like these, which you'll see all the time in standards groups and industry bodies and video dev Slack, if you're in there. Um, and there's an ephemeral knowledge of this in, in the ether. And we really wanted to codify that and bring that together. And so we created the Dash HLS interoperability specification. And in this creation, we analyzed CMAF, Dash, and HLS to look for what was missing, right? What were the inconsistencies? What were the things that were just kind of like, oh, yeah, everybody knows that, but not codified anywhere? 
And it'd be a Herculean task to go through everything. We could probably sit in the cave for about 10 years, get it all right, and then realize we were three spec versions behind. So we focused really on key use cases based on deployment experience, right? Experience of the members of the CTA Wave Group that we're part of, and particularly um, from our, our experience with uh, Disney streaming. Um, and this accumulate, accumulate, <laughs> sorry, accumulated in a uh, year's worth of work in May 2021, where we re released the first edition. You can find it at the URL here at the bottom. I tried to make it nice and short. Couldn't make it any shorter. But uh, I, I want to note that this will go to the CTA store. The spec is 100% free. We just you go through the shopping cart. It helps us understand how widely this is being accessed, used, and better focus our efforts uh, in the future. But uh, the spec itself, just to give you kind of overview, is built into three sections. The first section, and is about the hardest thing for engineers, which is terminology alignment. Uh, if you look at the CMAF dash and HLS specifications, they all use different terms for the same thing. Track, representation, variant, very, very similar concepts, slight differences, but we wanted to bring together an understanding and give you common terminology to go through the rest of these constraints. The second portion of the specification is all about packaging, right? What do you need to do in addition to the base CMAF constraints to use that content in both Dash and HLS? Um, and finally, we thought it'd be interesting to also address addressing. <laughs> so when you're, when you're trying to actually access your presentation and deliver it, um, where, how could you address it consistently so that you can actually cross-convert between Dash and HLS representations? This brings higher levels of efficiency because you can do uh, translation at the edge or potentially even on the client if you want to get really fancy with it. Um, and like I said, we could go through it, the spec and do everything, but it'd be a lot. It'd be like just too much. And so we focused on use cases, we focused on the big five, which are uh, on-demand streaming, live streaming, low la latency live streaming, which this, should be, this whole presentation is, uh, encrypted media presentations, AKA DRM, and presentation splicing, ad insertion, right? Um, these are the kind of big things, and there's a lot of great details, and I really wish we had two hours to just sit here and talk about it, but we don't, and so I want to highlight some very fun key things that I just like quoting all the time. Um, and so we're going to go back to the quiz. So I hope you wrote your answers down. Let's see if you got it right. right? On text components, what profile of IMSC should you be using? Uh, and remember, IMSC has two profiles. They have uh, text-based profiles and image-based profiles. If you want interoperability, you actually only can use text. You cannot use an Im image binding within uh, one of the manifest formats. And on top of that, IMSC 1.0 is actually the most interoperable. 1.1 uh, is gaining traction, uh, but it's there, we haven't found a lot of tooling. And so in consideration for these constraints, we were looking at what has been implemented. What will you not have barriers to entry with? Right? This is meant to help you help be a turnkey specification in getting things up and running. Uh, CBCS encryption. This one is probably the old hat. Everyone's like, oh yeah, everyone knows this, right? Video, 1.9 pattern, audio, 10.0, right? Uh, and we decided to codify that because it's actually not stated in any um, encoding binding specifications and uh, CMAF allows a variability in it because of the definition of CBCS. Um, new codex, I believe AV1 actually did specify uh, the, the encrypt, yep, Sarah's confirming that for me. <laughs> we did specify the actual uh, patterns, which is great, but this is, it's meant to be a reference for everything else, right? And then on top of that, there was a really interesting one that kind of was cropping up really randomly, but IVs need to be 16 bytes. You actually have the option to do 8 byte IVs, but the implementation of how that's expanded to the 16 bytes in the actual decryption is not specified. And so we, what we found in doing a survey of people uh, doing CBCS encryption, if you worked in the right combination of software and hardware decryption environments, your content wouldn't work sometimes. And it's because the implementations were doing different things to the other eight. Uh, so really trying to say, always use 16. And we actually went back to the CMAF uh, group at MPEG to bring these details forward. Low latency life. Now this was a great use case because it was drafting on all the work we did in the industry to make it work anyways. Uh, so Dash and HLS groups came together and did a lot of work to bring low latency Dash and Apple latency uh, to, the, to the streaming community. And that's great. We did have interop, thankfully. Um, and when you're doing this, actually the higher level of interop is with byte ranged addressing because you not only get to be able to translate between Dash and HLS, your low latency and regular latency clients get to use the exact same bytes on the edge. And that's a much greater efficiency uh, for uh, your overall delivery. 
And of course, because we all worked together to do this, we had packaging interop, which was great. Unfortunately, we do not have manifest interoperability. They're actually missing cues in both formats, so it's not easily uh, cross-convertible right now. It's not, you can't do it with a standalone document. Um, and that's something that we want to work through the details of and help broaden, and broaden the interoperability profile over, over time. But yeah, so great fun little details. Curious if you've got them all right, come find me afterwards and let me know if this is obvious or not. But um, I want to talk a little bit about why interoperability matters in practice, right? Uh, and I really like thinking about interoperability as the change in the industry, right? So if you, if you roll back 2010, 2012, you kind of had four choices to stream, right? Uh, there, there was a more here and there, but the majority of streaming was these four applications. Any TV or device that you had, you had access to these. And to do that, these services had to go bespoke. Every different TV and variant and thing had a different packaging. It was terrible. <laughs> and that's where CMF came out, right? That was the interoperability point there. And now if you look at today, right, we've got a magnitude of streaming options. And it's great. These options are available everywhere. But they're continuing to expand, too. And that, this is where they're starting to hit these problems, right? The more you want to expand, the more you have to understand a broader ecosystem and interrupt with more places. And this is why interoperability is important. Now, there's one more change that's happening in our industry, right? On this slide, I've got 32 streaming services. But the question is, how many companies do I have here now? In the last two to three years, that answer has changed drastically. And with companies coming together, there are always the super fun talks of merging and bringing technical stacks together, which is the best conversations you'll ever have. Uh, and, so, and while I can't speak to the industry at large, I can speak to four services, <laughs> which is Hulu, Disney+, Plus, ESPN+, Plus, and Star+. Plus, right? These are the services of Disney streaming. And if you don't know right now, uh, Hulu was an independent entity from Disney. Disney was one of the, uh, one of the um, co-owners, but it became the majority owner, and uh, there's a thing with Comcast still. But they, um, we are working to bring these technical stacks together. These, two, these, uh, these applications are actually running on two separate stacks, one powering Disney+, Plus, Star+, Plus, and ESPN+, Plus, and one powering Hulu. And so in the due diligence aspect, we started going through an understanding, OK, when we want to bring these things together, particularly from a media perspective, um, how do we go about doing this? Like, what are, you know, are, is it going to be possible? Are we going to go crazy? Um, the answer is, I don't know. So use cases. We looked at use cases in these apps. And these apps have everything. They have on-demand, they have live, they have add-ons, they have DRM, they have ad insertion. It's kind of insane. But it's cool. There's so many complexities to it. And when you talk about, but it was consistent, right? And when you talk about AV features, similarly, high-level features, UHD, HDR, blah, 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 blah. Consistent, though, right? And we talked about packaging. Well, we had actually naturally aligned to CMAP because that's what helped bring scale, bring efficiency, bring delivery. And that's great. Well, wait, delivery. How do you guys deliver your manifest and manifest formats and playlist formats? Well, the answer for one side was HLS. The answer for the other side was, well, mostly Dash. And at that point, it was like, right, Ralph, panic and dissing. Are we going to have a problem here? And we dug into it. Naturally, because of all the variety of use cases, these services ended up having the similar set of constraints. All of the constraints that you find in this specification are derived actually from our experience here. And it's a codification of that. And because of that, even though it was a question mark to begin with, it became a reality that we can bring these together. We can bring together these content libraries without re-encoding. I don't have to, t <laughs> I can't tell you exactly how big that is, but it means I don't have to spend six months looking at something with a progress bar, <laughs> right? We don't have to re-encode. We don't have to rewrite players. And in many cases, we don't have to redeploy applications, and we can bring these media delivery pieces together. And that's interoperability, right? That's powerful. Let's just focus on the much more innovative and creative aspects of that, that bringing that platform together. And there's going to be some really cool talks on it. That person over there will give you a good talk. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> no, uh, but we'll talk about it more in the future, and really look forward to sharing it. But it's, I really wanted to show how much interoperability can play at gaining efficiency and gaining scale. So wrapping up really quick, because I think I'm over time. Please, I think the specification will help you. Give it a read. Uh, links again there. Um, if you have comments, questions, issues, 
feel free to email me. That is my email. Used to be hulu.com, now it's districtstreaming.com. They both come to me, but refer to that one. Um, and if you have any use cases of interest, please get involved in CTA Wave. Uh, second edition is already underway. We're going to hit some new use cases uh, that are interesting and also looking at tooling. Uh, we want to bring in, it's great to have something that says what constraints are. It's also good to have something that tells you if you did it wrong. And then finally, CMFIF. There are many CMF activities going on. Please uh, look at joining CMFIF. Uh, survey, industry survey available and uh, test suites and content. Super interesting. I recommend taking a look, uh, but thank you. Thank you. All right, sorry for the little bit of a shuffle there. Um, okay, so uh, my name is David Hassoun. This is June Heider. Uh, we previously um, were a company called Realize. Uh, I started that, ran that for about 18 years. Um, and uh, we were acquired by Dolby uh, this last year and it's been really fun. Um, today we're gonna be talking about learning from failure um, in the past. Uh, obviously we have a relatively short presentation so we're gonna have to keep this a little bit high level, um, but we're excited to kind of talk about this. Um, we've had the the honor to work on major events, a number of Olympics, Super Bowls, World Cups, stuff like that. Um, uh, we've learned a lot. We failed a few times. Originally, we were, we were kind of going to try to target talking about a lot of the bigger failures in our industry that happened um, over time and what really came out of that. Uh, and we talked to a lot of our friends and colleagues in the industry and, and got some good in input and insight. Um, we're going to keep it a little bit more generic <laughs> so we don't call out people too much. Um, but uh, wanted to kind of dive in a little bit into, you know, when we think about major failures, a lot of times this is going to be a little bit more centric around live events. Uh, but a lot of this also applies elsewhere. Um, you know, what, what has happened, what continually happens, what has improved, um, and what can we kind of try to, like, look for and do about it a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and start diving in. Um, this was a good quote that I liked to kind of kick this thing off. The price of success must be paid in full in advance, right? You want to have a major streaming event that is successful, it's going to be the upfront work that makes that happen. If all goes well, the event is quiet and smooth. Um, if not, it's a total shit storm. Um, and you don't want that. So, you know, when I first started talking to some of our people out there, you know, one of, the, one of the things I got was like, well, you really need to just be able to trust your vendors. And I really called bullshit on that right out of the gate. Um, trusting up front is very dangerous, right? The goal is to get to trust. Get to the point that you trust in what your partners and your providers and your um, CDNs, everything is what they are going to deliver. To get there, take some time. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll play with trust. I'll come up with something that makes sense with that. And, you know, the best I kind of started with was, well, first you're going to test, then you're going to retest, you're going to understand the results, then you're going to stop freaking changing things just for a minute, then you're going to test again, then you're ready to execute, right? Um, and that's really key. You know, it's all about code freezes and other elements within there, but you need to get to the point that you can trust. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we see a lot is, okay, great, we're using these different providers. If one's for authentication, potentially MVPD stuff, um, we have CDNs, we have other services and so forth going in there. You know, each one of those, we can ask them, to, hey, do your test. We want to hit this type of capacity, this type of con concurrency. And each one will independently oftentimes go through, validate, and, and try to provide you proof within there. That type of kind of almost unit-driven testing is only a small portion of what we really need to make sure that we cover. Um, oftentimes, though, there's key things that can be overlooked within there, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, some of the things that we've seen in there. So holistically, it's very difficult to be able to test all this together, especially at that scale and the systems as they flow. But that is where we need to try to move to as well, um, and that's where we get the best safety, that best confidence. That's where we start building that trust um, in what we hear and what we see is actually true. So we kind of broke this down to simplify stuff a little bit into kind of four categories up front. We have APIs, we have delivery, we have devices, and we have data. So diving right in, APIs, right? This is where our applications are driven from, the data that drives them, how we find content, how we access um, the actual streams, uh, how they are protected, and so forth. This is still one of the, probably the largest points of failure in, in events that we see nowadays. Um, and ultimately, it's one of the worst type of scenarios, right? I'm a paying user, paying subscriber, and now I can't access the content that I want to get to. That is the first and foremost bottleneck that we often run into. 
How do we have to deal with that? How, is, how do we prepare for that? And how do we work around that? Same thing around authorization or within encryption. If there is a problem in that stack, it stops there, right? Um, and how do we want to address with that? It becomes critical. You know, when applicable, we always want to have options for failover. And is that even reasonable? You know, can we go from a, well, we have a nice walled garden into, okay, we're gonna have to open this up so we can have people access the content at this time. Um, and that's a tricky one. We have to kind of work through that. We have to see what's going to be reasonable and what's not. Um, but that's really key. Um, also on these APIs, this is one of the key points that we really need to hammer those from a testing capacity standpoint. Recently working on some stuff, you know, we ran two scenarios where vendors like, hey, listen, we've tested this stuff at scale beyond what we're going to hit. Great performance. But we were still seeing interesting oddities in some of the performance up front. Well, nothing's changed in, in six months. Everything's good. It's my favorite thing to hear always. Don't worry, nothing's changed since this last major successful event. I promise you, right? Um, that means something is wrong, right? Uh, you're asking for too much trust up front. And, and you know, you're not going to be able to always kind of ferret out further than that um, for reality of what has changed. But as an example, you know, we saw um, you know, great results from massive scaled testing on some of the APIs. Um, and they were critical ones in, in our critical path. But um, everything looked great. Super low error rates, really fast response times, everything. But we saw in our kind of actual real world testing that we still had occasional data that was indicating something was going slow. Um, what we did in diving into that data, looking at the network content, we actually found that it was the um, initialization of that request that was taking so long. Talking deeper with vendors, when they did their testing, they weren't testing through their load balancers as much. They were bypassing it and testing on their device, on their instances more. Their instances were performing great. Recently, they apparently had done a change and changed it to a different load balancer system. Um, oops, yeah, sorry, we forgot to mention that. Um, but that one was now having an issue at inducting time in those connections. Um, so those are the type of things that you really need to try to hammer out, and it's going to be difficult at times. Part of that is really getting clear details on what the vendors, the different services are actually testing and how, and how that relates to your in-production systems. Um, other areas, delivery and streaming, right? Historically, this has been some really major issues. Now, CDNs never go down, okay? Another thing that you need to be conscious of. Um, but they might not always perform really good in certain situations in certain areas, right? Okay, CDNs have gone down, and, but that has really been more of an element of the past in larger aspects. It still can happen, and you need to be prepared. One of the first and foremost things nowadays is having some form of a multi-CDN strategy. That is a fairly standard um, consideration, whether it's smart, intelligent multi-CDN solutions, um, where you're able to actually redirect users per segment to the most performing um, endpoint for those requests. That's where more robust systems are heading to. Or just fa failure scenarios. Hey, I am not able to reach this here. I'm going to try it from somewhere else, right? Um, so that's still key to make sure that you always have. Um, but they have really shifted more towards the performance side than for, oh, crap, the world's ending. Um, and usually for larger events, when you're engaging with your CDN and so forth, they're prepared, they're ready, they've done their validation as well, and it usually isn't a major issue. Where we see more issues nowadays in live streaming events um, of critical nature are small issues in coding and packagers. Um, things that can relate to specific devices now having a problem, which we'll talk a little bit about next. Uh, but that's a critical one. That's hard always to necessarily understand and see. You need to have really good monitoring within there. All the testing in the world prior to, you might not ever see this issue. And of course, during game day, that issue can come up. Um, how you react to it, the data that you also gather from that will be key. Um, but hardening that as much as possible is a really, really important aspect to look at. Where we really start driving more complexity in advanced features, that's where we have more and more issues arise, of course. Big one, of course, being dynamic ad insertion. Um, that is a critical element that adds a lot of complexity. Uh, one of the things that you know, we've always really tried to push hard on is, is validating all the ads, especially if it's a major event, ahead of time, both for machine, oftentimes also eyes, looking for key things, you know, segment sizes, um, encoding, um, other aspects that can actually really trip stuff up. Back in the day, we used to see lots of times where you'd get a you know, 0.2 second segment um, on a 30 second ad as the last bit. That could then crash players uh, and so forth. That's largely been really tightened up over time. That's been a really good learning point, um, but there's still elements within there. Um, if you're doing companion ads, I despise companion ads 
good luck. That's all I'm going to say for that, right? Companion ads on a web page or even in apps, um, so many things can go up. And largely the biggest things that we see there is massive implication of performance. Like, oh, it's the coolest looking ad with all this whiz bang and other stuff. And I don't care what I'm doing to the performance of the, uh, the app and the player at the time uh, when that happens in, compa in companion with the actual video. Um, I've yanked so many companion ads over the years, um, real time, because we've seen issues, uh, and it's best to catch those in advance if you can. Um, luckily, those aren't as prevalent these days, um, so yay, lesson learned. Um, and of course, when you start adding more complexities within you know, advanced audio, surround, outmost, vision, other stuff, you're adding more complexity in, in your devices, your logic that you need to handle those, make sure it's going to the right devices, and all the things that can go wrong. Um, so uh, validation testing, of course, becomes key there. Um, when we talk about devices, <laughs> what a myriad of opportunity of things to go wrong, right? There's such a wide spectrum of different devices, different device types, um, older devices that are still being used, um, cheap devices which seem really appealing to consumers that make our lives miserable day in and day out um, that we always have to deal with. And some of this stuff can happen over time. I know like when Roku first released their first 4K device, it was beautiful, it was awesome, yay, 4K. And if you're delivering HLS, you can't do more than five megabits per second um, or it crashed the device. Uh, wonderful things like that are what we always are gonna have to consider, to deal with, um, be creative on, testing, um, validating, identifying, knowing when you have problems area. It's a promise that we all often have to deliver. Uh, we can deliver any device anywhere. Crap, I can't guarantee you it's going to play for more than four hours, um, but it can play. I promise you that. Um, and that goes into some of the challenges, too. One of the things that's also happened a lot in the past and now has shifted um, was full DVR windows. Um, so now when there's major events, especially longer ones, you know, I remember working on Super Bowl stuff in the past where we'd start the stream, you know, four hours before game time and run it for a few hours after. And it was a full DVR with dynamic ad insertion. Um, that had, you know, iffy um, delayed kind of, you know, lazy ad loading. Um, and startup times after the third quarter, you know, would skyrocket. <laughs> um, because the manifests were so massively large and the performance hit every, um, you know, six seconds uh, for the manifest parsing, started to actually cause problems. Um, luckily, we've learned. We've shifted away from a lot of that. Uh, longevity testing when it comes to devices is really critical. You know, we've seen, once again, like, hey, we're going to have a long event or a long stream. Um, what devices are going to be able to maintain that performance really well? Some devices have minor little memory leaks over time. That can be in the player. That can be also in the device themselves that have issues over time and start to become unstable. Um, seeing which ones you can be your problem children be really powerful to understand what that looks like, what you can do about it. Um, that can be through encoding, can be through your packaging um, or other areas. But that's going to be a challenging area that you always have to do. One of the things I really strongly recommend is, you know, be very clear on what your success criteria is up front and what variance is allowed when you start talking about devices, especially your kind of long tail devices that are on the older side, are on the cheaper side, um, because that's going to drive a lot of the decisions that you have to make and the compromises you make to have that successful event and to cover that spectrum. Um, and last but not least is going to be the data. Um, this is really kind of powerful and interesting one. In the past, you know, massive events, new records and so forth, every time they're always getting broken, but you know, we had major issues with even having access to the, the real-time analytics. That so much data was coming in, they're like, don't worry, your data's there, it's, it's all there. It's just the front end that's not responsive right now. Um, but this is a live event, I need to know how we're doing, preferably right now, um, but thanks, I'm glad that the data's there for the future. Um, I can know if something went, went wrong the next day when I'm getting yelled at by someone. Um, those are real challenges that we've seen and have, have run into. Now, a lot of that's been improved by better scalability and also better predictability um, and, and balancing within this stuff. But there's still elements around how fresh is the data we're looking at. If we're making real-time decisions, how close is our data to that? And in analytics, sometimes it's not as real-time as you think it is. Um, it can be, uh, but that's really important to understand that and understand the, the decisions you make, how long they take to also apply based off of that. And one of the things that we're really seeing as towards the future is that, you know, all data, all the way we even communicate that out to the world, you know, each company, each broadcaster and so forth, well, adjust the wording a little bit to favor what they want. 
how do we understand what the true baselines are that we're trying to achieve in here? We all use different kind of metrics oftentimes to highlight what might be our preference and so forth. Getting more aligned within there, getting unified is really important. But also the standardization comes from, you know, different data sources, right? You have to have trust in your data. Um, and how do you trust if it's always from one uh, when there's all these systems in place? And that's where seeing future stuff, June's going to talk a little bit about, um, to start unifying, bringing things together, CMCD, other elements within there, um, that we can have a full view of what's really going on, hopefully near real time too, um, becomes really, really powerful. Um, and that's where we really want to get to as well. Um, but one of the biggest things I want to touch on in analytics, I, uh, we've worked with a lot of different companies over the years, and it's really crazy how much some people really tune and trust and believe in their analytic data and how other times it's, it's yeah, we, we use this as an indicator, but well, we know that the Fire TV data is actually, you know, 10 seconds off of, uh, you know, the actual times that's showing for video start time. So we just always subtract that from that when we're thinking about it. Um, you know, we have those type of things that, that happen a lot. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough how valuable it is to, a work with your analytic data so that you can trust it and you do believe it's accurate so that when you see issues, you're not doing this little mind calculation, adjusting like, oh, no, 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 that one's actually okay. It's because of the older devices. We know that one, we have a larger chunk. If you really dive into it, you'll be able to explain it. But, you know, we have this operational stuff to do real time, you know, math in the head to know like, oh, we don't have a problem there. Cool. It's, 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 in, it's in the bounds. And part of that goes back to, you know, defining that sex criteria and how you categorize that. But, um, you know, other people, like their, their life, their bonuses are driven by Conviva data, right? Um, and that only works when you also have really valuable, accurate data and you trust in that through the chain. So that being said, and my little turbo speed, I'm going to turn this over to June and he's going to talk a little bit about the future stuff as well. Can you guys hear me? Yep. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I think I have about three minutes, um, so I'm going to try and make this very concise. That's, that's good. So either David was very successful in chasing you away from a career in the streaming industry, or very successful in challenging you and making you want to innovate. One of those two things. Long story short, hard work, dedication, determination, whether we win or lose, honestly, we're going to continue to fail as, as we continue to innovate, as we continue to deliver the best worldwide experiences of streaming that could ever exist. But as whether we fail or not, we're going to learn, right? We learn through method mythology. <laughs> mythology. We learn through mythology, Greek mythology. <laughs> Actually, we need a method, okay? Prediction, experimentation, analysis, and standardization. It's a way to put some rhyme and reason around failing, figuring out how do I overcome that. Let's validate that that is actually the case. And then finally, hey, what have we learned? Let's do something. Let's make something of it and share it with the community. So first of all, predict. David mentioned all these failures that can happen. I mean, it's not a single point of failure, it's many points of failure, and not only that, but the internet is a very unpredictable beast. So the failure that you would have had yesterday, it's going to completely behave differently tomorrow. So that's something that you want to keep in mind, and it can be anywhere from authentication to playback to delivery to ad serving, and also the end device. Oh, my battery died and now I can't watch a video, darn it. So I have a failure. From there, I'm going to experiment. I'm going to simulate. I'm going to try and go end to end because maybe the failure is at the origin. Maybe it's at you know, um, the origin shield or the CDN or the player or maybe it's the content or maybe it's something about the manifest. Who knows? The main thing is, is we need to start building systems from end to end to test this stuff so that we can run things through the paces in a very standard way, a very repeatable way. Um, there's a lot of efforts in this regard, both from the SVA and from the CTA. 
Um, so please start paying attention to these groups. Now that we have the test bed, we've collected a bunch of data. Going back to what David said about analytics and standardization and how we call things, or even back to Zach's talk, where he's saying, yeah, hey, you know, HLS dash, they kind of talk about it slightly differently, but it's kind of the same. You know, we, we need to start, you know, analyzing this data and figuring out, are we seeing what we actually see? You know, let's standardize on the terms, video start time, ad failed, ad skip, vid video start failure, buffering ratio, et cetera. Standardize, you see a common theme here. I'm really, really pushing the standardization thing. You know, we have a bunch of groups out there. And you know what? I'll be the first to admit, I probably don't participate as much as I want to. There's probably a number of you out there that don't either. But guess what? Let's try and participate. There's so many different groups that you can participate with. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to the CDN Alliance guy today to see, you know, what's up. Like, what are we going to be working on? Um, Streaming Video Alliance, there's so many different topic areas with that group. You know, they're dealing with ads, they're dealing with open caching, they're dealing with metadata, they're dealing with live streaming, virtual reality. It's the industry, it takes a community. All the people in the room here is what's going to make this a better place. So CTA Wave, Streaming Video Alliance, etc. I didn't have that much time, but I think it's a call to action, basically, at this point. I'm going to give this back to David. So I think we're a little short on time and long-winded in, in speaking. Um, if there's any questions or anyone has also, you know, where do you guys think we really haven't learned from our failures, love to hear it. Um, you can come ca catch us up afterwards or, or whatnot. Thank you for the great talk, and let's move on. And the next speaker is Daniel from Fraunhofer Focus, and he will give us an update about the latest advancements in the development of the Dash Chess player, please. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> I'm getting the timing, okay. I'm gonna be quick. Uh, thank you, Christian. Very happy to be here for the first time in person, actually. Um, I attended twice uh, virtually but always a bit different, obviously. Uh, nice to see so many familiar faces again. So um, my name is Daniel Zahavi. I am working in Berlin for Fraunhofer Focus. Um, I'm currently the lead developer of the Dash.js project, so this is why I also want to introduce the latest advances of the uh, Dash.js project. So uh, what did we do in terms of development in the past few years, months? Um, this is the agenda, so I'm gonna quickly introduce Dash.js and then talk about specific topics um, when it comes to dash shares. And the first one is multi-period playback. I also want to briefly talk about theme of low latency streaming, MPD patching, common media client data, and then I have some kind of combined slide for the additional features, also upcoming features, and how you can participate if you're interested in dash shares development. Um, so for those of you who have not heard of dash shares yet, um, you might have inferred that from the name um, Dash.js is an open source Dash player, so we are mainly focusing on Dash playback here. But we also have a smooth uh, streaming layer uh, in the player itself. So we can convert smooth streaming content to Dash content in order to also provide support for legacy uh, content as well. Um, Dash.js is the official Dash.if reference player. I think we will hear more about Dash.if also from Iraj later on. Um, it's maintained by ourselves, by Fauna for Focus. I'm currently the lead developer of the project. Um, but again, a lot of contributions are also coming from the community. So we have um, actually people from, for instance, Orange uh, using the player in production and also providing a lot of pull requests then that get reviewed on our site and merge back to the main code base. Um, the great stuff about Dash.js is that it's uh, open source. You can check it out on GitHub. It's, uh, we just released the latest version, so that's 4.3. Uh, it was released last week on Friday, again with lots of nice features. And um, as I mentioned before, it's used for various use cases. So um, it can be used for production, for instance, by the BBC. Uh, they are using it for, for production. The Deutsche Telekom is using it for production. Orange is using it for production. Um, but it's also used for reference projects. So if you think about Dash.if, um, 
obviously Dash Shares is the reference client of the Dash, uh, Dash Industry Forum, but it's also used for CTA Wave. Um, when we verify content in, in CTA Wave, it's used in the DVBI project um, as some kind of reference client. It's used in HPB TV to verify content, and we also use it in the kind of new uh, action group, the 5G Media Action Group, where we do some EMVMS implementations, also 5G Media Streaming. Um, you might have also heard about DashJS uh, when it comes to research. So a lot of research papers are actually based on DashJS. For instance, if you think about ABR research, um, a lot of people adjust DashJS functionality in order to test some new ABR algorithms, for instance. Um, DashJS is purely written in JavaScript. We use the MSE and the EME. This is also why it's basically available everywhere where you can find MSE and EME. So this includes desktop browsers, smartphones, smart TVs, but also setup boxes. Um, we have various features implemented. I will talk about some of them on the next slides. Um, but basically everything that is in the Dash standard and also specified in Dash AF will at some point be included in Dash JS. Um, we have a specific roadmap that we also align with the Dash Industry Forum. Um, just to give you some ideas, we have a flexible ABR logic. Um, we support multi-period playback, DRM support. We have support for MPD patching, for gap pending, CMCD, SEMA flow latency streaming, and also for various subtitle formats. Um, so I want to focus on specific things that we uh, actually dealt with in the DashJS development in the past few months and years. And the first thing I want to highlight is multi-period playback. Um, multi-period playback, to be completely honest with you, was a large problem in DashJS, especially in the previous versions. Um, but we spend a lot of time on improving multi-period playback. And um, I highlighted two specific use cases here. The first one is the pre-buffering of multi-period. So if you think about, for instance, doing add insertion with multi-period, server-side add insertion, or you want to transition between encrypted and non-encrypted content. And this has been a problem in DashJS for some time. And one of the limitations we are facing here is um, that DashJS only allowed you to pre-buffer one of the upcoming periods. This means if you have like main content and you have an advertisement coming up, then we could only pre-buffer this one advertisement even if it's just two or four seconds of duration. Um, in the worst case, this leads to very small buffers, so you don't have a stable buffer level at this point. Um, this is something we improved with DashJS 4.0, so we are now allowing the, the client to pre-buffer multiple upcoming periods, so we maintain a stable buffer level here. So if you encountered any problems previously when using DashJS, for instance, for doing aid insertion, um, then I really recommend you to check out the latest version of DashJS because there are some improvements here uh, when it comes to multi-period. Um, I mentioned the transition between main and encrypted content. This can also be very tricky, especially if you're using the e EME and the MSE. Um, so we also support this. Uh, all the logic that is required here, for instance, re of the MSE, appending in uh, encrypted init segment first, all this is encapsulated in DashJS, so you don't need to do anything here from your application point of view. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention also in terms of multi-period is the limitation of the DVR window we had in the three version of DashJS. So um, with the old DashJS versions, um, the DVR window was limited to a single period, even though if your time shift buffer might overlap multiple periods at this point. Um, so with the four version of DashJS, this limitation is also removed. So if your time shift buffer overlaps multiple periods, then the player will allow you to seek within those periods, seek within the time shift buffer, and it's no longer bound, or the DVR window is no longer bound to only the currently active period. Um, we have a specific sample section in DashJS for all of this, so you can check out the tiny URL I put on the, uh, on the slide here. And um, yeah, I recommend to, to throw in your multi-period stuff and give us feedback in case you encounter any problems. Um, the second thing, and I'm also only scratching all this the surface here, but um, I think Zach talked a bit about theme of low latency streaming. I think you can fill a whole talk with the whole topic of low latency streaming. But uh, in general, in DashJS, we give you various options to configure your late, low latency streams. And this is also a very good uh, example of contributions actually coming not from ourselves, but also from the community. So we had two ABR specific, oh, sorry, low latency ABR specific algorithms um, coming uh, out of the Twitch challenge from the MMSYS by um, uh, Mylim, Ali, Mehmet, uh, Bentaleb, uh, so Abderak, um, they implemented the low on la latency plus algorithm in DashJS, provided that back as a pull request, and uh, we merged this afterwards after a review. 
And there's also a contribution coming from Unified, from uh, CO mainly, um, Learn to Adapt L2A. So those are two low latency specific ABR algorithms that really try to overcome the various changes you are fa challenges you are facing in low latency streaming um, that are included in DashJS and ready to use. And again, we provide a very sophisticated demo page where you can set all the relevant settings, uh, try it out yourself, put in your own stream, and uh, also check out the documentation in case you're wondering how certain things work in DashJS. Um, next, I wanted to talk about MPD patching. So this is something that has been introduced with the fifth edition of um, the MPEG Dash standard. Um, the idea behind MPD patching is really to provide only mandatory information to, an ad to a Dash client during a live streaming session. So um, if you think about a standard Dash live stream, you usually fetch your MPD at the start, you get all the relevant information, you start playback, and then over time new periods are added, new segments are added, but basically the, the foundation of the MPD stays the same. The idea of MPD patching is to only provide the required information to the client. So whenever something is changing, you're signaling that to the client and you're telling the client exactly, okay, this attribute has changed, this has been removed, there has been something added at this point, um, but you try to avoid redundant information at this point. And um, again, a contribution coming from the outside, um, actually both coming from Zach, um, so he's not only good with presentations, but also very strong implementation. Um, so he implemented that in DashJS. Um, it's working pretty good, at least from what I saw. Um, but we are also kind of have the challenge here that we don't really have test content available. So we have one, we had one test stream available, but apart from that, um, nothing was really available. So I also wanted to reach out to you in case you're using MPD patching right now and you have a sample stream available, please uh, contact us so that we can also verify that the implementation works as expected. Um, the main advantage of MPD patching is really the re reduced traffic on the server side, so communication between client and server, but you also reduce the parsing time on the client side. Um, if you think about large MPDs with segment timeline entries, um, that can take a really long time to pass on the client side, especially on embedded devices. So um, if you use MPD patching, you really save traffic, but you also reduce the load on the client side when it comes to passing the XML payload. Um, next big topic coming media client data, um, specification by CTA Wave. Um, common media client data is really something that is, or, are metrics that are collected on the client side and then sent to the CDN with each object request. Um, there are various benefits uh, from that. So the CDN, for instance, can do some kind of cross correlation um, to yeah, correlate specific devices, specific platforms with certain users. Um, it can start um, prefetching or caching certain segments on the edge um, before they are actually requested. And it can even prioritize certain clients. So if you think about multiple clients competing for yeah, a limited band with limited capacities on the CDN side, then the CDN can really use the CMCD metrics in order to yeah, prioritize one client that maybe has a low buffer level um, before actually serving the other clients. Um, there will be a dedicated session, I think, on CMCD as well in one of the next uh, talks from Will. Um, so I think he will give you much more details. Um, but we are fully compliant with the CMCD specification in Dash Test right now. Um, you can just enable it using a single option, single toggle button, and then we send all the relevant CMCD parameters alongside the, the object requests to your CDN. So um, again, I'm linking to a demo page here. So you can try out the demo and um, at least from what I know, multiple CDNs already support CMCD. So you can enable that in your, in your CDN, you can enable it in DashJS and then you have the full benefits of CMCD. Um, some additional features. So since we only have 15 minutes, I tried to really put everything on one slide that we also covered in, in the previous DashJS releases. Um, so this is really a lot to take, but um, we did some implementation uh, or spend some implementation work on DRM. Um, so we now support the license service signaling via MPD. We also allow you to define a system priority. So whenever you have multiple DRM systems available, you can assign a certain priority. And then we try the first one first and afterwards, if that's not available, we try the second one. For instance, if you have white run and play ready available, you can prioritize them both. Um, quite recently, we also added support for multiple system strings. So if you think about play ready, 
there are system strings available that you can use um, that are on, on one side outdated, you might need them for legacy devices, on the other side you might not have the, the current system string which is the dot recommendation string available on all your platforms. So you can now also configure that in the player itself. Um, we allow you to define callback functions in order to mon modify your license payload but also your license response. Uh, we support manifest based key rotation and again everything is documented in the wiki. So you can check out the wiki and we tell you exactly what kind of settings you need to adjust in order to um, enable certain features in dash shells. Um, gap handling, I actually had a dedicated slide for that but I removed it um, because um, when I tried this at home I ran out of time. But um, there are various reasons for gaps in the media buffer. So since Dash.js is using MSE under the hood, um, for those of you who have worked with MSE, it's really critical that you avoid gaps in your MSE buffer because native MSE implementations, they stall at gap boundaries. And uh, we saw various MPDs and also various contents that created gap in the media buffer. So we implemented a gap controller in the Dash.js client that exactly faces those situations where we see a gap in the media buffer and where we need to jump over such gaps. Uh, for instance, for VOD, you can do an immediate seek. For live, you would do a delayed seek um, to keep a consistent live edge. Just to give you some yeah, concrete examples of gaps in the media buffer or what can cause gaps in the media buffer, um, one reason are unaligned periods in the MPD. This is um, pretty obvious and can easily be seen. But there are also more advanced cases where for instance your sample duration in your ISO boxes does not match the, the EPT um, timestamps in, in two consecutive time, uh, con two consecutive segments. Um, so if your samples are less than indicated by the duration of the segments then you also have a gap in the media buffer in the end. And then there are some MPD updates like EPT delta, PD delta that can also cause gaps in the buffer in the end. And one particular case is a negative EPT delta where actually your EPT is smaller than your PTO and you're kind of shifting out segments of the, all of the period boundaries and therefore also of the, out of the append window of the MSE. And in the worst case, uh, the IDR frame gets cut off and everything else up to the next IDR is also cut off and that creates a gap as well. So this is a lot of detail. Um, there are various reasons for gaps and um, Dash.js tries to overcome them with this gap controller. Um, in terms of the reference UI, if you have checked out Dash.js before, you know that we have a reference UI um, to illustrate all of the different features in Dash.js. Um, so we now allow you to also export and import your settings via query parameters. Um, so you can easily share current Dash.js settings with your colleagues or um, even other developers so it, you don't need to tell them explicitly, please use this DRM server, please adjust this setting. You simply export your settings and then share this URL with your their co-workers. Um, we are also trying to kind of educate Dash.js users. Um, so we are dispatching conformance warnings whenever something is wrong in the stream to um, tell the user, okay, this might work, but there are some problems that you should address in the future. Um, general improvements, we have improved the UTC synchronization logic, again, in close collaboration with Dash.if. Um, we improved the stability of the player. We are recovering from MSE errors and also blacklisting corrupt segments. We support MPD anchors and we also increase the number of functional tests in the player. So in order to avoid regressions after releases, or not after releases, but before releases rather, um, we are doing a lot of functional automated tests in order to check that everything works as, as expected. Um, let me move to the next slide. So for the upcoming features, we are focusing on low latency streaming. Um, definitely a hot topic right now. We want to, for instance, add support for the producer reference time. Um, there are some changes required to the box parsing of Dash.js. We want to improve the documentation part of Dash.js, especially for new developers, because onboarding in Dash.js can be a bit hard. Um, Performance-wise, we're looking also in M into MSE v2 features, such as change type that is already implemented in Dash.js, but also MSE in web workers is interesting, so that's what we're currently also looking into. Um, improved XML parsing, um, where we actually want to replace the current XML parser in Dash.js with a faster one. Um, we are, as I said, in close contact with the Dash.if guys, so um, in terms of the IOP version 5 compliance, we are checking the Dash event specification, uh, the DRM specification, there's also a dedicated add-in specification that we want to validate the player against. 
Um, other new items, CMCD, so as I said, we are fully compliant with the current specification, but we want to add new stuff to CMCD as well, such as whitelisting parameters or even custom key value pairs. Um, we might look into CMSD when it's finished, um, so metrics that are coming from the server side to the client, and obviously if there are any bug fixes, uh, sorry, any bugs or any feature requests from the community, this is also something we want to check. Um, how to participate, so you can find us on GitHub. Um, as I said, DashJS is open source. Um, we have a Slack channel where you can reach out to us. We have Google groups where we also do announcements and we have dedicated DashAF calls. And um, I wanna say also thank you to DashAF. So I have a few names here on the slide as well for always providing support. Um, thanks to the community for implementation and also congratulations again to all the winners of the previous DashJS award. And last slide before Christian kicks me off the stage. Um, so the next DashJS face-to-face meeting will be in Berlin. It will be co-located with our Media Web Symposium. So this is a conference we are organizing at Fraunhofer. And I hope to see you all in Berlin in June. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions regarding DashJS, regarding the conference, um, just reach out to me. Otherwise, that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I guess in the interest of time, if you have questions, please approach Daniel. If you want to participate, I encourage everyone to do so and to contribute to uh, DashJS. Please also ask him and uh, he will tell you how to do it. So the next speaker is Irash from Tencent and he will give an overview about session-based Dash streaming. Please try to be in time. Yeah. Time is 15 minutes. 15 minutes okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, um, I hope so far you had a good conference. I'm Miraj Sodaka from Tencent. This is a joint presentation by me and Alex Gladi from uh, Compact, Comcast. And so far, you saw uh, deployment challenges, uh, accomplishments, as well as um, interoperability issues between Dash and CMAF. Um, Daniel talked about the implementation of, of Dash JS uh, again for deployment. This is a, a change of gear a little, little bit yeah, about a new feature in um, uh, uh, the, the core Dash standardizations, which we call it session based Dash st streaming. And even before I start, maybe I need to talk a little bit about the way that uh, the impact Dash specification is a structure. There is a core specification, uh, part one, that basically everybody so far talked about was implementation of that one. Recently went to the fifth edition, is being published, and Dash IF IOP that um, Daniel was talking about is based on that. And it has basically the core features for a streaming between the uh, CDNs or between the origin servers, CDNs and the client. It's basically, uh, interoperability for uh, streaming to the client. Now, there are other parts of the specification, part two for conformance, part three for um, uh, segment-based encryptions, and recently we added a new part, which on uh, being able to customize each session uh, per client uh, for that session. And here I show one use case of it. Um, the use case is forensic water marketing. Think about it that you want to have distribute the content to millions of the player, but you want to be able to track if that content is taken from the client and uh, pirated, you be able to detect which client, which sessions this content is taken from. And forensic water marketing has been around for uh, a long time, usually they put uh, imperceptible uh, watermarks in uh, media such that when you view it, you cannot tell any difference, uh, basically human, human uh, unrecognizable, but there are information in media that you can say uh, at least what, what uh, versions of that specific or what distributions is used for this one. Um, so it's for identifying a particular viewing sessions it needs to be robust. So if it goes through the process of uh, post-editing, when it captures and then reformatting, encoding, and so on, still you'll be able to do it. 
the big differentiators here in this solution uh, from the past is that it's not only per media content, uh, per distributions, it's also per session. So for a specific sessions that it's a stream at a certain time to a certain client, you can basically create um, uh, watermarks, forensic watermark signatures that um, uh, be, be able to tell you what the content is. And the concepts that um, um, uh, it works here is that basically you create two variations of your content. If in terms of the dash uh, concepts, say you have media segments, uh, variant zero and variant one. They basically have the same frames. The only uh, some of the informations have been embedded uh, there that is different from each other, but that a human cannot tell, but they are different when you do compare to the original content. And the idea is that for each session, you do a different mixtures of uh, this variant. So session one, for instance, you do one segment from variant zero, then one segment from variant one, when variant zero again, two segment from variant uh, one, and so on. And then for the session uh, B, uh, you do also, uh, again, different variation. Basically, what you are doing, you're inserting a code with, in each session by doing, uh, switching between different variants, segment variants. And this signature uh, code is unique per session. Um, as you can imagine, in order to make it unique, you need to have a long number. Uh, but since we have usually many segments in the uh, video sessions, having a number like 2 to, to the power of 20 is easy to achieve. So therefore, you, you're going to have a large, numbers, uh, a large uh, set, uh, number of signatures. And the value of this solution is that in terms of content variations, uh, still you have in these examples, only two variations. So you are not increasing your uh, storage cost, uh, encoding cost, or CDN cost. You can even do m more than two, three, four. Basically, instead of having a binary number, you can have a ternary number, quad number. But it seems uh, binary is the more, uh, uh, the easiest one. So how does that work in Dash streaming? So in traditional Dash streaming, you have uh, the content generated at the origin, distributed through the CDN, and uh, then uh, re received by the Dash access client. And basically, MPD manifest and segments are uh, requested uh, through the CDN. In this case, we add a new client, we call it session client, um, that basically, whenever the Dash access client wants to access uh, uh, the network, uh, the internet, for getting a new segment, it basically provides the URL and some parameters, and it gets a URL back. So basically, it gets a modified URL and makes that request. That modifications of the URL allows basically the segment that is delivered is one of those variants. Uh, how does the session client get, uh, decides what variations to do? The session client. Uh, basically accesses something called, we, uh, we call uh, session-based document from internet downloads, and based on that, basically it has instructions how to customize the URLs. So the idea is that have a single manifest for all the clients. Don't do ch any change in the distributions of the content. Only create two or more variant of the content but then have a new document called SPD document. And then by providing that a specific document to each client or a group of client, it uh, basically creates this unique session IDs uh, for each session. In terms of the process, Dash client receives the MPD, uh, parses the MPD and uh, makes it create the playback sessions. Uh, as part of that MPD, there is a pointer to the SPD URL, basically for downloading the session-based in information, that session-based client downloads it. And when the Dash clients get to um, download the next segment URLs, it passes that URL to the uh, 
session client. Session client basically, f there is a table there in SPD file that finds the matches. It generates the U uh, URL or modifies the URL based on the instruction that it has in that table. And then it passes the URL back to the dash client and that dash client accesses uh, the segment with this new URL. Um, as I said, in terms of the operations, the SPT file is a very simple file. It's uh, just a table. It could be even uh, a two column table. One is basically on the left, you have different time ranges, T1, T2, T3. Basically, it says whenever a segment is in this time range, then it looks at a key value and finds a key and finds the value. And that value is added either uh, as a uh, segment query or you can even manipulate the segment URL itself. And these tables are in two different modes. One is time-based where you see basically different ranges of times are defined and for each of them one or multiple key values are defined or a simpler way is that it's just a simple order number. So you have segment one, segment two, segment three. Each time that you go and access, the client wants to uh, access the segment, it goes in the, this table one by one and finds the uh, uh, matching value for the key and use that value in generating the URL. What things can you do um, uh, in this process of changing URL? You can manipulate all parts of the URL. If you can change the host, port, part, uh, path, and of course query. And in fact, in the case of two query, you can add to it. Uh, the, man, the type of the URLs you can change could be media segments, but also even when for getting MPD updates, for resolving X-Link resolutions, uh, for callback, chaining, uh, uh, fallback URLs, you can also customize those URLs using the same, um, same approach, same table. And in terms of the manipu manipulation, it's quite flexible because we use a temple-based solution that basically it says that this is a template. Uh, uh, this part of the string is the key. Go find in the table the value for it and then come and replace the uh, string uh, with the value of that. And in the, the case of the query, as I said, there is a mode of basically if you find uh, the key, you add key value, add it to the query. Um, as I said, you can do it based on the order of the access of the segments or URLs or based on the time ranges. And the SPD fi file itself, the document, could be a static or dynamic. So you can publish SPD for one client and uses all the time that one, or you can update it uh, periodically. And similar to the MPD that there is a minimum update period for dynamic MPDs, also there is a TTL here that uh, basically you tell the session client once a while come and get a, a SPD. Uh, you can signal what part of the media signal this applies to. It's not like always a start from zero to the end. So you can define the starts and durations. And you can even do looping. You can say for the 30 minutes, uh, this is the table. And every 30 minutes uh, after you finish the first 30 minutes, go back to the beginning of the table and apply the same rules. So the table uh, size doesn't need to grow. Uh, significantly. In terms of the actual solution in the MPD, uh, uh, there is a essential descriptor that describes basically the URL uh, to the SPD file and then it defines what part of the, uh, uh, what type of URLs is supposed to modify, it, what part of the URL is supposed to modify and what template. And then if you look at uh, the SPD file is a JSON file that basically has uh, either order or time values and uh, the key value and the keys as a, you know, as a top row and then the values for each uh, entry in the table. Um, so as an example of it, I don't know if you guys can read it. Uh, just these two examples basically modifies it, uh, the URLs that it receives in two parts. One, it adds a subdomain uh, in the URL, and one is adding a query uh, to the URL. And each segment, ha uh, the three cons uh, uh, 
segments that is shown here has a di different uh, subdomain as well as has a different query. Uh, the syntax in MPD uh, is quite extensive. Uh, there are different features. Um, just to summarize, basically th this is a new specification. It was just published um, in February this year, first edition. The second edition is coming soon in uh, basically the tech the technical uh, part of it is frozen and it's going to go through the publication. What I described here basically covers first and second editions. Uh, as I said, it's a way to manipulate, that, uh, manipulate URLs in a dash client without uh, the need of manipulating MPDs. Uh, it applies to the different classes of URLs. It can be dynamic and it can be template-based uh, template or additions and um, that's it. I'm glad to introduce our first keynote speaker, Jamie Miles. So um, his, full bio, uh, his full bio is uh, on, the, uh, on the website, and uh, it's worth reading. So right now, J uh, Jamie is leading uh, the video infrastructure uh, group in, uh, in Comcast, Comcast Viper. So a very sh uh, short explanation w uh, what it is. All the residential vi uh, video, uh, both in Comcast and in our syndication partners, which is uh, uh, in US, Canada, and, U uh, and Europe. So tens of millions sub of subscribers. And uh, he has been do doing uh, very similar things uh, a few years ago back uh, in Charter. So he's, go uh, he's going to talk about what is important uh, to uh, Comcast and to them VDs. Thanks, Alex. Well, good morning, good afternoon to everybody that's here and everybody that's online. Uh, let's go ahead and get the slides up. As Alex said, my name is Jamie Miles. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. There's a lot of familiar faces in the audience. I will say that uh, today was a bit of an odd experience. I've been spending the last two years with a nice dress shirt and a pair of shorts. <laughs> and this morning I went to put the jeans on and uh, kind of feel like I'm back freshman in college. I, I think there might be a little bit of freshman 15 that happened to me over the last couple of years. The jeans were a little tighter, the jacket was a little tighter than it had been before, so probably need to hit the gym coming out of this. But it was exciting to get together uh, this material and be able to come and speak in front of a group. I think it's been a hard couple of years for all of us, and it's, it's really nice to be back in person. So as Alex said, I lead the Viper organization for Comcast, and th that organization, the video infrastructure team at Comcast, is responsible for how we acquire all the video signals, whether it's satellite, terrestrial, or over the internet, what we do to process it, whether it's the uh, encoding that we're doing, the content conditioning for ads and emergency alert and various things that we're conditioning, uh, the packaging that we do before it goes out to the numerous clients that we support, uh, as well as then the content security. And as Alex mentioned, my team is responsible for both the, all the classic stuff, so all the delivery to Qualm, as well as to all the IP. So inside of all the work that we're doing in processing, it's preparing it to go either direction. And we store that content. We're either putting it into Origins before it goes out, uh, or we, we run a very large cloud DVR environment as well, so we're time shifting. We deliver the video. Uh, we have a CDN in place that we're actually operating on net for all of our IP delivery. And then we have a set of infrastructure that we built to allow us to translate back into the Qualm environment. So we've been trying to consolidate our workflows so we can have a common way of encoding and packaging and preparing. But at the end, through a device that we call VDE, we turn that back into a flow for the Qualm plant. Uh, and then we run the classic VOD streamers, although those are going to go away here over the next two years. We're very, very close to completely turning off Qualm VOD. Uh, in fact, those will be done in the next two years. We're down to just a few percentages of the total traffic that goes through those. And then my team is still responsible for the classic controllers and a lot of the Qualm infrastructure that's in place to deliver to those, to those classic clients. And then finally, we're responsible for a lot of the playout infrastructure. So we, we're responsible for the adaptive clients that we're building. Uh, we, at the end, then facilitate ad insertion. That used to be primarily manifest manipulation, moving very heavily towards client insertion at this point. Uh, we insert the alternative content if there's EAS or a blackout or slates that need to happen. And then, as I mentioned, on the ES side, we do the emergency alerts. It's kind of unique for the cable industry in that, you know, as we moved everything to IP, we had to continue to support uh, you know, the various announcements that are coming through if there's a tornado or an abduction or some kind of a national alert. So that's what the team's responsible for. And so as I was thinking about today, I was thinking, I want to bring some relevance into this, into this talk today around what, what I see leading an organization like this for the things that are coming. 
You have brilliant speakers that are going to be up over the next few days that are going to get deep into the technology of how we're going to enable a number of different things and the things that we need to change to be technically in a good place. But I wanted to bring it up maybe just a level and talk a little bit about what I see the major changes that are coming uh, and the things that groups like this really need to help us solve and be ready for. And as part of doing that, I went back a little bit in time and I was thinking about how far we've really come. And this was a, a, a seminal moment for me personally because I was working for a small little startup called Level 3 Communications and started there in 98. And in 1999, as, as any of you that were big Star Wars fans probably remember, The Phantom Menace came out after a long delay between the first three and then they started, uh, Lucas started building out the, the rest of the franchise. And in, in late 98, they put that trailer into movie theaters and lots of us ran out to watch movies just to see the trailer. And then in, in early 99, they made the next iteration of that trailer available on, on the internet. And it was a huge deal. I, I remember sitting there for a half an hour downloading the, this little, I don't know, it was like 45 second trailer so that I could watch it. And, and it wasn't just me because at level three, the, the network just it got totally overwhelmed, right? It was from people downloading this trailer. I remember their servers that they were loading this off of were also overwhelmed. And so people were spending literally half an hour to two hours to download this 30 second, 45 second piece of content. But what was really exciting is, is it, it was, took a long time, but it, was, but it worked, right? And it was really exciting because we were able to all watch this content you know, coming across the internet. And then to think about really where we've gone from 99 until today is staggering. And the introduction of adaptive video, the stuff that Move Networks brought in, uh, moving into really being able to uh, launch services like YouTube and Netflix and Amazon, the cable industry and a lot of the satellite providers starting to be able to move their content on. To finally get us to a place where we're sitting at Comcast today, we're 100% parity. So the 20,000 plus linear channels that we're supporting both for our U.S. residential business as well as the syndicated businesses that we do, they're all IP enabled. Our VOD library is 100% available online. And when you're watching it between the clients, for the most part, you can't tell the difference. There are a few exceptions and we'll talk about that in a moment, but we've, we've come to parity and we've taken something that was novel and exciting to watch a trailer back in 99 to a place now where this is, this is common stakes and everybody's able to watch their video through these platforms that we've collectively built and designed. And so I think that's really important for us to recognize how far we've come as an industry. But I also think it's important to recognize that, that we haven't fully arrived, right? There's still a lot more that needs to be done. And I wanted to spend just the next few minutes or so talking about my perspective on some of the key changes that, that lie ahead. And I'm gonna talk about two areas. I wanna look at the area of workflow and I wanna look at the area of operations. And the first thing that I want to look at here inside of this area of workflow is, is this missing concept of plug and play. So when I think about the environments that we're running and operating today, it's, it's really, really good infrastructure, really good designs, really good technology, but it's not very seamless when you're putting it all together. You have to figure out how to make your encoder work with whatever packager you've worked. And how does that packager work then with the cloud DVR environment that you're having in place? And if you decided to use SIFT, you have to do something special there. And then when you want to try and transition over to CMAP or Dash, and how's that going to work with the rest of the infrastructure that you have in place? And can your storage handle that correctly? And all these various components that you know, we put up, we have this technology map that we look at constantly at Comcast, and it's, it's really complicated. Now the tech works and we're delivering these incredible services and the end consumers get to have that, that experience, but it's still really hard. And I think that this industry, we really need to look at how we start to make a lot of these components be a lot more plug and play. How do we make it easier to turn something on or if we've got a shift between vendors, where we're not having to go back and re-architect and build a lot of what we've done. And we find that in certain ecosystems, if you stay with a particular vendor for your encoding and packaging, well, that's very plug and play. But anytime you want to try and mix something new into that environment, it gets difficult. Or anytime you're trying to do something like the emergency alert stuff that we're doing, we have to really go through and do a lot of bespoke work to get that to plug into the environments that we have. And so I think it's going to be really important over the coming years for this industry to really try and focus on making the environments more plug and play, easier to turn up new services, easier to incorporate new technology into the things that we're building. The next thing that we need to really focus on is we've got live, it's working, but it needs to be better. And there's a couple of key things and it's on the agenda. I know that this group is talking a lot about it, but we have to solve the latency gap. And that's gonna be driven very heavily by betting and sports. And we're seeing that now internationally when we're out working on a lot of our solutions that the, the providers, the programmers are coming back and saying, how do we get closer to what's actually happening in the venue? 
And some of that stuff we can't solve in here. Thanks to uh, Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson, there's certain delays that get inserted into video flows so that we don't have wardrobe malfunctions that get exposed to our children. But once we get past some of those regulatory in, uh, delays that are inserted, there's so much more of it that's in our workflow. And we really need to do a lot of work to try and improve that. We've got to get closer to live in order to really make people feel comfortable making that final transition from the broadcast distribution that's still happening in many ways for a lot of live to a, a pure IP delivery. The next thing that we've got to continue to focus on is on uh, our encoding. And part of that has to do with feature functionality where we want to be able to have uh, 4K and we want to be able to have HDR and do all those great next generation services. But what it also has to be about is continuing to reduce the number of bits that we need for a given quality. Cost is something that we can't forget. And for any of us that are building networks, it's a really big deal. If you can get a 10% improvement in the amount of compression that you need for a given quality level, for a company like Comcast, that's hundreds of millions of dollars that we can save in node splits and fiber that we have to run out. And if you look at companies that don't run their own networks, but they're out there basically paying for CDN services or buying transit or internet connectivity from other providers, this ends up being a really big deal for them as well because they're spending a lot of money to get this video delivered into people's homes. So we have to continue to focus on that. We have to continue to make sure that we're enhancing the way that we do our compression so that we're able to uh, continue to see video grow, not only in the traditional sense, but if we start thinking about you know, like next generation video services or things that are gonna be happening with video gaming or the metaverse, all of those things need us to really ensure that we've get the compression uh, and the encoding in a really great place. And then the last thing on the workflow that I wanted to talk a little bit about today is about removing some of the duplication. We heard earlier today about how NBC internally was doing some of that work when they put their, their new encoders in for doing the 4K and it eliminated on the Comcast side, on our, on our cable side, the need to have the encoding because NBC had actually handled that. And this is a really big deal, right? Because if you look at our industry right now, there is so much duplication where the content comes in and, and everybody's re-encoding that same content to go onto their environment, or everybody's having to set up the packaging, or they're having to manipulate the metadata, or having to think about how they're gonna make their whole workflow work, and, and we end up with these very bespoke workflows that end up having a lot of duplication of cost. And as we continue to wanna help move forward video and media and entertainment, it's gonna be important for, for technically minded people like ourselves to help figure out how do we reduce some of that expense and simplifying our workflows and removing some of the duplication is gonna be one of the key things that, that we can really help drive. The next area of, of focus over the next few years that I think we as an industry really need to pay attention to is around operations. We talked about how uh, the workflows that we have today are disparate and how we don't necessarily have a lot of uh, commonality and when we're bringing things in, it lacks plug and play. Well, one of the byproducts then is that there really aren't great end-to-end -end tools. And this is extremely painful when you're building up an organization that's trying to manage video. And so I think about my organization at Comcast, and we're effectively a dozen different domains to make that first chart that I showed you work, right? And they're all working on their pieces, and there tends to be not a lot of overlap in skill sets. Somebody that knows how to work on encoding is not the same person that knows how to do CDN, isn't the person that knows how to do compression, and isn't the same person that knows how to do cloud DVR, et cetera, right? And so we end up having these really um, spread out uh, divisions and domains for building the tech and unfortunately that means that we kind of have to stand up special operations for each of those areas and it makes it really hard when you're troubleshooting right and a customer calls in and there's a problem and you're trying to figure out where in your in your environment is that problem occurring and so the industry collectively needs to think about this and we need to start coming up with better ways to have end-to-end -end tools that we can really use to more quickly figure out where issues are at and be able to identify where the customer pain is uh, and, and resolve the problems without needing the, the extensive amount of human capital that it takes today to operate and troubleshoot these environments. And one of the steps that we can probably take to help with that is this next bullet point, and that's starting to do a better job of introducing machine learning into the, into the way that we're operating our environment. We have some of that at Comcast today, but we're really at the very beginning, and we know that if we can start to gather the mountain of, of telemetry that's coming in through all of our various platforms and place machine learning onto it, it's going to help us reduce the cost for operating the environment in a way that's going to uh, allow us to then more quickly build new features and functionality because we're not spending so much time having to troubleshoot and operate the environment, we can actually focus on, on building. So machine learning is gonna be a really key component. And then finally on the operation side, I believe we're at a point in history now where we're gonna really start looking at consolidating some of the operations that are happening today. 
Part of that will be internal to companies like Comcast that are going to say, well, we've got this disparate group of operators, we've got better tools now, we've got machine learning, and so we can now have a more consolidated operating organization. But I think it's going to go further than that. And I think this is really going to be a moment in time where we're going to start to see consolidation of operations between companies. We're going to see companies come in that say, we can help manage this part of what you're doing in a way that fits in with the rest of your ecosystem, that, that doesn't take away anything from your ability to innovate, but really allows us to bring in specialties and expertise around operating certain areas. And, and a lot of that, I think, is going to come from uh, moving and migrating some of the things that we're doing into, into these public cloud environments, where when they're sitting up in that environment, it now makes it easier to consolidate operations because what we're doing there is going to be the same as other people are doing, and it's going to simplify the way that we all need to operate. So consolidations in the operation space is going to be another really key area that I think you're going to see in the coming years. So those are the two areas that I wanted to mention today. I wanted to talk about workflow because I think that that's really critical for how we're moving things through our environment. And we really need to work to try and ensure that we're taking that to the next level. And I wanted to talk about operations because I believe that how we operate our environments is going to improve significantly in the coming years and that we're going to start to see consolidation in that space in a way that we never had before. Uh, and these are the areas that I think are going to be important for us as we move into, into the coming years. And so with that, I'll take any questions. And they did ask me that if you have questions, if you could just go up to the mics, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. It's on. OK. Um, great talk. I want to ask about, um, since you're talking about the future and what you see as needs for the future, what about your thoughts, what, were, what would be your thoughts on supporting uh, displays that need more than one view? Um, so for example, immersive displays that need, for example, 45 video streams. So where, where the display itself would be receiving more views? I just want to make sure I understand yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. Well, so there are like uh, some new displays, for example, that project a 3D uh, presentation using 45 video streams simultaneously. Um, so any thoughts about that? I'm just curious to know where that might be on your radar. So I want to... Th that's cool, actually. I'd like to see that. I, I wanted to, today to talk a little bit around where I thought things were going from a, a certain level of like workflow and operations. I don't want to minimize the fact that there's incredible tech that's being built in a lot of other areas, like the thing that you're talking about. Um, I, I think what I would comment on is that if we're really going to have that many streams running into a display device, things like compression are going to be really important. Again, because you need to make sure that you're not that the, that the bandwidth going to a home or to an environment to do that doesn't become so cost prohibitive that we're not able to have uh, new technology like that made available. So compression would be very important in something like that. Hey, Jimmy. Um, just could you expand a little bit more where you think machine learning and AI could be applied in the operation space that you think immediately are successful, and where do you think some of the pitfalls are? Um, where do you see that? Where do you see that some of the dangers are in that area where people might be a little bit over-reliant on some of those tools right now that we should avoid, maybe? That's a good question. So I think if you were to look at, um, let's take like linear video right now today, and inside of a Comcast, there's 20,000 different streams. And because there's so many streams that are coming in, and we have quality detection that happens on all of those, but there's certain types of events like macro blocking, uh, certain kinds of pixelation that, that don't necessarily trigger an immediate alarm, or they might come and go so quickly that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't trigger us to have a human go and look at that. But if that's constantly happening, uh, something with machine learning would be able to detect that and see that and be able to bubble those up so that we're not necessarily having these thousands of paper cuts against a particular customer base. But you could use things like machine learning to really watch the environment and then know when to escalate things up to a human to be able to troubleshoot it in a way that some of our tools and processes don't today. Um, where it's probably being used, I, I'm not really sure I would have an example yet of where we're, where we're overusing machine learning for us we're still very much at the beginning of using that into our environment, and, and that linear space is where we've talked about really starting. Hi. Can you hear me? It just doesn't sound like it. Sorry. 
Uh, so when you talk about the, um, you know, the areas where you need to save money, whether it's around enhancing coding or consolidating of environments, and you think about how, how working with uh, various cloud providers, it can become over cumbersome and where the, all the costs come in. I mean, how are you approaching um, your thought process there, whether it's utilizing smaller, um, smaller service offerings, um, more commoditized hardware that's available inside of some of these CSPs, uh, you know, various workloads rather than just entrusting everything to one or two of the giants. It's, it's a good question. And when I mentioned cloud, you know, we see that as an, an area that uh, offers a lot of opportunity, but it comes with some caveats. You know, today, when you think about the way that we build our platforms, it's primarily on hardware that's inside of our private data centers and Scott's hardware that we're using to deploy our services onto. Um, it does require us to run those data centers. It does require us to upgrade the hardware and do a lot of things that some of the cloud providers are getting really, really good at or, or have been really good and continue to be really good at. So we see there, there's an opportunity to take advantage of some of those platforms, but we're also thoughtful that you know, we, we want to make sure that it's not, a, it's not a blind rush into a cloud environment. It probably makes sense for certain services to move there. And we're looking at opportunities to do things differently than we've done before. So for example, if you look at our linear streams today, about 30% of them are really being used a lot, and about 70% of them aren't, right? And so we look at something like that and go, is there an opportunity to do just-in-time live encoding through a cloud environment where we could just turn up the resources where we need it and turn it off when we don't? And so that StatMux gain that cloud environments offer, that type of a solution could potentially be very interesting. So it's, it's not an, an all or none, and it's certainly us looking at where it makes sense to take advantage of cloud, um, but we're also still thoughtful that there's probably a lot of places where things in net make sense. You know, our CDN, which is deployed deep into our network, that, that doesn't ever make sense to really move out because it's defraying network costs and you want that deep in the environment. Um, <clears throat> so um, as you build this uh, remarkable talent and uh, operational excellency and cost uh, performance, et cetera, for ultra high volume uh, video distribution, uh, with low latency, et cetera, all the good things that we heard throughout the day, uh, essentially the same features or the same uh, capabilities are also needed for cloud gaming, for client-side virtualization, et cetera. Do you see, I mean, there is no point in reinventing the wheel. The same infrastructure, the same uh, 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 capabilities can serve industry other than media and broadcast distribution. Do, do you see uh, yourself expanding or serving or uh, bringing uh, some availability to other service providers to supply this kind of services based on the platform and the efficiencies that you are building? That is a great question. Yes, for sure, right? Um, my comments today were very focused on the Mile High Video Alliance, so I was thinking specifically about some of the video thoughts that are going on here. But a lot of the work that's being done here is going across our platforms. And when we look at things like gaming, whether it's gaming that's happening on our networks or gaming that in the future we may add into some of our platforms, then we think about these same types of things and these questions. And latency obviously is a very big deal to that environment. And what do we need to optimize in order for that to work? Um, video is, is a part of many of those pieces as well. And when you're playing games now, so much of that is streamed live uh, that we would want to make sure we take advantage of these same kind of solutions in order to provide those benefits as, to those technologies as well. Okay, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be here today. It's really nice to be in person with everybody. So enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. We continue with the second session. And the first uh, presentation will be given by Will and Sean about CMCD, which is a very dear topic for me. Right, thank you very much, Ali. And, uh Good morning, I believe it still is to all of you. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to real humans again and not through Zoom. So thank you for the invitation. We're gonna be speaking to you about common media client data at work. In other words, in the real world. I'm Will Law from Akamai, and I'm joined by Sean McCarthy from Paramount. CMCD is really a bridge between the world of players and the world of content delivery. As a CDN, we see millions of hits per second for binary objects. We don't know they're part of a media presentation. 
On the player side, the player is seeing one playback session with some rebuffering and a number of minutes of playback. So we want to merge these two worlds together. That is the point of CMCD. And that's why there's two of us in this presentation. I'm representing the CDN side, and Sean is representing the content distribution side. You may be not known to you, but CMCD was born at Mile High Video. I gave a talk two years ago at this conference where I said, why don't we add session IDs to all our requests? And I think it was Dolby David, as I'm naming him now, who said, well, why don't you add some more stuff and make it a standard? So we did. In fact, it was a COVID baby standard. We started work after that conference, finished it in September 2020 at CTA. So it def it's very simple. It defines a set of structured key value pairs that convey mutually beneficial information from a player to a CDN via either custom headers or a set of query orgs. And we call it common because all players can send the same data to all CDNs. It's not CDN specific, it's not player specific. What type of data do we send? We send the session ID, I said, and then we send, I'm not gonna read them all, you can read it. The, we send the low hanging fruit. We try to send as little information that gets us the most bang for the buck in terms of either helping for QOE collection on the player or for helping CDNs improve performance. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Sean, who's gonna take you through the Paramount implementation. Thanks, Thanks Will. Um, I work at Paramount Global, formerly Viacom CBS, in the video technology group, where my team is responsible for video data products and multi-CDN strategy. We've been interested in leveraging CMC data for, CMCD data for a while now, uh, so we were excited to finally do an implementation in the player and uh, understand where and how we can apply the data. We have three primary use cases for the data, including real-time observability, session analysis, and traffic shaping. Akamai did a good job building tooling for session analysis and player debugging, so we decided to focus our effort on aggregate monitoring for real-time troubleshooting. We're also excited about using the data for traffic shaping in the future, with the real benefit being the ability to steer traffic based on true stream data and not just test object RUM data. That said, our focus today is really exploring how you can use the data in a real-time operational monitoring environment. Uh, as part of the project, we integrated CMCD into our Avia web player framework, which is built on top of HLSJS and Shaka player. Our lead developer, Casey, who's pictured here, contributed the first open source implementation of the spec into Shaka, and the GitHub repo with uh, his branch is linked here for anyone interested in exploring the code. The Avia player is deployed on a number of devices where we see some of the highest viewing rates on smart TVs. Regarding the implementation itself, sharing the data via query strings was fairly straightforward, though uh, modifying, the, modifying the outgoing requests, which is the principal behavior of CMCD, is a very low level piece of functionality. So the information needed to construct the data often lived in isolated modules and needed to be aggregated and passed down to the player's request engine. So we needed to understand the player architecture very well. Uh, integration on the CDN side was pretty straightforward. Nothing was really required config side beyond excluding the query string from the cache key. We also included logic to remove the CMCD parameters on forward requests to our origin shield. If you don't, then you risk surfacing uh, client data which should be associated with an upstream CDN with your shielding CDN. Um, we also, uh, well, all of the vendors we work with that are listed here have a real-time logging feature, which we already integrated into our analytics platform, so no additional work was really required there. Just be aware of the fact that some CDNs have logging uh, bite-sized limitations on individual fields. Parsing the query string in real-time was probably the biggest challenge. The fact that fields don't always appear in the same order, and sometimes they don't always appear at all, like the buffer starvation flags, forced us to use resource intensive regex expressions to parse the data uh, and normalize it at ingest time. So the biggest challenge is really gonna be that of scale going forward um, because you know, that regex parsing can really cause uh, additional ingestion delay and add additional cost. A little about the test. We embedded our Avia player into a web page that's linked here and shared it with our network to generate traffic on four different CDNs. The test stream is still active if you want to generate a session and visualize it in our logging tooling later. I can show you what your session looks like. Um, we use the opportunity to create different delivery conditions by throttling the bandwidth at the CDN, starting and stopping the stream, and purging the CDN cache. So with the focus on aggregate real-time operational monitoring, what did we actually learn from the data? Um, when we were monitoring the CMCD fields like measured throughput or buffer length in a silo, 
it became clear that sometimes there would be dips in the graphs which would appear to be network induced. But once you take a closer look at the data, you'd actually see throughput may have dropped due to an availability, availability issue like a 404. At first, we were thinking of not reporting measured throughput following a 4XX request, but that may not be the best idea in the context of session debugging since a player would actually make an ABR decision based off that throughput data. So the real takeaway is to analyze the data in the context of relevant fields. And what we found to be most relevant is shown here. So we have server TTLB, 4XX and 5XX status codes, cache hit ratio, and then the relevant C CMCD fields. We break it down by pop and have the same table breakdown by client ASN and client geo. And then we also added request count to prioritize the data. You know, w with over 45 CDN log fields that we're collecting, there's plenty of ways to slice and dice this data. Uh, but we found these to be the most contextual real time aggregate views. We have a lot of filters uh, available in our dashboard, and status code is a common one that we use. Here, we're just showing the problem with applying a status code filter if you're monitoring buffer starvation specifically. We wanted to use buffer starvation count as an indicator of overall rebuffering, but because of how the data is associated with each request, as soon as we filter on 5XX status codes as shown on the right, we see no rebuffering below. To compensate for this, we decided to not apply status code filters to our buffer starvation panels. But the other takeaway really is, since buffer starvation is a flag, it may not be the best litmus test for a poor viewing experience in general. Using the top bitrate field, we were actually able to drive a metric showing the percentage of overall requests for the highest possible bitrate. You can see on the panel on the right how aligned this data is with buffer starvation or rebuffering. But the main difference is we don't need to worry about status code filters or really any other dimensions confusing the story the data is telling. This one caused a lot of discussion among the team. Uh, because target buffer lengths vary between devices, we found that plotting buffer length over time is much more meaningful when you break down by device. You know, some of our more obscure devices have 10 seconds of data. Our smart TVs might have or sorry, 10 seconds of buffer. Our, our smart TVs might have 30 seconds of buffer. And you know, desktop browsers could have a minute plus. Unfortunately, device ID was removed from the CMCD spec, and user agent is way too granular a breakdown to be useful. That graph would be really messy if we tried to do that. Um, given that, we thought it would be nice to have a max buffer length field so we can compute a similar metric to what I showed in the previous slide. It would be something like percentage of buffers filled. Uh, we filed an issue to track this in the CMCD GitHub repo. Uh, another interesting data point was seen when we stopped the stream and our encoder published an end playlist tag. Two different player analytics providers that we had integrated in the player showed a rebuffering spike following the stop, but there was no buffer starvation event seen in the CMCD data. Uh, that would have been you know, indicated by a spike in the orange line on the right. Given the fact that a stream had ended, the CMCD data was actually accurate in this regard. And when you're you know, at a broadcaster like Paramount where we have a lot of different live events uh, running simultaneously, those false positives on the left can become really noisy and become a big distraction. So you know, the takeaway here is CMCD was actually you know, a, a better data source in that regard. We had several other takeaways, including comparing server TTLB with measured throughput to isolate CDN issues from last mile issues. But um, we don't have time to get through all of them today. I'm happy to walk anyone through those findings after the presentation. If you're interested, just reach out. And with that, I'll hand it back to Will. Thank you, Sean. And we're rushing because we're trying to keep yeah. to our 15 to 20 minute limit. So we're, we can talk on this for 30 minutes if, if you like. So what does it mean when a CDN says, yeah, we support CMCD? Because it's just query orgs, right? And everybody logs query orgs. So what are we doing differently? So at least I can speak for the Akamai side, but I know the other major CDNs also have similar levels of support. So we're able to automatically detect CMCD data when it comes in either via query org, which is logged, and headers, which are typically not logged. We can extract this data into variables in, in our edge servers, and then we can export them, the key value pairs, as the extracted variables into our live log delivery solution, which for us is called data stream. And from there, it goes into your do-it-yourself collection, as uh, Paramount did, or into S3, Datadog, Splunk, et cetera. You're getting it back, though, within 30 to 60 seconds of it being sent via the player. We've also, within Akamai, have a special uh, a development team, and I want to give a shout out to them, the client optimization team. Uh, they're known as COP, 
And they have built an excellent processing tool called Golo, Ghost Log Analyzer. And it's, it's really supporting CMCD as a first class candidate. So a lot of the screenshots I'm gonna show you of the data we've been able to extract are coming from Golo. Our customers, however, build uh, dashboards like this. So this is Sumo Logic. Uh, I've seen other ones with Datadog. This is all CMCD data that's coming in with, with your CDN logs. So you get all of the last mile data that you typically get from a CDN blended and married with your client-side QoE data. But I'm gonna show you under the covers because I'm an engineer and I care about finding things with this that we've never seen before. And one of them is something I'm gonna call buffer signatures. So what we see here is a chart. This is buffer length reported by a single player. So we're able to dive down out of a million sessions, look at what one player did over time. And here you see a relatively nice stable buffer, every six seconds requesting a six second segment. Here you see a player playing the same stream, but with this sawtooth pattern. And you wonder, well, why are they different, right? Why is this sawtooth here? You might expect a sawtooth at a period equal to the segment duration, because you, you load a segment, it drains, you load a segment. But this sawtooth, there's about 10 segments being loaded in the sawtooth. What's causing it? I was really interested in this. The upper player is Shocker player. For those who care, the bottom one is HLSJS, which is a very commonly used player. So I just want to dive into this behavior a little bit more because I think it's quite unique and it's exposed by CMCD. What's happening is, at this point here, the player is going to load a six second segment. And in this case, it took about 600 milliseconds to deliver it. The client's well connected. And what happened is, after receiving it, the player set a six second timer which is the segment, target segment duration with HLS here, to go load the next segment. So what's happening is every 6,600 milliseconds, we're loading a 6,000 uh, millisecond piece of data. So our, our buffer drops by 600 milliseconds every 6.6 6 seconds. That, that's, that drop continues until we hit a threshold point. In this case, it looks to be about 20 seconds. Now the player says, uh oh, I need to load some segments as fast as I can. And it does that, raises its buffer up to about 26 seconds, and then the cycle continues. So we get a, periodis, a period here of about one minute with this decline. And what's interesting is the slope of this curve is proportional to the speed with which you're delivering. The faster you're delivering, the shallower that slope. The slower you're delivering, the steeper it is. I think there's a whole science here about detecting player behavior. And in this case, I would encourage HLSJS to adjust your timing algorithm because you could have a more stable buffer. You don't need this sawtooth that's so clearly evident. Observation number two, finally, as a CDN, we have last mile of visibility. For us, we simply dispatch segments into the ether and hope it arrives at the client. But now we're able to track because the client is telling us what's its view of the aggregate connectivity is, and we can subtract our own speed, and now we know what the last mile is. For this study, I just plotted it by country, which is quite interesting. Large variation, sorry, Australia. Australia's right down on the left. I think someone was testing uh, from the middle somewhere. Uh, and the US, we had a lot of people on very fast connections. An interesting takeaway here is look at the bit rate of the content. This was CBS News at 720, 2.5 megs per second, a nice looking stream. We clearly are delivering in excess many times, and we should start thinking about, is that always good for players? Is that good for shared networks? Do I need to deliver so much faster than, than my bitrate uh, of my playback? We also can break out last mile by ISP, and in fact, most problems don't occur by geo-boundaries. They occur by that last mile provider. I'm putting the top of the table here so I don't shame anybody down at the bottom. These providers were delivering you know, 96 megabits average measured throughput to the player. That's really fast. And it's mostly the fiber guys. In fact, it's so fast that if you look at the upper ones here, they could happily stream 8K content today, assuming 60 megs per second is our sort of 8K target. And that's interesting. We can't go to everyone, but we can clearly start targeting services that can reach a number of these vendors, depending where they are, and based upon your level of connectivity. Another interesting question, how much bandwidth do you need to eliminate rebuffering? Now, the answer to this question is going to be very specific to this study and to the segmentation we use, the packaging, and a lot of other data. But you can see on the top line there, that dark blue, that's the majority of requests, hundreds of thousands of them. And on the left is all the other bitrate requests. So it's the, the vertical axis is the CMC bitrate, the CMCD bitrate. And on the bottom axis is CMCD client throughput. And we notice after about 40 megabits per second of connectivity, those players played nothing but the top bitrate all the time, which is interesting. I'm not arguing that you need 40 all the time, but um, certainly above that level, there exists a clear point at which 
sufficient bandwidth is, is good to eliminate all switches. Now, speaking of switches, let's look at number of bitrate switches per device. So CMCD is also telling us how often our player is switching. And often, a lot of switching, uh, if, you've got, if you've got steady throughput, a lot of switching is evidence of poor ABR. But if you've got an unstable connection, it's evidence of good ABR because it's reacting and doing the best it can. But given this was the same player, player code in all cases, it's interesting to see these differences. So here we've got a, a Windows desktop with a meaningful statistical difference to Mac desktop behavior, even though it's the same player logic, HLSJS, again, in this case. Uh, I, I'm not sure what's causing that difference, but I'm able to measure it, and it would be something we can investigate. Same for the televisions. The televisions here are clearly offering more bitrate switching, even though their level of connectivity, the second column is the, the estimated throughput, that's still relatively high. And if we compare Android smartphones with Vizio television, for example, both had 10 megabits per second average throughput, but the Vizio had twice as much bitrate switching going on as the Android. Now, it's probably a problem. This is a, a MSE player that's been running in a, in a television. Probably a native player might work better in that environment, but it still gives us great insight to go in and start debugging these issues. This table is a lot of, a lot of data. I just put it here so after the fact you can look for it. What I'm plotting is country, primarily on the left. I've plotted the number of buff, rebuffer events signaled by CMCD and divided it by the number of requests in order to give a proxy rebuffer rate, which is the second column from the right. The actual rebuffer rate for this test was super low. 1.1% was the highest rebuffering. Okay? However, many countries were low. I then normalized that rebuffer rate by dividing the highest by the lowest and plotted it out by country. So congrats to Sweden, which is number one on this one. And sorry, Puerto Rico, who had rebuffering that was 89 times worse than Sweden. And before we say, well, it's an island and it's, it's challenged, the second worst data here was from Great Britain, the United Kingdom, which was also just over 70 times worse than Sweden. Now, these results obviously only apply to this study, only apply to this test. But being able to look at this variation in country, and again, it's nothing magic about geo-boundaries. It's providers within these countries that are having trouble delivering data. And it's good to be able to investigate it. Uh, number five, looking at effective ad breaks and forward buffers. So this is some Golo output. We're looking at a session here. The top chart is showing buffer length over time. There's two tracks, because one's the audio buffer length, one's the video buffer length for DMUX content. And at the bottom is the measured throughput. The gaps that you see there, we wondered why there were gaps. That's actually advertising breaks. So the player is going off loading content from somewhere else. We don't get visibility into that because they weren't collecting CMCD data from the ad vendor. Uh, but you can see after the buffer break, the player has to build its buffer up again. So it's, uh, ad breaks are very discontinuous experiences. It also looks like it's building its buffer up ahead of having the playback because these little blue gaps is a gap before it starts playing. So that's also interesting. So for those of you interested in analyzing player behavior at scale across CDNs, CMCD is like a, a magnifying glass or microscope. You can go in and start looking at very specific player behavior. Also interesting in the study, we weren't getting enough rebuffering. And we wanted rebuffering to show that the rebuffer flag was working. So Sean went in and actually throttled some delivery at the edge one day. And it was good to see the behavior. So the top two traces, I know they're small. They're just showing you that a bunch of requests were going on. This trace is the throughput trace for a client. And you can see that the throughput declines dramatically. So in the timeline defined by the pink bar, that's, that's when we decided to throttle. So we have a drop in throughput. It doesn't go to zero like it looks like there. It was sufficient that it could play the lowest bitrate. But now we can look at our encoded bitrate trace. So it was playing just the top bitrate. And now you start to see the player switching bitrates. You see it going up or down with that variation. But finally, and importantly, the buffer length remained constant. And in fact, it rose a little. So this is clear evidence that ABR works, right? We, th we reduced delivery. We throttled our, our, our throughput. Our bitrate went down, but our buffer length was held. I think it's nice to see that working in practice. A note on future-proofing with CMCD. So privacy solutions are coming out. I'm giving another talk at this conference about the impact of them. One of them is that IP addresses are going to go away. They're not going to be reliable. And also user agents are being deprecated and fuzzified. So you're going to be stuck with a client visibility problem. The best way to track or to even count how many people are watching your stuff is for the client to voluntarily provide an identifier. And I would posit that CMCD is your best standards-based way of doing that. You can invent your own, but why? Go with a standard one that CDNs are going to support. 
My last slide here are some lessons learned in conclusion. So one, when, you, when it comes to, whoops, sorry. It's, when you come to implementing this in a player, it's actually hard for player workflows to know what the next object they're gonna request is. They always make just-in-time decisions. So I, I thought when we designed CMCD that, that the prefetching would be the first thing we would do. But it turns out to be one of the harder things we do because of the, the difficulty in putting it into players. But Dash.js are gonna put it in and we'll test uh, from there. The rest of the keys are actually quite accessible. Secondly, you should decouple your data from live monitoring versus forensic. When you're doing live monitoring, monitoring you're looking for anomalies. You don't need to see all the data. You need to see aggregate data and changes. And once you know something's wrong or not, or not right, if you want to put it in a machine learning sense, then you can go and collectively gather the detailed logs and do forensics on it. But you don't need all the detailed logs all the time, nor all the data. I recommend including session ID, measured throughput, bit rate, buffer length, and buffer starvation as your core data. If you put just those in, uh, you get some really meaningful answers out. Also, look, be wary UUIDs. We got all, all standards based and said, let's, let's use UUIDs as our string identifiers, but they're very big. And they can, they can dominate your, your log entry for CMCD, and then I get pushback from people because we're bloating log size. So if you don't need to use 36 characters to cover the, the permutations of your users, then don't and try to shorten it. Next steps for us are gonna to be to enable prefetching or to at least investigate, look at cache optimization we can do with this and eventually automated anomaly detection and network healing that can stem from that. And finally, it's addictive. When you debug problems and you have CMCD data and then you have to go off and debug something where you have no visibility in the client health, it becomes really frustrating. So it is a bit like crack for video engineers, but I welcome you to our world. And with that, thank you very much. We're happy to take questions. Well, b device ID would be really nice, and what we what we said was uh, max buffer length would help a lot because it would basically be something in lieu of device ID to still get the same sort of breakdowns we want, which is like compensating for the fact that different devices have different buffer lengths. So a lot of those, you know, a lot of the other metrics that we derive, we want to um, analyze in the context of those varying buffer lengths. So. some level of device classification. I think the granularity of it, I, I don't know, right? Like even when we, when we dig through Conviva data or Mux data, it's like, you know, it, just the, the man, device manufacturer, the, do we need the device uh, plus the OS version, like, or the version number? Some unique identifier I think is better than nothing, so. And I, yeah. you know, we had that in the spec and we took it out. So I should just quickly yeah. say the reason we took it out was anything that persists on the client can be used to track the client and people are becoming very sensitive about tracking, and, and rightfully so. So that was the reason it was out there. Now, if the, w the way to counter that is to say, well, can we bucket it? We don't need to know exactly the client, but we, can we at least know, is it an Android device of some kind, or maybe a smart TV of some kind? So that does allow some fingerprinting, but maybe the bucket's large enough that it might be acceptable to the community. Yeah, and if you go to yeah. our, our GitHub, so CTA Wave Common Media Client Data, you will find people have been putting in requests for things they want to add to version two. So I want to start version two, maybe towards the end of this year, but based upon real world studies like this one. So we don't guess stuff, mm -hmm. we know what's missing and we go add it. So if you're deployed it and you want to change, go put it in there and it will be seriously uh, debated. Yeah. Bill, right, uh, 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 oh, hold, Yuri one, has a question. One more very, very question. Quickly, yeah, can somebody potentially design a player that would game the system? It would under-report buffer I can't, can't, can't hear yeah, you, Yeah, I can't, can't hear you, can, sorry. Can somebody design a player to game the system to, to under-report buffering yeah. and uh, have unfair advantage as a result of it? Yes, in fact, someone could probably do it during this lunch break. <laughs> uh, it's open data, right? If you put junk in, you're gonna get junk out. Uh, and we, we also debated that at length. We can move to encryption, right? You could encrypt all this data, you could share a key, and then you'd have to share the decrypt key with everyone you wanted to be able to use the data. That, that is a problem. 
The reality is most, this is a workflow situation, right? Paramount are trusting, or building their players, they have control over them. If you want to, if you, if you can go in and hack the Paramount player and also send their logs in, well, congratulations, you've hacked their player mm -hmm. and they're gonna get bad data. But we thought we would leave out of V1 encryption for now until, it, until such time as we saw clear evidence that we needed to bring that complexity to the table. All right, thank you. Thank Thanks. Thank okay, our next speaker is Mike Lobby. Mike is the CEO and co-founder for Bitribble, and uh, he is uh, one of the inventors for the uh, Fountain Codes. So, Mike, take it away. Thank you. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, uh, I know it's great to be here, but it's a little bit scary seeing everybody, to be honest. And I always hate speaking after some people. Sometimes it's because they drive away the audience, they're really bad speakers, but in this case, it's the opposite. I always hate speaking after Will because he's always such a, a great speaker. So uh, tough, tough, uh, tough act to follow. Uh, so yeah, so this is more about future looking, delivering the metaverse using erasure codes. And it is a little more research focused than some of the other talks, so let me just warn you about that. So the challenge that we're focused on is to deliver these kind of immersive experiences, you know, these kind of metaverse experiences where you have uh, to deliver a lot of data and you have to do that with really tight latencies. So data rates ranging from 10 megabits per second to beyond a gigabit per second and latencies, depending on the application requirements from one, one second down to less than 10 milliseconds. And as everybody probably in this room knows, but uh, it's sort of a trend in the industry, the end devices are having to shrink down instead of having these big bulky headsets that people are wearing that they're really not very comfortable with. There, there's a decreasing form factor going on there. So there's power constraints and CPU constraints and so on. And, and also the experiences you're trying to deliver are becoming higher and higher quality. So there's this move to kind of do a split kind of rendering thing where part of the most of the computation is done on the edge or up in the cloud. And only the, and the other, what's delivered to the end client is kind of digested, right? And so that means you really have to kind of have a very kind of large volume of data that's being delivered with very tight latency over these last mile or from the cloud to the end client kind of thing. And typically you don't want a tethered client, so these are wireless devices. And all that causes some real uh, data delivery issues where the reality is that existing content delivery solutions don't really support these immersive experiences over a portion of the network where at least a portion is a wireless network. So here's an example of what we're talking about. This was uh, from a study that came out, uh, a, a white paper, I guess so you can call it that. It was actually a nine part series. The Metaverse Primer is what it's called. Uh, this is, was, I think, the second part out of that called Networking on the Metaverse. It was published by Matthew Ball. Uh, and so in this particular, th this is focused on gaming. And uh, so the study said that uh, hardcore gamers get really frustrated if the latency is more than 50 milliseconds. And even casual non-gamers start getting frustrated if the latency goes beyond 110 milliseconds. And at some point it just becomes unplayable. And obviously, I mean, if you think about it, obviously this has an impact on the, the amount of time people want to play games and so on. So in this particular case, they, they published that, you know, if you increase the latency by 10 milliseconds, it reduces weekly play time by 6%. So I, I've talked to this, uh, about this with a bunch of uh, gaming companies and so on, and, and the particulars don't matter, but they all agree that this is really the trend, that latency really is key and really matters. So I'm gonna sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about one of the ways of, uh, of dealing with this latency or erasure codes. Uh, this has been, there's been a lot of study on this. This is not, uh, this is some background on this. Uh, there's been a lot of other, other things that are published beyond what's on this particular list. Uh, but, but let me just give the general context. So you have an object, it's a video frame, for example. 
And so the basic idea is to take that and to generate some additional, so split it into packets, so th those are the source packets, and then generate some additional repair packets and send those along with the uh, original source packets. And, and the basic idea in many of these applications is to reduce the delivery latency. So you don't have to use these retransmission-based protocols where you have to go back and forth several times to deliver all the packets when there's any kind of packet loss, which there can be typically over wireless kind of infrastructure or other, when you have congestion or whatever. So uh, there's a lot of potential benefits with this approach. Uh, obviously, it provides resilience to packet loss, but more, maybe at least, or more importantly, it's a, it can provide a consistently minimum delivery latency, improve support for mobile clients. For example, when a, a client is moving from one uh, transmitter to another, there's this transition going between the two when it's trying to download something. How does it do that transition seamlessly? And when you're trying to do with that with ultra low latency, you know, milliseconds matter. Uh, it can, so, you can, so, so it can also improve uh, support for mobile clients. Um, and then you can also use it, and I'm not really going to talk about this much today, but to improve the delivery bandwidth but using multiple access points. So instead of just delivering from one access point, you can deliver from multiple at the same time, assuming your, your device supports that. And I'm not going to focus on this either, but it can also improve caching performance. So there are potential uh, overheads with using erasure codes, and that includes uh, using additional bandwidth. If you're using a fixed amount of repair, something like that, that consumes bandwidth. That's not good. can also be a CPU hog, it, it, depending on which kind of erasure code you're using. You don't want that to happen. Uh, and that, that also can add to coding latency. If it takes a lot of CPU to do the encoding decoding, it can also add latency to your overall solution, which is uh, what you're trying to combat. Uh, there's been a lot of previous work on this, as I mentioned, and each has at least some issues and, and with uh, providing some of these benefits and has some overheads. So what is the erasure code uh, desiderat desiderata? Uh, so it's, it would be good to support large K. Again, K is the size of the uh, object in terms of uh, source packets. So it's, it would be good if you could natively support any size object. Uh, small K forces you to splinter objects into many smaller blocks, and this is, can cause inefficient bandwidth usage. Uh, you'd also like linear complexity, so to minimize the CPU impact even when you're encoding, decoding from only repair packets, for example. So quadratic or larger complexity causes uh, CPU complexity and additional latency. And also, you'd like to support large N. So you don't want to necessarily send a lot of repair packets or anything like that. But I'll, as I'll explain in a couple of minutes, it, it, it's, if you have the availability to generate a large number of repair packets, this can support coordination of mobile clients, for example. Um, so support for N limited to linear and K causes coordination issues. So there's a bunch of uh, erasure codes out there, random linear network codes, Reed-Solomon codes, and a lot of other codes that are kind of used in practice. Uh, there's one code which we focus on, which is the Raptor Q code. This is a IETF standard RFC 6330, and it's near optimal in terms of all these properties. So I'm really going to focus on that at this point. Um, and I'm always a little bit uh, nervous because I know we're running over time. So um, can I get a, oh, there's a, it says zero. Is that accurate? <laughs> Is it always say, gonna say zero? Um, so who, who's the, well, okay, let me go forward and you stop me when I, when I need to stop. Um, so liquid data. So the basic idea is that um, with the Raptor Q, it's just like a normal erasure code. You can take the original source packets, an object, and deliver and generate additional repair packets, and then on the re and, and send those across the network. On the receiving side, you can take what you've re received and recover the original block. And and the basic idea is that it's pretty optimal in the sense that the amount you need to receive is equal to the size of the original block of data independent of which packets arrive. So in this sense, it's kind of like a liquid. You don't care which packets actually are delivered. You just care that enough packets are delivered. And this makes it a, uh, these erasure codes in general and RaptorQ as an example 
uh, it, it, pretty powerful because it releases this thing. What's unique about the Raptor Q is that you can you can use any kind of size blocks ranging from uh, blocks uh, source blocks that are one packet long to tens of thousands of packets long, and can literally generate any amount of uh, liquid data, any number of repair packets. Actually, it's limited to two billion, but you're never going to get up to that. Uh, and it does provide almost instantaneous encoding and de decoding. There's a bunch of references on the, the bottom here which uh, kind of go over some of the background on where, where this work came from. And it also describes some of the standards in which, which this uh, particular code is embedded into. So um, liquid data approach, it, only the liquid, the idea is to integrate this into the uh, internet essentially to uh, where only liquid data is sent in cached. So you can generate as much or a little liquid data as needed from a data block. The liquid data is sent in packets through the network from senders to receivers. And then, and you can also cache this liquid data. So it provides this huge amount of flexibility and is optimal. I mean, you, there's not another solution. I mean, in any solution, the number of packets you need to receive to recover an object is the number of packets in the original object. And this provides that, but it gives you the flexibility. It doesn't matter which package you receive. So it's kind of like this, uh, I don't know if you uh, remember the, the uh, T1000, uh, where it kind of turns into this metal liquid. Um, it's kind of like that conceptually, right? You just, you can't destroy it. <laughs> if enough gets there, um, you're going to be able to recover it. So let me just talk about coordination for a minute. Uh, so there's two things you'd like to do. So suppose you have two clients and they're downloading from two different nodes in the internet. Uh, the, the two properties you like is these additive responses. So that means that if a client is downloading from two different nodes, maybe not at the same time, but sequentially moves from one tower to another tower or something like that, you'd like it to get different content from these two different nodes. You don't want it to be uh, redundant. And then the other thing you'd like is that if, a, if multiple clients are downloading from the same node, like they are from the right node here, you'd like them to get the same content, same liquid data, because you don't want to kind of cache and store redundant stuff. And so these two, uh, I'm not going to go over this. I think it's just too detailed for this particular talk. But essentially, there's this idea of you take all the available uh, data that you could possibly generate you form a random permutation of that. And then you define the stream object as being the liquid data in that order, right? In the order of this random permutation. And the reason you do this is because, uh, and so here's a kind of visualization of that. So you have this huge pool, and this doesn't even give justice to it, but you have this huge pool of, of, of possible da liquid data that you could generate. You do this random permutation of it, and then you define these streamed objects with the d.p0 through respect to random permutation p0 and p1 with respect to permutation p1. But you're only going to generate a really small prefix of this whole thing. You're not going to generate the whole pool. You're going to generate a really tiny fraction. And the point is, if you do that, the overlap between these prefixes is going to be essentially zero, right? And you can prove this. It's not hard to prove. Um, there's some work at the bottom that goes through some details of that. And so what's the point of all that? When you're, when you're trying to uh, do this coordination, you want this additive response, common response kind of property, you can assign random permutations, say P0 to node, the first node, and P1 to the second node. And then when the client gets data from the first node, it's from the stream object D.P0, from the small prefix. And if it gets stuff from the second node, it's from this prefix d.p1, a small prefix. And the point is that's going to be non-overlapping data. So it, it, whatever the, it's going to provide you this additive response property. But it's also going to uh, provide this common response property because they're both going to be requesting the same data from the second node, for example. OK. So there's a lot of benefits to this, uh, you know, resiliency to any amount of packet loss, consistently minimum delivery latency. Actually, I, I will give a, a talk in the startup session this afternoon and give, focus a lot more on that and show a demo of that. So that should be fun if you want to come to that. Um, it does support 
mobile clients in a seamless way when they're moving from one node to another or downloading from multiple nodes at, at the same time. We do have customers who actually use that property. Um, can increase the delivery bandwidth using multiple access points. Uh, caching is near optimal. And then all the overheads are kind of minimal with this approach, and I'm not going to go over the details of that. So that's really it. Thank you. Appreciate your attention. Yeah, so the question is, is there an overhead with this liquid data because you might send or receive more than you need to, for example. So the answer to that is to come to the session this afternoon. <laughs> uh, I like this. It's a short answer and quick. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, uh, let's continue. Min, yes, our third speaker. Min Nguyen from Kalagan University. And uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am Min Nguyen from uh, uh, Kalagan University. Uh, today, I would like to uh, present our talk about like, take the red pill for S3 and uh, see how deep the rabbit hole goes. My uh, talk will include four sections. The first one is about the current pills we have, like HTTP 1.1, S2, and S3. Then, uh, I will talk about like how deep the rabbit holes uh, goes with S3, and uh, also I will present um, a, a way to measure the depth with the with our proposed S2, S, uh, S3 testbed. And uh, the last section will be the summary of the talk. Well, let's get started with uh, the current pills we have about HTTP 1.1, S2, and S3. Well, um, HTTP has been uh, used for over 30 years, and it was started in 1991 with uh, version z uh, 0 0.9, where only raw data transfer from the server to the client. And then HTTP version 1 and uh, 1.1 were continuously sp specified by uh, IETF in IFC documents, and about like uh, Almost 10 years later, HTTP 2 was uh, standardized in RFC 7540, and currently we are working on the HTTP uh, version 3 uh, since 2016. And uh, in this paper, we are focus we are we are going to uh, focus on uh, HTTP 2 and uh, S3 versions, and we will compare to uh, HTTP 1.1. Well, in uh, A2, we are, have, we are having many, many new uh, features like the server push, uh, the stream multiplexing, stream priority, and stream termination. Let's uh, get started with the first uh, server push feature. Well, in uh, HTTP 1.1, if the pipeline is not endable, we need one request to get one response, and then we waste one RTT to uh, receive the response. However, when, we, uh, when the pipeline is used, we don't need to waste RTT anymore, but still, we still need to send many requests to the server. Meanwhile, with the server push feature in A2, we can uh, just need one request, and we, then we will receive many uh, multiple responses. And so we can reduce request overhead, and also we save many raw chip times. In terms of the multiplexing features, we can uh, process requests in, uh, uh, at the same time, and also uh, we can save RTT when we, uh, when we do, don't need to waste the response. The third, prior, uh, the third feature is about the stream priority. In these features, the client can uh, indicate that the more, the more important data that uh, can uh, push faster from the server. And normally, these features should be used with the stream multiplexing. For example, here, we, you can see that the, we have two streams, stream A and stream B. We have uh, the, the, the stream B that is, that is set with uh, the weight 
parameters here is two and the weight for parameters A is one. So that means the stream B will be pushed two times faster than the stream A. And the final uh, feature in S2 is like the, is the stream termination. Well, with, with this uh, feature, the client can, can, uh, can terminate the unusable data from the clients and then uh, the server will stop immediately pushing the data to the clients. That will save a lot of data throughput or the, the downloaded data when, the, when those data cannot be used at the client. Currently, uh, HTTP3 is uh, in uh, process and this protocol version is built on top of quick uh, transport protocol and this version in, uh, inherits many HTTP2 features. But what news? Well, uh, HTTP3 can deal with head of line blocking and also it provides zero RDT features for faster connection establishment. So currently we have like HTTP 1.1 and the newest version is S3. So why don't we take the red pill for S3 and then we can see that how deep the rabbit goes, uh, rabbit hole goes with S3. Well, in the academics research, we can see that if HTTP 2 or HTTP 3 is uh, used in the default mode, the, the performance of that is not like uh, much difference. Even when uh, many RDT values is uh, tested, however, we can see that if you uh, many papers re can, uh, state that when the server push is used, we can reduce uh, the request overhead and also reduce the latency between the client and the server. Also, uh, and as a result, we can have higher throughput uh, utilization. With the stream priority and stream multiplexing, you can go deeper with, uh, to, to novel download strategies and also not only for the traditional video downloads, but also for 360 video streaming. And, uh, and also because of the head of light blocking, uh, HTTP 2 have worse results as HTTP 3 in the lossy networks. And uh, finally, you can go deeper with stream terminations to, re to reduce the unused data in retransmission techniques and also 360 video streaming. Uh, the question now here is like, can we go deeper? And we say yes. Why? Because uh, in HTTP2 versions, we, uh, which is specified in IFC 7540, uh, the, the old priority ma mechanisms is poorly imp uh, implemented because of complexity and also many other issues. So the um, many researchers are working on a new priority mechanisms and this new mechanism has not been extensively in investigated yet. So I think it can be an interesting topic in the future work and also uh, many papers uh, state that traditional approaches might not get benefits from S3 in default mode. So there is, uh, it is necessary for, 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 for new API algorithms that integrate S3 features to get better results for API uh, like in uh, adaptive REST schemes as a client and also sometimes for the server. Here we also introduce one of our work about uh, an HTTP2 and HTTP3 aware re retransmission technique, which is named like S2BR. Well, the motivation here is like one of the main issues in in uh, in DAS or in DAS is like the quality variation, when because of the throughput fluctuation, sometimes the quality is going down in the in the buffer. So the question is like, why don't we uh, upgrade the low quality segments in the buffer so that will uh, make the, the, the users happier? Well, in uh, S2BR techniques, we use some features from S2 and S3 like server pools, stream multiplexing, and stream priority. 
and, uh, and uh, stream terminations. It can be an uh, additional component in, in the clients that will send an uh, additional request, namely like retransmissions request from the figures here to get a new upgraded segment for, to, to replace low quality segments in the buffer. Well, in uh, our experiments, we can, we can see that for non-scalable video streaming, up to 70% lowest quality watching time is decreased and meanwhile we can increase up to around like 13% of the quality score. In terms of the scalable video streaming scenarios, we can see that video quality is also is increased and the quality switches is improved. And also uh, from the, when we compare S2 and S3 performance, we can see that S3 provides better results in low C networks because of, because of the, um, the head of light blocking issues. The next one is like we will uh, provide um, an HTTP3 testbed that will help, the, help you to, to measure how depth you are going to when you are using HTTP3 features, um, versions. Well, this testbed has the server side and the client side. The test, uh, query, the, um, the test coordinator here on the client side will kill the new job in the database, then those jobs are processed based on the job specific configurations parameters such as like the targets, streaming clients, dash JS, H, uh, ESO player, or HLS JS. Then the client will say, uh, receive the manifest and the segments from the S3 servers. From the, from the server side internally, S3 servers will, will, will use one of the predefined bandwidth Limit, uh, limitation trace to, to, uh, to test the playback under different scenarios. And during the playback, the workers' instances will report the playback metrics such as like the average, bit rate, start, startup delay, and the number of rebuffering events to the metrics uh, users using like um, CMCD or SAND protocols. So here we are. We introduce our proposed methods that can uh, that provides vis visualized server components for flexible compo uh, deployments, with which, uh, which can test different bandwidth trace as traces and uh, automated test runs via player workers. So, if you would like to uh, to learn more about this test base, please contact uh, Stefan and uh, Daniel from Fraunhofer, uh, who is uh, sitting down there. So in summary, we can see that S2 and S3 brings benefits for to us when their features are considered. However, the questions of what we can do with S3 and S2 to improve has is still not fully answered. So uh, the new, new, some new designs for S3-based AB algorithms and download strategies can be necessary to, uh, to answer those questions. And also in this talk, we are introduced an uh, S3 testbed that can be a uh, functional tool for automated testing and uh, providing vi visualized designs. And that's, that's all for my talk, and thank you for the attention. We will, uh, we will postpone the questions for the lunch break. Uh, yeah, thank you, okay. Min. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because we are already a bit running late, uh, we will continue with the next uh, talk, Faisal. Oh, all right, can't see you. All right, so Faisal is gonna talk about video AI. Uh, he's from Comcast. All right, welcome. Who's gonna start? Harry. All right, Harry, go ahead. not presenting. There it goes. All right, I know I'm standing between you guys and lunch, uh, so I'll make it brief. Um, so video AI, um, I'm really looking forward to tell you about that CTS in our newest offering. 
Uh, first of all, what is CTS? Uh, we referred to Comcast, uh, but Comcast Technology Solutions. Um, we take our uh, Comcast Technologies, our bread and butter, and we bring it to the market for, for purchase. We can implement different areas. I'm not going to go too deep in this. this. I'm not the first CTS presentation today, and we know we've already discussed it. So why is it so important? Why does this matter to you guys? How does this change your delivery and change your thinking? Um, we, my boss always says this, you know, we eat our own cooking. This is technology that we use internally. It's um, brought to scale. It establishes an understanding and we un um, have a very solid understanding of our video. So what is video AI? Why are we all here? Why are you guys listening to me? Um, so video AI analyzes the video and um, applies AI and machine learning and enhances uh, an understanding of what is occurring within that video. Uh, so it can take a look by frame by frame. It can determine where ad breaks are, where ads are occurring, where the best place to insert an ad is. It determines what's seen on screen in that particular moment. It can determine objects and you can create this uh, to do a variety of different things. Um, it's a suite of services, and I'm going to get into a couple different use cases we can go into with video AI. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to take you a little, let's take a little step back. When we look at video, right, we know how to capture video, we know how to encode video. We know how to encrypt the video. We know how to deliver the video, decode it, watch it. Gigabits worth of, gigabytes worth of data. How much do we actually know about what's inside the video? We don't. We know very little. And if we look at what's inside the media, what do we know? Well, we'll have a couple of sentences about what the video is about, what that content is about, what that ca content captures, perhaps a little bit about what the ratings are perhaps a little bit about what's inside, um, you know, what's, what's happened inside or what's a generalized synopsis of it. But really, from a moment by moment, how do we, what do we know about the video? Uh, we have all this information, we have all these technologies that are running and processing video, but do we actually know what's inside the video? And that's what video AI does. And what, so video AI, what we're looking at is computer vision, machine learning, audio signal analysis, natural language processing, sort of all the various constituent algorithm, algorithmic technologies that have been developed over the last 20, 30 years, really starting to bring them to bear on understanding what's happening inside the video. So with the advent of AI and the, the newest um, uh, you know, wave of machine learning algorithms, we have a lot more tools at our disposal to analyze and understand what's happening inside of a piece of a content. So what do we do? Well, we leverage all these algorithms, but marry on machine learning and artificial intelligence in some cases, deep learnings, traditional uh, methods, and we provide valuable temporal metadata about what's happened inside the video by moment by moment. So. Two examples here that we highlight here is, for example, segmentation. Um, a lot of times, content needs to be segmented. And when we look at segmentation, it could be the natural ad boundaries. It could be start from one scene to the next. It could be, you know, this is a natural stop of a, a, a news story. And this is the start of the weather segment, for example. So looking at natural segmentation, there's a lot of opportunities when we look at segmentation to enable binge watching, for, for example. So where are the credit rolls? Um, and so these are the types of opportunities we can enlighten. Contextual advertisement, of course, it's a big avenue. Um, it's a big area for us. It's something that we, if we know what's happening in the video, guess what? We are able to provide contextualized advertisements against that content. Today, what does that advertisement run off of? really that piece of general, generalized piece of information, not really down to the scene level, not really down to the shot level, not really the, even down to the segment level. It's very gross level information from which the vast majority of advertisements are being served. So with that, let's go a little bit deeper. So what are the types of information that we can extract from video? So I'm gonna give you a sampling, 
as not ne necessarily all of them, but a sampling of the types of information we're extracting from the video. Some of this information is very technical. Some of it is going to be very uh, somewhat uh, semantically interesting. So if we look at what, what types of algorithmic technologies can be brought to bear, well, of course, text detection. Understanding what's happening on the text provides a really rich source of information because we can tell what is the segment about, what is, what, what's the, you know, who's, what topic is being talked about. Um, celebrity recognition, of course, knowing who's on the screen provides a generalized piece of information that's rather rel uh, relevant but also valuable. If we look at scene segmentation, so very technical pieces of information. So where does the shot boundary end? Where's the black frames occurring? Where are the slugs in the video? Um, what are the transition points? Is, are we going through a hard cut? Are we going through a soft transition? Fade in, fade out? These are the types of information we can extract. Some additional things that are a little bit more semantically interesting. Concepts. So, for example, this is a lady, a female speaker, standing on the stage. There's applause that's happening in the video. Um, things such as, where's this, where, what is the context behind this scene? Is this a gym? Yes, this is a gym because we see it. We see the very uh, relevant pieces of, of um, you know, workout equipment. We'll see people in wearing, um, you know, gym uh, equipment. And of course, the sort of the traditional, most of you probably have seen this object detection, generalized object detection, where we can detect various things, you know, things, you know a wide gamut of things, people, places, things, um, and, and really assign, start to assign information out of it. Um, uh, sorry, confidence out of it. So now that we have this information, this in of itself is very informative. Now, we're gonna talk about how do we make it actionable. Right? So when we look at algorithms, we're going to, I'm gonna to talk to you about, a little bit about in, in the, using the analogy of cooking. All right? So we have recipes, we have ingredients, and we have the meal. So we're gonna go through it this step. And so when we look at it, um, I'm sorry, uh, this should be highlighted, but it's not. So I'm gonna go, uh, just go back one. Here we go. So these are, when we talk about ingredients, what I showed you in the previous slides were ingredients, right? They're raw ingredients, they're informative. They themselves, you can consume them, but they, you know, you can do a lot more with them. And so when we talk about it, we talk about it in the forms of detectors. And so things such as you know, silence in the audio or things that are happening in the logo, um, you know, events that are happening, this technical piece of information. This is, um, you know, a, a detector. Uh, sorry, this keeps um, highlighting out, so I'm not sure what happened here. But if we, so bear with me, uh, technical difficulties. But when we took about, when we look at these ingredients, What's, what can you do with ingredients? Well, if you have a good recipe, you can create a meal out of it. And that is the algorithms that come into play. So these recipes are, in fact, some of the traditional recipes that we talk about when we marry domain, you know, rule-based techniques. We can say if this and this, else that. We can, we can sort of start to get some idea of what are the things that we can cake, cook. But really, from a rule-based techniques, they've been tried not really a lot of information that's come out of it. Uh, then we start to get into a little bit more of the interesting areas. We start to look at the statistical uh, techniques. Again, going up that in information or you know, yeah, the curve of, of, of algorithms, we'll look at machine learning, we'll look at deep learning. And so when we start to marry these ingredients up, we start to get more and more informative and really rich set of experiences that we can enable. So some of these, for example, we alluded to earlier in the last slide, is content segmentation. Um, knowing where the at boundaries are, that's an important piece of information when we try to monetize content. Uh, content chaptering, what are the relevant pieces of content? So we can take long form and can we convert that automatically into short form content? Guess what? Yes, in, in many cases we can. Um, contextualized advertisement, what do we know? If we know that there's a, person, uh, there's a particular scene, 
with a particular set of attributes, we say, okay, well, let's target a certain set of ads against that segment. And it doesn't have to be this gross level demographic, very high level piece of, uh, um, you know, gross level of, of, of information that we can use uh, when we use today for de delivering ads. Um, binge watching, of course, it's a very common technique. Um, it's something that we're all familiar with. Again, something that we've enabled is sports highlights is to be able to understand what's happening in sports in, in real time and, and start to develop experiences against that and to pro uh, provide our audiences with highlight experiences that they can use to catch up on, on sports, for example. Um, and then finally, one of the things that it enables is, is once we understand what's happening inside the vid video, there's a lot of opportunities for media operations. To understand, here's a black frame, here's a hard cut, here's video quality that's being delivered. There's a lot of information that's carried within the video itself. Now, now that we're able to mine that information, we can get to that level of providing media operations where it, in some cases, can be fully automatic, in some cases, it can be operator assisted. Um, so, with that video AI system, how do we actually do it? Very basic level, sort of block diagram ish approach here. So, we'll take a video in, it can be live video, it can be file based video, uh, break it up into its constituent parts. Usually, a video, a media piece of media has three constituent parts audio, video, and then the closed captions or subtitles. We apply a set of algorithms against it. You know, the, in the audio track, we'll use audio analysis. In the video track, um, we'll look for the traditional computer vision, image processing um, techniques, closed caption, natural language processing, extraction of features in the closed captions. And then we layer on these additional algorithms, and that's where the ingredient, the recipe that I mentioned earlier comes into play, is these algorithms that can quickly be put together to offer entertainment experiences, experiences in media operations, experience in, in analytics, provide you greater insight into what's happening in the video. So, again, building off that ingredients analogy, I'm gonna go into a little bit of a Lego analogy, is, is when we look at media, um, and if you look at understanding media, there's rarely a silver bullet to understanding what's happening inside the video. Um, there is a lot of semantic gap between where technologies have traditionally been and the type of information that can make that, inf that we can take action against. And with video AI, what we're doing is coming up that semantic curve. There's still ways to go, but we have a very good understanding of what's happened. Now we're developing that information in, in, in what's happening inside the media at any given point in time by using these algorithmic tools that are now at our disposal and that we've put into play in within Comcast. So, um, you know, again, we're gonna talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about layered algorithms. This is what we're doing today. We have a way of, if you look at it in the, um, in the traditional sort of machine engineering sense, if you look at the Kalman filtering approach where we have a set of signals we marry those signals up. How do we marry them up? That is the intelligence that we bring to bear and that's some of the experiences that we've enabled within Comcast. Those are the experiences that we've made available in video AI. So with that, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, an experience that we have in sports. So what does all this technology do? I know a lot of people were implementing AI strategies for the last couple of years and they always asked, what does this mean? What can we do with this? We have now have all this data. How does this change? So when you're looking at the screen, um, we're presenting something um, called Sports Recap. Um, a viewer is joining a, an event um, live, but they are trying to catch up. They joined 30 minutes late, and they're trying to catch up on the key events that have happened up until that point so they can catch up, um, so they can understand what's happening, they can pull out the information, and they can scroll through. So on the bottom right-hand side, they're watching the live video feed in case something major happens within the the race or in the game, um, and meanwhile, they're thumbing through all the different highlights that have occurred in the past. This is all generating using AI um, and our video AI solution. 
So that's just one of many experiences you can power once you understand what's inside the video. Any questions? Are you considering expanding this analysis in the direction of uh, detecting deep fakes, uh, um, falsifications, all sorts of uh, things that could be not exactly real? So the question was something along the lines of, are we considering expanding to detect deep fakes? Is that what your question was? Deep Sorry, fake. cut off. Yeah, deep, deep fakes, uh, things that could be uh, manipulations of public opinion, things that could be uh, yeah. uh, inconsistencies between visual information and audio track commentary about what it is, uh, things in that direction. So I'm going to answer your question kind of in a different way. Um, so video AI came about um, by understanding what was happening on screen to determine when variances happened, um, so if the long, wrong feed was put into place um, and it can detect and notify someone immediately. Um, that is uh, not part of video AI of what we're doing currently. This is more about branching out new features from the, um, the video space, but I'm not rolling out that that's not a direction we're going to take it. So what's the turnaround time? Um, so say it I'm interested in this last slide. You showed this goal, and I was just trying to understand what's the turnaround time of detecting a goal and making it available for the customer to watch it in the past. So turnaround time, is that still within the 10 second time frame? Yeah. So um, when you're talking about from a linear standpoint, um, how quick we can turn around, um, our AI solution normally has a, a variance of the of 10 seconds from the linear feed. So it should become available right away. Um, if you're submitting something file-based, obviously that would be depend on uh, your needs from that video. So are you using Scuddy to uh, tag that goal and present it to the user? How, how, how are you doing this? So we're not using it. It can be transformed into something like that, but okay. internally we're sending back the time frame in which that goal occurred okay. um, and, and what it was. We're also sending a bunch of other data that are not within SCUDI standards. For example, celebrity was seen on the screen at this time, but it can be transformed into uh, a marker if needed, okay. Thank you. Uh, utilizing another service. Everyone that has worked with AI know it's great when it works, but invariably there's false positives. So uh, is data still reviewed by humans? For example, if in your soccer game, if there's, you think it's a goal, but it hasn't been a goal, how is that, that processed? Yeah, so that's something that when we were first implementing was the common question. So um, AI is detecting the goal, but it is verifying against a, st a statistics service that's also verifying via humans that a goal has occurred. Um, it's also taking in context more than just what's seen on screen, but also closed captionings, what was said, um, and using all of those to make an ultimate determining. Um, it's the difference between AI and like the machine learning take into account. It's more than just detectors, it's the algorithms to understand I have a very high confidence score that this was for sure a goal. But still with human validation on top. Correct. Okay. Thank you. He actually asked my question, but I'm going to follow up on his question. So when we talk about human moderation, I heard that you're using data from surveys that people had said, oh, that was a goal. So I come in 30 minutes later, I'm watching the recap. Is there anything in place where somebody, there's a human in the loop, like even after that percentage of people said it was a goal or it was that particular player, et cetera, where it can be pulled out before it ends up in the list? Um, so, it, uh -huh. there, yeah, there, that, there can be. So it's the, the AI system is gonna pull back, but there can be an intervention put in place to prevent that or even remove it. So that'd be a custom feature? Uh, it wouldn't be custom. It would just be taking into account and can be transformed beyond that. All right. Thank you. Time. Thanks for our speakers. Thank you. All right. The second from the last. Jise. 
No, there's one more talk after yours. So that's why you need to hurry. Uh, <laughs> Come on over, yeah. G uh, Gisa is uh, visiting us from Oslo, Norway. So she took, uh, I mean, her flight was a bit shorter than mine, So, but still it's, it was a long flight, I guess. All right, Gisa, take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I know that now I am literally standing between you and lunch, so I will try to keep it short. Also, I was instructed by Christian. Um, by the way, we are, <laughs> I know it's completely unrelated, but we at Simulamet are working on uh, automated pipelines for soccer video production as well. I know that probably they're not as uh, sophisticated as Comcast, but feel free to contact me about that one as well later on. Uh, coming back to our topic of today, uh, my name is Chise. I'm a researcher at the Similar Research Laboratory in uh, Oslo, Norway. And today I will be presenting you uh, our paper titled uh, Multimedia Streaming Analytics, Quo Vadis, Where Are We Going? This is a joint work collaboration with, uh, between Simulamet and Fraunhofer Focus. And uh, I from Simula and uh, Stefan right over there from Fraunhofer, uh, Fraunhofer Focus is there for any questions that you might have. I hope uh, if you're interested, you contact us also offline because I don't think uh, we've been able to capture all the things we wanted to argue for in our paper in these uh, few slides. So let's, let's look at what we are focusing on. We're, when, we are focus when we mention uh, multimedia streaming analytics, we are focusing on um, products, the OTT streaming analytics products that are marketed as such. For instance, the cool stuff that uh, Will <laughs> and Sean were presenting earlier would be one example where you would be able to look at performance, QoE, or any kind of um, uh, OTT streaming aspect with respect to certain metrics and aggregating them over certain metadata and, and um, making, making certain generalizations and taking conclusions. Now, what, when we looked at the BitMove in Video Developer Report, we saw that there was uh, there was a question regarding the popularity of different analytics products and we picked the top five except for the in-house ones and the Google Analytics and uh, we actually decided to focus on these five and do some sort of a benchmarking study, a survey of what actually they were doing and uh, what, what could be done more, so to speak, to, to bring together the different worlds of industry, academia and maybe the developer the community. So we looked at uh, Conviva. Um, Bitmovin, Max and Paul, sorry about the <laughs> weird alignment, and Media Melon. And here I would also like to thank um, our contacts from Bitmovin, Daniel, uh, from Max, Phil, uh, Steve and Steve, and from Media Melon, uh, Kumar, um, Pierre and uh, uh, Sum Sumit, who were very, very helpful uh, in giving us feedback and confirming some of our findings. Unf unfortunately, we were not able to make contacts with Conviva and uh, uh, and Paul, so we, we rely on publicly available information in whatever we present in our paper and in, our, in all our conclusions. So uh, the first thing we wanted to look at was uh, whether we could create some sort of a taxonomy of uh, their actions, of what they were doing, whether we could create categories of um, using common terminology of the metrics, for instance, they were targeting or the metadata that they were collecting alongside the metrics and the kind of export functionalities or other functionalities that they were um, supporting. I'm only going to present here a brief, uh, brief summary of what we did, but uh, we came up with our own, so to speak, taxonomy to describe the metrics, for instance, and we believe that this is a very interesting discussion also in line with all the standardization discussions we have uh, been having all day long. What we did was we looked at all of the metrics provided by all five products and we tried to sort them into categories audience, quality, or you can call it performance, error, and ad. Ad is quite similar to quality and because we're researchers, we didn't care so much about ad, but uh, we focused mainly on audience, quality, and error. Quality including things related to startup, buffer, and quality in, in terms of both the picture quality and the adaptation, like um, the quality level. I'll just uh, go over the takeaways. First of all, you don't need to be able to read this, but this is the kind of table that we present in the supplementary material, in our supplementary material. Um, we're presenting all the metrics that all of the products are you know, uh, promising. So there's a very large number of uh, metrics provided, and they're largely overlapping, which is a super cool thing, obviously, just like uh, <laughs> your analytics product. And um, because these are there because they're actually super necessary. We want to know things about the uh, audience. We want to know things about how many stalls there were, 
um, this is the quality, or we want to know um, things that have um, actually made your streaming process like break. We want to know about errors. But there are different levels when we looked at different pro across different products, different levels of details, and different naming schemes across products, which means that they're actually very, very hard to work concurrently with metrics from multiple products. And combined with the scarcity of open documentation, obviously, because these are you know, commercial products, um, the meanings and use cases of lots of metrics were unclear. The same was the case for metadata. First, we came up with this taxonomy, and we divided into, I think, seven group plus everything else, where one group is, for instance, the session identifiers, one group is uh, metadata related to the asset, one group is the metadata related to the client, just like we were discussing earlier with the hardware, for instance, device, OS, this kind of things. One thing is about the application and transport, for instance, Min would be interested here to know what um, HTTP version was it, yeah? Was it TCP or QUIC? That would be some metadata at the transport layer. Or network layer, like the MCC, MNC, if it's a mobile network, ISP generally, um, ASN, IP now, uh, addresses, things like this, and spatiotemporal, which is essentially location and time, time of day, month, year, city, country. And our takeaways in the metadata were, again, we have these huge tables in, the in our supplementary material, please take a look. But the takeaway is that, again, there's a large number, and the products are slightly different in their availability, like the things that they're actually providing, but there's, a, again, large overlap. And if we could fix this really, really minor terminology problem, the fact that we don't really have a common language to refer to these, um, you know, we could conquer all. Uh, we, we made some benchmarks with respect to different categories. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go into detail much, but th these are about data export, for instance. Are these products able to export the, your data if you're, for instance, a streaming service so that you can use it also elsewhere? Uh, do they provide a dashboard and uh, visualization? Almost everyone does, or everyone does, obviously. Um, do, you have, uh, do they have um, zoom in real time uh, functionality for individual playback sessions, not just aggregate metrics, but zooming in on the timeline of individual playback sessions. Uh, do they also support live streaming and not just VOD? Can they have uh, analytic uh, integration, sorry, with big data and analy analytic services that are third party services? Is there such a thing as um, aggregate views in terms of breakdowns and filters, which was a very good example? Uh, actually, I think Will did where he was doing a breakdown, or Max calls it filter, of, let's say, um, um, delay, RTT, sorry, uh, rebuffer rate, something, with respect to country, country being there the filter, or the breakdown dimension. Yeah, so a metric broken down with respect to uh, metadata, with respect to a filter, and aggregated. Um, industry benchmarks, some products also allow for benchmarks of, let's say, your performance, across all of their customer base in an anonymized fashion, of course, which is also pretty interesting. There's even reports uh, you see from Conviva, for instance, state of streaming. These are kind of based on these instant industry benchmarks. Errors and root cause analysis, to, uh, in two of which there's also the mentioning of the use of AI, you know, um, doing some advanced stuff. Going over to QOE, this is another aspect we wanted to look at because for us, analytics products is not just these metrics and dashboards and metadata that they provide, but also a sense of QOE and a, and a possibility to do research, scientific research, and to be used by the academic community as a tool to research QOE and what, for instance, improves QOE. One basic thing we did was to look at really, really basic four um, models in literature. Two of them are ITU recommendations, as uh, you would recognize here, and two of them are QOE models from uh, academia. And we looked at the raw metrics and metadata that these models would require. And as you see, very, very simply, all of the products, the state-of-the-art products that are out there would be able to calculate such models, such um, established and uh, published methods, uh, QOE scores, for every single one of the sessions that go through them. So our idea was that, that there could be something common in the calculation of this uh, session st scores, and uh, why not use something that's existing? Obviously, we don't need to, sorry, use these models. These are the very, very basic four examples that we present here for the sake of argument, but why not use something similar in uh, different analytics products and make our lives easier? But when we looked at the commercial practices, of course, it was the uh, complete opposite. Uh, 
let me quickly go through them. I know there's also a lot of detail here, but everybody is doing something else to summarize. Bitmovin is displaying no custom score, session score, only raw metrics. Conviva is uh, creating their own custom score, co streaming performance index using some uh, metrics of its own. Media Melon doing its own. Max is doing its own. Empo is also doing its own without documentation. So our problem here or, or our takeaways are that session score calculation is not at all compatible across, across products. And their existing standards also do not specify anything related to this, even the CTA 2066, which we will come to, meaning that there is no uh, common language or standardization when it comes to you know, us all talking about, oh, I calculated QOE. Yeah, I also I calculated QOE. L now let's compare them. So we don't have this benchmark because we have not commonly defined QOE. Um, now let's come to the standards and what, what could we do? As we have discussed uh, from you know, the beginning of the morning, we have SAN, we have CMCD, we have CTA uh, 2066, and all of them are, um, were awesome to have and are advancements, but nobody is or is able to or is uh, currently applying them in the analytics products in the way that um, they, are, they are translatable to different products. So, of course, for instance, we saw good examples with CMCD and uh, Conviva and Max are actually contributors to the CTA standard. But what we have seen from our analysis earlier of the metrics and metadata was that no more than 10% of those things were covered by the standards. Those things that the products are actually providing are, are, not, are not, you know, standardized in any way or form. These are just two examples here. Um, I just wanted to show two co uh, opposite examples. There's one field, for instance, called audio bitrate. This is one metric. And despite the fact that all standards seem to have something related to audio bitrate, most of the products, these five first rows are the products, have nothing regarding it. I know it's a very basic metric, and we don't necessarily need <laughs> all products to have something there. But there might be f metrics that standards refer to, and products do not actually collect. From the other way around, there might be something like we found concurrent plays, which everybody seemed to be very interested in. All of the products had this, had no mention in the standards. So we have lots of examples like this, where sometimes when we make standards, we think that certain fields are interesting, but commercial products do not actually implement them, and nobody collects them or uses them. You know, you just add them. Like I think Will had made a point about that also earlier, where we should be maybe more rigid in our addition of things to standards if they're not going to be used. And uh, from the other uh, way around, we should also be careful about not omitting stuff or forgetting to put stuff in the standards if they're going to be for sure used by everyone, albeit with different naming schemes or, you know, uh, different, different paradigms of calculation. So here I don't want to <laughs> put any of the standards down, and I know there are a lot of CMCD <laughs> lovers here. My favorite is the CTA 2066, but each of these standards, you can see that uh, are a little bit targeting a certain stakeholder, a certain use case, right? CMCD, we know it's about CDNs. It's about CDN optimizations. Sandis was a bit more about network optimizations, right? T utilizing the network bandwidth properly and doing these adaptations clearly, uh, cleverly. CTA was more from the perspective of the service provider, right? So if you were like the content or the service provider, then it was more of it targeting you, but of course it's also the closest one to what we did now with the common terminology and stuff. Let's skip the research, although it's super interesting for me. Here today we would like to propose a number of things that hopefully we can also continue discussing later with all these takeaways. QOE scores, in our opinions, or let's call them custom session scores, are in our opinion very, very important summary metrics to describe end user performance or experience, not only from a research perspective, but also from a monetary perspective for commercial entities, because it dis defines one of the root causes of churn, for instance, right? So we believe that it's very, very important to be able to have a common understanding of saying, uh, this session is ranking 90%, this session is ranking 80%, or do it from one to five in an uh, absolute category rating. This is a four, level session, this is a three level session. We believe that this is very, very important and it would be very, very useful to have some sort of standardization on this to go into the analytics products. Second is the general standardization. Here I wrote one standard to rule them all, but we had discussions with Nikolai earlier and also some other people that maybe we should try to extend existing standards because, come on, who wants more and more standards every day for everything? Of course, we, should, we could go into 
thinking about extending existing standards, and for instance, CTA would be the place to go. But the discussion point here is how do we want to standardize with respect to which type of metrics? For instance, do we go with raw metrics or the kind of aggregate metrics that CTA currently deals with, like average startup rate? But then what do we do with the raw metrics of the per session startup time, which actually goes into the QOE? So there is the granularity issue. This is one thing. There is the stakeholder issue. Who are we targeting with this? And who should we optimize for? If we are doing it for a CDN, maybe really too much data is too much data. You know, the logs are too big and we actually don't want to collect too much data. But if it's more academically oriented or research oriented, then we really need to find that trade-off to be able to say, no, we need more fields, even if it's going to be, you know, super storage heavy file sizes. The third discussion is research collaborations. We heard a lot of, uh, about AI today, and that was my example, but there's also many other topics. There really could be benefit to both sides if academia and industry and also the developer community were, were to come together in a sense that we, like Voltron, I don't know how old everybody here is, but we, we you know, join our strengths and we actually help each other in a way that, you know, nobody has to sacrifice too much. So we really believe in uh, research collaborations and we have a few notes on this uh, in our paper about how lacking it actually is, looking by the number of publications. Um, this is one discussion point. Another is community resources, and maybe this is the one I would like to emphasize the most. Open source uh, reference implementations, we believe, would really pave the way for, together with standardization efforts, lead the way for increased research or, let's say, facilitating of research by the help of uh, the industry and uh, in return helping the industry make more meaningful and researched decisions through the help from uh, academia. This could be like an analytics mini with uh, plug and play options, you know, with uh, APIs and things we can define where everybody could con contribute from the community. And for instance, open and anonymized data sets for benchmarks. Now I'm calling out all the big companies here where as a researcher I would say if you were to provide anonymized, of course, and uh, you know, problem-free data sets to the research community, then maybe they could give you some of the answers that you're seeking more easily with their experience in the sexy AI, ML, or something less sexy, but still, you know, <laughs> research-worthy. These kind of things could be shared and created as benchmarks so that we really, you know, as a community, help uh, each other grow. grow. And uh, I want to refer to Dania's uh, presentation and the general um, let's say, mechanism of Dash IF, or the way Dash JS is, uh, you know, um, run as a community project. Analytics, uh, streaming, anal OTT streaming analytics products are also something we actually see this way. You know, especially this open source reference implementation, we believe could be constructed exactly the way that they have done, very successfully, I might add, the uh, Dash JS um, community to build up. And from the internet networking community, if here are some people. MLab is also a very good example. I added the, embedded the links to our paper and supplementary material if you get these links. I hope you get a chance to look at the paper. And uh, please contact us, Stefan and me, um, if, if you're interested. Thank you very much. And uh, have a great lunch. <laughs> I think Ali doesn't allow any questions. <laughs> We, uh, we have one more talk uh, before the lunch. No. Thanks, Jisa. Yes, we did. Seriously? We did. Ah, Yuri. Because we skipped uh, Yuri okay. in the <laughs> first session. Uh, thanks, Jisa, again. And uh, find Jisa for questions during the lunch. By the way, the papers and the abstracts uh, will be, you know, they've been sent to ACM and then um, publication should be, uh, the papers should be available in a few weeks. All right, Yuri, thanks for waiting. And uh, please, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, guys, in case if you were curious what is my accent, it is Ukrainian. And you, of course, know what kind of world and we live in and what kind of war we are fighting now. But uh, let me uh, switch to what I was meant to present here today. Uh, also, mentally, of course, I'm somewhere else. Uh, I'll talk about uh, multiple uh, media representations and CDN performance. As you know, uh, this, uh, 
era of streaming, uh, we're talking about HTTP-based adaptive streaming protocols, Dash HLS with multiple renditions, CDNs, and so on. But we not always realize where these ideas came from, in which order, and whether they even make sense today at architectural level. And important to note is that adaptive bitrate streaming as mechanism has been invented decades before HTTP-based streaming was even around. It was before CDNs even existed. The first system of this kind was Real System G2. I was lucky one to, to work with that company building it. And uh, it, it works same way as uh, today's systems, except there were no CDNs. And the multiple streams that were generated, they were placed on streaming server. And from that streaming server, the distribution was always single stream. The uh, clients were always receiving st single streams. There was never all abuse of the network. There was never a concept of sending multiple streams or caching multiple streams somewhere else even envisioned in this concept. Now, uh, of course, it, was, it had many problems. It wasn't as scalable as today's systems. But uh, adaptive bitrate streaming existed before. Then came CDNs, and of course came Move Networks, uh, uh, Apple, Microsoft with uh, a modern era s uh, design were uh, effectively system is still the same. Uh, uh, now the server uh, is get reduced to simple HTTP based uh, server, and CDN is now used as a relay. Uh, where uh, it now picks uh, not, o not a single stream that the uh, client is uh, requesting. CDN is effectively carrying all the streams in ABR package from uh, the uh, origin servers to edge nodes if there are requests to those uh, multiple streams, of course. And what happens at the edge node of CDNs is that those multiple streams starts competing. And uh, which is why if you have a, a uh, a single rendition or single format in which you uh, produce your content, it works wonderfully. But if you have multiple of them, uh, something might not get cached, and then you're going to have uh, a cache miss, and the content will be pulled all the way back from CDN, and now it's not, that's going to be uh, more expensive and uh, will uh, be problematic in any way in terms of scalability, reliability, and so on. So uh, this is where we are today. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there is a disconnect between ABR model and CDN uh, delivery. With ABR, uh, you need to have multiple streams to be able to adapt to network. And the more streams you have, the more graceful that adaptation could, uh, could happen, right? You could uh, have the sm smaller gra uh, switches, uh, s smaller granularity switches. Uh, your QE is going to be better. You will be able to uh, track network uh, bandwidth more accurately. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, if you have more streams now at CDN, and uh, it's going to cost you more with uh, competition at the edge. And uh, the concept of ABR actually get abused. We know that with uh, multiple uh, flavors of uh, uh, streaming system, HLS versus uh, Dash with different DRMs, uh, there have been multiple formats uh, uh, introduced, and uh, the way to serve them was to create multiple streams in those formats. Uh, luckily, CMUF uh, is now addressing it to some extent. Uh, but uh, for, uh, hopefully it will address it more in the future. But even today, 10% uh, of Apple devices can only support older formats. And uh, how you can serve them? By creating uh, older format uh, representations. And uh, uh, similarly, with new codecs, uh, this concept gets abused even more because to, to serve multiple codecs, now you need to encode uh, videos and multiple uh, representations and then uh, throw this all on CDNs for CDNs to, to deal with this. Of course, uh, there is a disconnect and, uh, and uh, objectives of this talk is, uh, is to try to uh, look at this mathematically. Uh, try to understand uh, what are the consequences of uh, having multiple representations on uh, edge cache performance. Uh, what could be uh, recommendations that could be driven from it and uh, and try to validate the theory with experimental data. And uh, with this, let's uh, uh, talk a, a, a bit about mathematics. It will be all extremely simple. And I will use only a few formulas. 
so uh, to start uh, talking about uh, caching uh, performance, we need to uh, know something about distribution of uh, the original content. And let's assume that the content is a set of n items or infinite number of items. And let's assume that uh, these items are ordered in order of decreasing probabilities. And let's also assume that that empirical distribution of those items could be effectively approximated by some model. In this case, I, I pick zeta distribution, which is a well-known case of uh, uh, monotonic discrete uh, distribution similar to uh, Zips distribution, pair to rule, and uh, many other uh, distributions of this kind that's been proven in, uh, as useful in modeling. Uh, real-world distributions. In fact, there was recently a paper uh, studying uh, distributions of items on YouTube, and they have shown that this model works pretty well as, lo as long as you pick right parameter. So, so that's what we will assume as the uh, uh, popularity model for content or segments of the content, whichever we take as smallest uh, elements that we call item. Now. Uh, what would be the performance of ideal cache if we have uh, this set of items uh, thrown in this cache and we know that the capacity of this cache is C items? Well, uh, it turns out it's pretty simple to compute uh, if we assume that cache ideal. And, and what would be the ideal cache? Uh, the ideal cache will just take C most probable items and that's what it will keep. Uh, and, uh, of course, in practice, nobody designs caches this way. There are always uh, uh, LRU algorithms and all sorts of other things. You never know the probabilities ahead of time. But in ideal scenario, if we assume that the, this, this distribution is stationary, we know it, that would be the ideal model. And if we assume this ideal model, then we could, uh, of course, compute what would be cache hit and cache miss probability. It will be simply a uh, sum of uh, probabilities of uh, the C most probable items, uh, and that would be cache hit pro uh, probability, or one minus sum of those most probable probabilities, those most probable items, that will be cache miss probabilities. And, and uh, uh, it uh, boils down to, uh, in fact, uh, uh, generalized harmonic number. And uh, if we look at generalized harmonic number, look at the asymptotic expression, we, we actually can uh, obtain a very nice formula that is shown below. So we can, in fact, uh, for idealized, extremely idealized cache model with fixed capacity say what would be cache miss probability. So this is good. Well, now let's take a look at what's going to happen if we have not a single uh, version of a content, but two versions of this content. So it's the same sets, but now we have two of them. And uh, uh, within each set, the probability popularity distribution is the same, but we now say that there is an extra usage uh, distribution uh, between those two sets, which we call pi, pi sub 1, pi sub 2. And we say that, uh, of course, the full probabilities will be products of those two. And if we assume that uh, this is what we have as input, and uh, now we'll try to think what could happen with sorted array, sorting according to decrease of probabilities at the top of the stack in the cache, of those items, then what we discover or what we notice is that uh, those items will form certain pattern. It will start with the, of course, uh, uh, first uh, most probable item from a set that has higher usage probability. Then there will be several more items from same set until you have a point of uh, equilibrium where the top uh, probable content from the other set will match it. So you will insert that item and then you continue inserting items from first set. And if you look a little more at what is happening, we observe that there is going to be just an interleaved pattern where the items from second set becomes injected with a certain step size. Of course, plus minus some rounding effects along the way. Uh, and, uh, but importantly is that we know that this pattern will hold, there will be this interleave uh, step size, and if that is the case, then we, of course, can compute uh, probability of uh, cache hit or miss in this uh, mixed uh, cache uh, situation. I will skip mathematics, so I'll only show the final uh, asymptotic formula here on the top. And uh, as you could see, this uh, formula for cache miss probability look pretty similar to uh, the ones that we had before, 
except that it has a, a, a term in the front. So if we divide those two probabilities, and we will cash miss probabilities, and we'll ask a question, what will be the relative increase of cash miss probability for a situation when you have two sets or two formats of same content as opposed to one? That, that boils down asymptotically to this particular term. There is, of course, uh, like uh, vanishing uh, factors in both cases, but if C is large, we will assume that they will be small. And so this uh, particular term will stabilize as a, uh, something that we have as a ratio. So uh, this is good. Uh, now we know what happens with uh, two formats. And uh, we could look at the uh, shapes of this uh, particular uh, uh, term with different values of uh, probability uh, popularity parameter alpha and uh, the parameter of uh, usage between two sets. And if we look at the uh, case of many sets, it could also be generalized. Uh, it turns out that this uh, uh, term in ratio becomes a L L LP norm of sorts where one or alpha uh, serves as the uh, norm parameter. And uh, uh, what we could observe based on this uh, simple mathematics? Well, a few things. We can observe that, of course, if uh, the worst case situ uh, situation or the worst impact that we will have on cash performance in system with many formats is when uh, usage probabilities of all those formats will be the same. If you hit equilibrium, if you have two formats, HLS and Dash, and they're equally usable, then they will start compete with each other in the most fierce fashion, and that's where you're going to have the highest hit. Uh, now, what else we know? Uh, we notice that if a uh, probability of any, any of, if we have many formats, but there is a single format which is dominant, uh, probability of which uh, goes to one, then it doesn't matter what was the uh, probabilities of all others. Uh, as the impact is going to asymptotically uh, tend to one, so which means that uh, the efficiency will be about the same. So this brings a simple rule, which actually could be quite useful in practice. Uh, if you have multiple formats and you need to work with CDN or multiple renditions, and uh, you want to make sure your CDN is most uh, efficient, uh, pick some rendition or pick uh, uh, one representation that could be made dominant by enabling as many players to use that particular single representation and direct those players to use that uh, representation. If, if you have control over, over, over algorithms and those players, of course. But uh, that's what uh, will minimize the impact of multiple formats on the system. And uh, so this uh, is mathematics uh, and now uh, uh, experimental validation. So to validate this theory, what we did is we used uh, a practical system. Of course, uh, uh, Brightcall Video Cloud is, uh, is an OVP online video platform which serves thousands of customers. And what we did is we picked select thousand accounts which uh, Effectively, it's, uh, each account has a library of content uh, which is sent to users. And uh, from uh, their delivery uh, distribution for that account, we have uh, particular statistics. And then we tried to match out of this 1,000 account 30 pairs where we will have uh, one element in this pair where it's a HLS only distribution. And the other uh, variant of distribution is HLS and dash mix distribution with uh, some parameter of that mix between HLS and dash. And uh, how we matched it, we looked at the total volume of, uh, of data that is being streamed through both of this account. And also we looked at the distributions of popularities of content for, for both uh, accounts and these pairs. And we made sure that this uh, fitting parameter alpha is as close as possible between those uh, two accounts. So this is how we matched uh, the uh, use cases of HLS only versus mixed HLS versus dash. And, and then for uh, those players, we computed a few things. We looked at CDN logs and we extracted true cash miss uh, values and looked at the ra ratios between those cash miss values. And, and then we applied our model to predict uh, effectively what would be those ratios uh, by knowing what is the uh, 
content popularity parameter, uh, dis uh, distribution parameter alpha, and what is the split between the HLS and dash in both cases. And this is what we obtained. So the, uh, the uh, surface that is in uh, blue is the uh, showing what model predicts, and the red dots are those 30 points of experimentally me uh, measured data. And it shows that uh, what model tells us is uh, not too far from reality, I'll put it. It's, of course, not, not, not perfect, but it confirms the same general uh, observation as I was uh, bringing earlier, that if uh, one of the content uh, formats that's used in this case, it was HLS, is more uh, popular than the uh, hit on the cache miss is going to be lower. And likely, if uh, there is a difference between parameter alpha, there is also a trend towards uh, uh, decreasing heat if the uh, content is uh, getting uh, super skewed. So uh, that's uh, the main uh, results, in fact. And uh, so what we have shown is uh, there is a simple model. The paper has a full set of proofs, and it also has extensions for cases where uh, those items have different sizes and uh, a few other variants. Uh, and uh, we also shown that uh, it seems to look uh, pretty reasonable uh, relative to experimental data. Of course, if the objective is to get very close to experimental data, then you need to know more about CDNs then you need to uh, look at specifics of the CDN-based algorithms, see uh, which LRU algorithms they're using, how many of these LRU queues they're using, whether the allocation of files of different sizes between those LRUs is uniform or non-uniform. So there are many details of this kind. Uh, there are many more uh, fun mathematical uh, exercises that could be staged if uh, the objective is to get very close, but uh, this uh, very simple expression uh, seems to be uh, something nice. So on this, thank you very much. I can't hear any introduction, so I'm just gonna go, and, uh, and hopefully everything is okay. So I wish I was there. I'm in beautiful, New York City, and I'm in the World Trade Center sitting at the office of a startup, and I had the screen looking at the, at the Verrazano Bridge for all of you, but all it did was show white in the background, so we have some video issues to work out still, uh, much, much innovation to do. But I am excited to, uh, to help open up the most uh, fun part of the day, the discovery session, and to welcome 12 uh, great startups I love seeing all the innovation that continues on in the video space. So um, to kick us off, I thought maybe I'd talk some of, about uh, some of my favorite video topics. And uh, I thought, let me just talk a little bit about encoding, immersive video, sound, AI, networks cloud, IoT, and security. And I think it all ties in with the 12 companies that we have here today. So I think we've been a part of this amazing, um, you know, these amazing innovations that we've gone through in this video space. And those of you that know me, I started my career as a mathematician and I worked on algorithm development for uh, radar systems. I was working for the Department of Defense and I realized, uh, well, maybe video and television would be a fun place to work, uh, just a little bit different. And at the time, networks uh, were you know, for TV, they were one way, and uh, you know, we were seeing the potential to build these two-way systems. And at the time, we had to develop everything, just everything. We were looking at what modulation techniques do we use, uh, how can we even build the equipment, uh, uh, how do we encode uh, streams, how do we build an interactive guide for people to even pick something with, and, uh, and we, we were working to turn on what ended up being the very first on-demand video stream over cable in the world. And, um, and I remember working with MPEG-1 to try to figure out how do we transport and stream CBR video and what we did back then to where we are today with H.264 
and five and six. And, uh, and, and, and at the time, there was no such thing as a CDN, and we had centralized everything um, to building these optimized and, and, and complex distribution systems. And, uh, and what I became proud of, and, and, and so many of my colleagues, is the work that we did back then for one purpose ended up changing so many things. We ended up as a side effect. We, we, we put so much work into what became the DVD. We did metadata standardization. We built uh, the very first app stores and so much more. And so I feel that, uh, that this is our everyday, is continuing to innovate and build things that will have so many effects. And we've won many um, technology awards. For me personally, my, my, I'm, I'm, I, I just can't believe uh, when I got a Lifetime Achievement Emmy in 2020. Uh, and, and, and I think that the point is that the entertainment space is a great place to be. It's a great place to innovate. It has been and it continues to be. And we must innovate. It's our responsibility. We can't sit still. If we want to talk about the metaverse, we want to talk about what it is we're going to do, how we're going to live in endless innovation in video, we have much, much, much work to do. So let me just start with one of my favorite topics. Um, I love encoding and compression. I worked in it directly for many years. And I think it continues to get better and better. And um, you know, if I look at we, uh, our ability to have enabled this whole ultra high definition and we continue to enable a better viewing experience, all with less resources. And I, I'm pretty excited about the high efficiency video coding of H.264, the versatile video coding of, of, of H.266. And, uh, and I think given all of the math work I did, I just continue to be fascinated to think how much this discrete cosine transform just is such a part of our, of our video life. And I think not to disappoint, today's discovery day includes several focuses on encoding uh, as well as improved video quality. So that's great to see. And um, nice to see our innovation continue to focus on that. Another topic I'd like to bring up is this whole immersive video. And, uh, and I love this. I used to work on six degree of freedom uh, simulations. And I think the whole immersive experience should not be looked at as gaming, but it should be looked at uh, sometimes I look at it as remember what the World Wide Web was to the world and to all of society in the 90s. This is what this whole immersive experience can be. It's the way that we will will look, search, uh, uh, embrace, experience. And so, uh, so again, it's all about the work that we're doing in video. And, and it's not, again, just looking at, 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 at this gaming or what we talk about the metaverse being today. Think about this broad, much broader view of where it is that we can be in the creation of, uh, of, of, of content and experiences. So with that, we have some startups here again today working in 3D creation of, of 3D immersive video. We have content discovery. We have um, uh, video open infrastructure, augmented reality for video creators, which I think is very cool as well. So, uh, so lots of happening here today on, on that startup front. And, and, and I, I'll just say one thing that I think is really important for us to keep in mind as we think about immersive experience. Don't forget sound. We keep talking about video, better video, compression of video. Uh, um, but, but sound is so important, and it's just as important in an immersive experience. So, so, uh, so lots of innovation to happen there as well. So let me just touch real quick on clouds and networking. Um, I think that this has always been our enabler. It's been our bottleneck, and it continues to be a key focus for all of us. Um, you know, network optimization is, 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 is tricky and interesting because we, we say, it's everything's in the cloud, and, and and then we say no, everything's in the edge, and and uh, you know we we've played this game of, of 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 where things are at the moment, centralization, decentralization, and I have to tell you, it's both important because it it depends on what it is we're trying to accomplish. So especially with 5G right now and some of the new infrastructures that are coming out, I would say we have to really really continue to focus on how we use the cloud, how we use the networks, and. As a VC, I follow this whole intelligent edge really, really closely. 
And I look at um, I look at virtualization, virtualization of, for example, uh, um, uh, the, the the entire routing systems, uh, where we are with RAN virtualization, and um, and and and. If we're going to move everything to a generic infrastructure, we just don't have the compute in terms of power, in terms of sizing, in terms of data centers that are highly distributed. How are we going to make a highly uh, distributed uh, 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 a router uh, build an entire data center around it? So I think that this 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 concept of hardware acceleration, what we offload, how we intelligently offload. Um, continues to be a really, really important uh, uh, conversation. And, and I think of what we did early in the video days when we built CDN and we were looking at how it is to build distributed storage and uh, distributed playout. Uh, I think we're very much in that mode on a compute side, which is how do we build a distributed compute? How do we charge for distributed compute? Uh, how do we prioritize it? All of these things that I think the video industry has led. So very, very important uh, time. And, and just like uh, we were focused with CDNs on, uh, on, on, on buffering and, 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 and uh, high quality playout, everything now continues to be about these ultra low latency solutions and what it is that we can do in, in in the entire experience for compute and storage so keep it going in this area we have some great startups uh today focusing on congestion control for ott focused on cdn for mobile object storage uh ultra low latency so all the right words i think i think very much focused where we have to go another thing i'll mention is um, is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, it's everywhere, it's in everybody's product pitch today, but look, appropriately so. It's having a huge impact, it will continue to have a huge impact on most industries, including the entire video landscape. And I think first for optimization and, and, and automation, but I think also for, for actual coding algorithms and application adaptation and, and the creation of experiences. So we have to keep looking at how it is that AI can, 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 help, us, uh, can help us make entire experiences better. I think that um, uh, if we think of, of uh, I'll just take a networking example, where AI can help us with the entire uh, network auto optimization and route reflection and how it is that, that, that we can optimally op optimize the use of our network, that's where I'd like to, to, to see things go. So that's where we have to keep our mindset and we even have an AI native video startup here today. So, so I think that's exciting as well. And as much as we love to tout the fact that 80% of our internet traffic is video, uh, everything points to the fact that half of our global traffic is going to end up being machine to machine. We have to get ready for autonomous cars, smart cities, optimized supply chain, connected everything. And so it's nice to see one of our startups here today also to be focused on autonomous vehicles. And I think it's such a tie into all of the work that we've done on the video front. Um, I'll just mention security. I think it's 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 not fair to talk about any topic without mentioning cyber and all of the ever-changing world of what it is that we're doing on the security front. And to me, it's not on the video side just about credential and content theft, but all of the best practices in security and that we have to continue to innovate how it is that we address uh, and move away from this endpoint security and talk more about the workload security and how it is that we can stop DDoS attacks, ransomware, phishing, uh, uh, social engineering, and all of the things that we're seeing um, on, on, on multiple levels. So another area that we continue to have to lead and, and, uh, and be on the forefront. So um, I guess one thing I'll say is when I left when I left the operational world and I went into the VC area, it was really for the purpose of focusing on tomorrow's technology. I get to work with the legendary John Chambers every day, and what's important to us is market transitions and ensuring that you're really driving disruption at the right time and you're driving a market transition. I'm, I'm sure you all agree with that. And I think the secret is not to be too early. The secret is not to be not to miss leading the way in, in, in a transition. And we've certainly gotten this right. We've gotten it wrong. 
and um, and I remember that, that, that everybody was uh, very happy with the rental store market and I was out touting video on demand and people just patted me on the head and they said, oh, Yvette, you know, it's not going to be uh, that we're getting rid of the video market. And, and what's most important is internet on TV. That's all anybody cares about is internet on TV. So I'm just gonna say hindsight is 2020. And I think that maybe I was right. So thinking about today, where are we going? All of this immersive video, we have to hit the right time, the right market transition at the right, at, at, at the right moment. And I'll say a couple of things, one of which customer experience. Forbes says that 96% of customers are going to leave because of a bad service. It's the fact that the experience of a customer is more important than even the product itself. And What's more important in a customer experience than video and everything immersive that we do every day? So I think we can't lose sight of how important we are for so many products, how important we are for the customer experience itself. And I would say, please, please, please keep the customer experience at the front of your mind for whatever product you're working in and make sure it's easy, make sure it's fun, and make sure that our customers love it. So. One thing, one last point that I'll mention is um, our environment. We build a lot of things. They take a lot of compute. Uh, I think we have to keep focusing on uh, low power consumption, world friendly efficiency, and hopefully we continue to see a lot of innovation on that front. So, um, so in closing, I, I think what I'd like to just say, for every large company here, you need small companies. It is so hard to focus on the innovation when you're busy running a successful business. It's a beautiful gift and, uh, and you need innovation. Likewise, for the startups, focus on the right timing, a great business model, and how it is that you really add an end result at the right time. And I think that uh, big companies needing small companies, small companies need big companies is a magical thing. Hopefully we see all of that in the discovery session today. So I love what all of you are doing. I wish you, um, each of the startups, super success. I wish all of you a great Mile High video conference and discovery afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Yvette. Uh, I, I really just want to bring to the attention to the, of the startup companies the amazing uh, combination of talent that Yvette uh, brings to the table. Uh, as a CTO and a technical leader, she went both sides, uh, from cable vision, an operator, to sea change, uh, a vendor developing uh, video servers, and then she moved all the way to senior vice president, uh, head of the uh, service provider division, business unit at Cisco. And now uh, she's uh, the CTO and partner at YC2 uh, Ventures. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, um, venture capital perspective, operator perspective, vendor perspective, and networking perspective, all in one expert. So this is the context, and uh, good luck to all the Discovery startup companies. Thank you. Well, while it's loading, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Jill Boyce. I'm the, the CEO of Immerse. I'm very honored, excited to be here kicking off the, the first ever um, startup session here at Mile High Video. Um, so. Thanks for that. All right, so Vermeers, it's a, a new startup, and um, our mission is to um, uh, have a platform and SDKs to create, stream, and play 3D immersive video. So we're basically making it easy for companies to add immersive video to their branded products. First off, so what is 3D immersive video? Um, the pictures on the left uh, show an illustration of. of you know, three degree of freedom and six degree of freedom with a VR headset. And the 3D immersive video provides six degree of freedom. And this means that viewers have the ability to control how they view content. And this increases their engagement and their understanding. Viewers can pan around or step into a dynamic 3D scene that contains real people and real world scenes. So how does it uh, compare to other related technologies? Well, okay, so VR is very related, but VR typically is computer-generated content rather than containing real people and real-world scenes. 
360 video often is actually can contain real world content and you know is, is camera captured, but it is limited to three degree of freedom rather than six degrees. And three degrees of freedom is just not how we experience the real world where we're able to move around with six degrees. And so it causes, you know, discomfort even to some viewers because of this mismatch with, with reality. And then augmented reality or AR is another related technology. But with AR, what you're doing is you're seeing your local scene and augmenting it with um, objects. But it's lo your local scene at the current time. And so what the 3D immersive video can do, it can be a remote scene you're, you're experiencing, or it could be uh, you know, a scene that you've captured at an earlier time and are playing back later. So I'm gonna show uh, a demonstration here, if I can figure out how to make this work. Um, so we have a, a, a Vermerse has built a player, a 3D immersive video player. And this is showing here a pre-capture thing where um, that's my finger um, captured uh, on the camera, swiping around. And so we can move around within the scene and pay particular attention to the foreground object, which is a stack of books and a paint tube on a table. And that's where it's easiest to see the motion parallax and the effect that as I move, the relative positions of objects changes. And that's what six degree of freedom um, gives you. And after the session, I have with me um, several um, Android phones, um, and I've got some content on them. And so anybody who would like to play around with this demo themselves, uh, find me after the demo, and I would love to show it to you so that you can experience it for yourself with some different content. So Vermersa's technology is built on top of the MPEG Immersive Video, or MIV, standard. I was the lead editor of the standard specification when it was developed in MPEG, and my co-founder, Basil Salhea, was the lead editor of the test model document, which describes the software. The standard's been finalized, and it's just in the steps of finalization to, to final publication. To use the MIV standard, uh, the input can come from any kind of camera but it needs to include um, texture and depth. So it can be any, any kind of camera, one camera or multiple cameras, better if you have multiple cameras. Uh, the more cameras that you have, the broader range of volume represented in your 3D video can be. But even a single um, capture device with a depth sensor can also give you some limited range of that 3D immersive effect. And the demo content I'll show will show some of both of these. But the camera's uh, configurations that you use with MIV can be any type of configuration. You can have inward facing cameras or outward facing cameras or linear rig uh, cameras, linear array. Uh, the, the, the standard is, is able to handle any of the different types of, of capture. So now I'm going to describe the components of the MIV um, system. And, uh, our system can allow you to create and play, uh, create, stream, and play 3D immersive video. So capture is done by the user. And um, as I said before, you can use any kind of device. We will soon, Vermerse will soon have a capture app available for phones, but other devices can be used as well. But after the user does the capture, uh, the Vermerse platform can do the rest. So uh, you could upload the content, um, and, and, uh, and prepare the content, stream it, and play it back. Um, I'm gonna talk about each of these components in some more detail. All right, so capture can be done with a single camera or with multiple cameras. So volumetric video is uh, typically done uh, with green screens and cameras on the outside looking in that capture a single object. But um, for our solution, you, you don't need a green screen, and you're not limited to capturing the objects in the center of the rig. You can capture multiple objects, you can capture the background. So you're capturing the entire scene rather than just an individual object. While any capture uh, or camera solution can be used, we have specific support 
for iPhone capture using the recent models that have uh, LiDAR functionality built into them, and also support for the Microsoft Azure Connect DK depth sensors, which are uh, you know, $400 uh, capture the items that uh, have 4K cameras and depth sensors built in. And they can be done with one or more of these. Uh, in particular, with the Azure Connects, you can, you can connect them together and capture simultaneously in a synchronized manner with multiple cameras. The platform also is not limited to camera capture. Um, you can use a 3D graphics engine to generate content in this format because you can render uh, texture plus depth from a 3D graphics scene. And when MPEG was doing the standardization of MIV, several of the test sequences used were um, originally from 3D graphics engines. So the content preparation is at the heart of the MERS's platform. We offer APIs uh, for businesses and developers to integrate the platform within their solution. So we use uh, RESTful APIs uh, to be able for users to be, upload captures and submit for processing. So our platform creates two different types of videos. There's what we call 3D video and bullet video. With 3D video, the viewer is in control and selects the navigation path themselves with a six degree of freedom experience. But with the bullet videos, the content creator is in control of what the viewer sees. Uh, we, we've named it bullet videos after the bullet effect in uh, Matrix movies where you, know, you would move around and see the scene from uh, different directions. In the bullet videos, the content creator controls the navigation path within the Six Degree of Freedom. So the, the creator has the Six Degree of Freedom, not the viewer. And so the viewer experiences it the way that the creator had intended. And it's selected in advance for the viewers. Whereas if the viewer's in control, every viewer will pick a slightly different, will somewhat different path. But with the bullet video, when it's predetermined, a single path, you know, is, is created that every viewer will get. Although with the same input scene, you could generate more than one different bullet video path. The next component is, is streaming. So prepared content can be streamed from the Vimmer's platform using legacy video streaming servers with a standard protocols. And downloading of videos is also supported. I want to talk again about the uh, bullet videos and uh, you know, why are we doing them? Because uh, it doesn't give you that six degree of freedom. Uh, the main reason is because they are ordinary 2D videos that can be played anywhere that you can play video today. Doesn't require any special playback. And so it allows a broader, uh, broader usage. And also, there are some use cases where the creator actually wants to control that experience uh, of what their viewer is going to see. But the 3D video, when we're streaming the 3D video, so in like the bullet video, it's just existing video, no, once it's created, you know, nobody needs to do anything about it. The 3D video does indeed require some change on, by the player side, but it's been done in a way that the server doesn't need to do anything special. So a single, with our approach, a single video is formed that represents the content from all of the views that are available as inputs. They're combined together and represented, and then they can be coded as ordinary video, and then additional data describing the 3D scene, such as information about the cameras and their positions, is incorporated within the video bitstream as a supplemental enhancement information or SEI message. So a server uh, doesn't know what it is, but it just ignores it and, and passes it through. And the video codec that can be used can be any type of video codec um, because it's ordinary video that is, being, uh, that is being sent. So this allows legacy video streaming servers and protocols to be used which makes it easier to roll out the technology with existing infrastructure. In addition to APIs to access the platform, our website provides an alternative method uh, to access the platform using our website, so which is you know, so a no-code approach. 
And so individual creators can upload their captures to the website and potential API or SDK customers can test the system. Uh, go to Remerse.net and, and try it for yourself. Um, you can view the featured content or you can upload your own content for processing that you can then share with others. The player, the Remerse Player SDK, um, can be integrated within your app or our sample player can be used. The Player SDK was developed to be multi-platform and it integrates with the native video players on the device. So it allows utilization of the video decoders that exist on the device. There are, there are two key components um, that are added to the video player. A user interface allows the viewer to control navigation with six degrees of freedom and it's, it's flexible, you know, uh, whether you're going to use swiping or, or, or pinching or rotating. Um, it just allows the user to select their position. And then once the viewer has determined it, then a view is rendered at the position that corresponds to that that the viewer selected through the user interface. And I said before, it's, you know, integrated with existing players. So for Android, it's integrated with ExoPlayer, for iPhone with AV Player on the PC uh, using FFmpeg. And you know, VR, AR headset support is planned. So here's an example video that was captured with a single iPhone. And so it's, it's a bullet video because I, so I can show it here without needing a special player. And you can see how that the, some amount of 3D motion uh, can be achieved. This is just uh, me at home with my dog. Uh, but a bullet video has this predetermined navigation path. And if you'd like to see this on one of the, uh, on a mobile phone where you control the video, you control the experience, see me afterwards. So um, here's another uh, video that was captured with the Azure Connect depth sensor. Let's get this going. There we go. All right. So um, single, single Azure Connect depth sensor that uh, has the video capture and the depth. Uh, it's me playing the guitar. I don't actually know how to play guitar, but um, it, was a, uh, it was a good prop, I thought, to use, uh, since we think music use cases are interesting. So don't look too closely at how I'm trying to play. Um, the, soon we'll, we'll have support for multiple Azure Connect capture, which allows you to um, have multiple capture, and so you have a broader range of within the scene that you can capture, and it does a better job at uh, reducing the amount of artifacts related to occluded areas because if one camera can't see it, another camera would be able to see it. And then here's another sequence that was captured with, uh, with multiple cameras and is, um, it has a broader range of motion ability to be supported. And you can really see the motion parallax and the, how the occlusions change with this video. So this was one of the, this was a sequence that was made available to the, the MPEG group. But there, there are many possible use cases. You know, uh, you can experience entertainment performances like you were really there, relive important events, you know, bring real people and real world scenes into the metaverse. Uh, training and education with increased uh, comprehension and branding and marketing with greater engagement with the audiences. So some final thoughts. Uh, because Immerse offers APIs and SDKs, um, businesses can offer 3D immersive video in their own branded applications. And our solution democratizes access to creation and sharing of 3D video. Volumetric video capture studios exist, but they're very expensive and inaccessible. So if we make video capture, uh, 3D immersive video capture easier, then we're gonna get more content. So we're looking now for companies to pilot our APIs and SDKs. So please contact me if you're interested in trying it out, or even if you just have suggestions that you can point me to other companies that you think might be interesting, interested in it or particular use cases that you think would be exciting. Uh, thank you. I don't know if we have time for a few questions.
okay, so, so this exact video that's being shown, you know, I chose that path <laughs> uh, based on, because we're doing this, this is bullet video that's here that I'm playing on this PC and I, I can't, and I don't have my special player integrated. So the content creator, when they capture in the first place, will choose angles that, that you know, capture the objects that they want to have represented. And then our platform can create it both this bullet video that in this case I predetermined for you what you, you were going to see, but also actually if you see me later, I'll show you on a phone so you can control it yourself. And you can move it around, you can swipe, you can pinch in. And I have this exact sequence on my phone sitting in my pocket right now. So come see me afterwards and you can try it for yourself. I don't know if we're doing time-wise, do we take any more questions or do we need to finish? Okay, all right, well, excellent questions. Thank you. So hi, I can start. I'm, I'm Mike Luby, I talked this morning. I'm CEO and co-founder of BitRipple. Uh, we are uh, delivering the metaverse, enabling real-time experiences on any connected device over any network. Um, so just a little bit about the company. We focus on ultra low latency data delivery, enable immersive experiences like those that were just talked about, 4K, 8K video conferencing, real-time volumetric video, focusing on cloud gaming and immersive collaboration. We have some interesting intellectual property, some of which I talked about this morning. I'll talk a little more about it this afternoon. Uh, liquid data, liquid cloud delivery. It's a software user space solution, so you don't need special hardware or anything. It runs as, you can run it as a service or integrate it into apps. Uh, and we're looking at a SaaS business model. So the team where uh, I'm uh, from Qualcomm, the reason I'm from Qualcomm is because my previous company, Digital Fountain, was sold off to Qualcomm many years ago, so I spent a few years at Qualcomm as a VP of technology. And there's two other folks that I took with me from there. And then there's another person we met through, actually through the Dash Industry Forum, um, the, who is uh, one of the co-founders of Biodram, who works with us. Um, we have a uh, mobile data delivery and video streaming expertise, um, and a lot of fundamental technology invention and deployment. So I talked about this challenge this morning. I think most of you were here, so I'm gonna kind of go over this again, but essentially this is the kind of experiences we're trying to deliver, these delivering high data rates with really low latencies over some challenging networks. And as you can hear from other speakers, there's more movement towards delivering things from the edge or from the cloud to the end devices. And so that causes some real interesting uh, data delivery challenges with ultra low latency. Uh, and I think I went over this slide as well about the, uh, the gaming experiences, what, what are some of the requirements and so on in terms of the end-to-end the -end latencies that are required. So I'm not going to really spend more time on this just to say that uh, just to repeat, hardcore gamers are frustrated if the latency is beyond something like 50 milliseconds and even casual non-gamers are not very happy if it goes beyond 110 and at some point it becomes unplayable. So this is really the, the architecture that we have in mind where we have our technology embedded into cloud servers or on the edge uh, and in the client devices. And so we're handling the data delivery from where the content is being generated out to the devices and in the reverse direction as well from the devices back to the cloud servers. So uh, these light blue paths are the part that we're kind of handling there. Uh, I talked a little bit about this this morning. I'll talk a little bit more about it now. So our foundation technology is based on this uh, Raptor Q, which is something that is standardized in the IETF. It's an RFC 6330 where the inventors and implementers and everything else of, of this particular uh, code. Uh, it has these amazing properties that uh, uh, at least our implementation has uh, ability to encode and decode at multiple gigabits per second using a single core of a standard CPU. Uh, so the, the impact on CPU is really very light compared to the streaming rates that we're talking about. And essentially, as I talked about this morning, it's kind of like this, uh, it changes the data from be having to deliver reliably every packet of an object into creating some more packets 
and then the combination of the packets that you send, you can think of as liquid data in the sense that uh, you don't have to receive a particular set of them. You just want to receive enough. It's kind of like uh, the analogy I like to think about, and it's, it's, it's old at this point, but it's still relevant, is you, you're thirsty, you have a, an empty cup, you want to fill it with liquid, with drops of, of, of water. You don't care which drops of water get into your cup. You just want to make sure it's enough to fill it up, and then you can quench your thirst. Same thing here at the receiver side. You just care that enough packets get there. You don't care which ones get there as long as enough get there, where enough is the size of the original object. So this is applicable to any size box, where the box sizes can range from one packet long to tens of thousands of packets of long. You can generate any amount of uh, this liquid data. Uh, obviously, you only want to generate as much as you really need, but you have the potential to, do, to generate on the fly as much as you want. And it's almost instantaneous encoding and decoding. It's even for all the block sizes, it can still run at gigabits per second. It's content agnostic. The, it can be compressed video, audio, other kinds of data, uh, encrypted, whatever. And it can run across any kind of network. And we do have some customers who are using it across some really pretty interesting networks at this point, uh, not your standard IP networks in every case. So here's a little more information about the underlying uh, technology. So, um, so obviously, it needs to have a, a flow control in there, so you don't want to create congestion in the, in the, in the network. So you need to be able to uh, adjust the amount of bandwidth you're going to send out without causing congestion. Uh, one of the interesting properties, which you can do with other solutions, just turns out it's a lot easier with this solution, is to do a multipath delivery. So the essential idea is you're going to same the same uh, 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 data for an object that you're trying to deliver over multiple paths at, at, at the same time. You're sending liquid data over these multiple paths. We actually have a customer doing this very effectively. So they have an uh, application where they have a mobile reporter in the field with a backpack full of uh, a handheld camera, backpack full of 4G, 5G equipment. And in the, in the backpack, it does this liquid, uses RAPTQ to generate the liquid data, sends it over multiple carriers, over AT&T, Sprint, or Verizon, um, back to the broadcast station. And you don't care about disruptions on particular paths. Some, some get lost disrupted temporarily, whatever happens, all you care is that enough data gets back to the broadcast station and it can reliably be recovered. So they've been using this for a while at this point in deployment and they use it for every, all their services. And, and, and some, they've used it in some pretty interesting scenarios like supporting you know, what was happening on January 6th or the uh, NBA draft or the Emmys, all these other kind of events that they've supported in the past. And, 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 and in tough environments, and they've used it over in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and places like this. Uh, the, the thing, there was a question this morning, and that's what this bottom sort of set of panels addresses, is how much liquid data do you send? And so we've developed algorithms and protocols to, uh, with a little bit of feedback to take care of this. We never retransmit data. We, whenever more data is sent, it's just new liquid data because there's always more to send. So in this particular example, we're delivering 100 blocks of data, and that's what the time axis reflects. So the time axis is in units of when those blocks of data are available for transmission. And in the left panel, you see at the beginning we had zero packet loss. We had a spike of packet loss that went up and came down and then went back up again. And in the middle graph, it shows how much bandwidth was used out of the sender, how much was transmitted, how much, what's the transmission rate out of the sender to reliably deliver this data. And we're comparing our solution against the optimal retransmission-based solution. And you can see um, that we use a little more bandwidth. It's like in this example, something like 5% more. But it's very um, intelligent in the sense that it kind of stays exactly with what the retransmission-based solution would use in terms of the transmission bandwidth. And the retransmission solution, by the way, it has to send this much bandwidth because when you lose a packet, you have to send it again, right? So you can't, you can't. So that's kind of the minimal bandwidth possible. That's kind of the, the best you could possibly do. But the key is the right graph. The right graph is the delivery latency. And so our algorithms are designed so that we always try to maintain that minimal possible delivery latency. 
And so you can see in the beginning when there's no packet loss, nothing's going on. There's no differ difference in the delivery latency, but as soon as there's even a touch of packet loss, the retransmission solution is all over the map in terms of the delivery latency. Whereas by using our intelligent algorithm, we're in able to keep it pinned at the minimum. And that's what this blue goes across showing. And so that's kind of crucial for these immersive gaming or uh, game, online gaming or other immersive experiences. This is the kind of thing you really want to be able to do. And by the way, this is a lower bound on the best you can do with retransmission. So this is the optimal retransmission-based solution. This is assuming that as soon as you know, as soon as a packet is lost, the receiver knows about it, sends a request for your retransmission, it's sent immediately. So actual retransmission solutions are going to do worse than what this graph shows. We had a, a really neat demo. Um, how am I doing on time? Is anybody keeping track of time? Oh, no, it says zero. It always says zero when I'm up here. I'm always out. Um, so I guess I don't know. Well, I'll show this demo at the end if I have time. But it, what, it, what it shows is how with, we, we, had, we had a server in Amazon Web Services delivering uh, across the country to one of my colleagues' homes over his Wi-Fi onto his laptop. And we had a local copy playing back. Uh, the bit ripple solution, and then HLS. And ours stays in complete lockstep with the local playback, whereas HLS is behind in the beginning and keeps getting further and further behind. Um, so based on that, we had a reach out from Qualcomm. Um, they reached out to us they, uh, not that long before the actual event, uh, which, which means we had to work pretty hard to support this. But we built them an Android APK and integrated into their latest uh, Snapdragon uh, chipset that they were announcing at their Snapdragon Tech Summit. And so as part of their uh, keynote speech of uh, Cristiano Mon, the first speech of the, of the conference, the first demo, we, we, uh, we were uh, highlighted. Uh, so the demo was that the uh, CTO of Verizon, Kyle Malati, was in New Jersey speaking into this little uh, Snapdragon phone. It was capturing that. We were taking that and delivering across the 5G, across the internet, across the country, ac across the ocean to Hawaii, down through the 5G to the big island where the conference was in, the, in a hotel in, in the big island in Hawaii, and the, into the Snapdragon phone there, and then on an HDMI cable projected onto the uh, big screen for the local audience there. So that, that was a pretty fun but intense. And I have some uh, war stories to tell about that. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so based on that, we've uh, well, not just on that. We've had a lot of market traction. Uh, so uh, talking to a lot of interesting companies. Uh, one, one thing that Meta executive said that I thought was great, uh, quote, is latency is the scourge of the modern era. Uh, so obviously, minimizing uh, delivery latency is a very high business priority. There's a lot of intense interest in solutions that mitigate delivery latency. And so for us, it's an excellent timing, and there's a lot of strong interest in our solutions. Uh, our status as a company, we had a liquid cloud delivery 1.0 software product um, that's deployed in streaming video services, satellite, and defense communications. We're in the middle of developing our liquid cloud delivery version 2.0 software product that has some additional uh, features that are required for online gaming and metaverse and so on. I'm working in conjunction with some partners in doing that. We have some pretty interesting engagements with a few uh, relevant companies there and involved in multiple proof of concepts and deployments in the works. So that's it. Thank you. Have time for any questions? Anybody have any questions? Sure. Sorry, say it again. Ah, OK. So that's a great question. So what happens if you just try to play it when you have packet loss? The, the experience is just horrific. Um, I mean, really bad. Like, so, we, so if you take like uh, H.264 and code it at like 2 megabits per second, 
it, it, it looks, you can start seeing it at 0.1% 0, 0 packet loss. It still starts looking crappy, but you kind of have to pay attention. If you watched it for a long time, it wouldn't be watchable. But if you put in 1% packet loss, it just immediately looks horrible. If you do like we did in our streaming demo, we did like a 70 megabit per second HDR stream. Uh, if you put in 0.1% packet loss, immediately it's horrible. And, and why? Well, what is video compression all about? Compressing those bits as much as possible. So if you lose any bits on delivery, guess what happens when you try to play it out? It looks like crap, right? So that, the more it's compressed, the higher the, uh, you know, the quality that you're trying to deliver, deliver and, the, and the more it's compressed, the worse the impact that packet loss is on, on the user experience if you don't correct for it. Ah. Right. Can you go to the microphone? I can hear you better. <laughs> there's some weird acoustic. There's a lot of fans blowing up there and stuff. Sorry. Hopefully you can hear me now. Very uh, good. I'm slightly confused on the solution and what okay. problem is trying to solve. Okay. Um, you're saying you don't need to resend lost packets, but that will lead to a degraded service. Ah, so what I'm saying instead is we, 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 so normal protocols, you see when a packet is lost, you ask specifically for that packet to be resent. So you send the signal specifically for that packet saying, send that one, and then you resend it. We're not doing that. Instead, because we have this Raptor Q, this liquid data thing, well, if we get any signal, what our signals back don't say which packets are lost, just says how many have we received and how many have we lost and so on. That's the kind of stats we send back. Okay, got it. And, and then it just, it can send, has generated or can very quickly generate additional packets to send to make up for the ones that are lost. But it's not taking track of exactly, it's not retransmitting. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Amit Cohen. I'm the co founder and CEO of Compira Labs. At Compira Labs, we are uh, transforming content delivery. In other words, we are improving uh, content delivery over the last mile. Uh, I would like to start with illustrating what we do uh, using a one-minute video. Uh, we have recorded two live streaming sessions running over a very bumpy network. Uh, try to, uh, to see the quality differences between the, the sessions. Voice. I don't know. This is espresso, no? Mocha? You mean black coffee? Yeah. Cappuccino? Trying. Okay. I'd like to taste a real Italian coffee, please. Real Italian coffee? Did you say real Italian coffee? Real Italian coffee? What? What? Bas? What? What is the real Italian coffee? I don't know. This is espresso, no? Mocha? You mean black coffee? Cappuccino? Café con leche. Americano. Espresso americano. Oh, nice. It's called Fredo. Holy shit. She wants a real Italian coffee. She wants real Italian coffee. You mean flat white? Did someone say instant? That's a game changer. Real Italian coffee. That's amazing. So what is the real Italian coffee? Ah, the real Italian coffee. Lavazza. Why didn't she just say so? Exactly.
I think we could all uh, use Italian coffee now, but let's continue. Um, so here is a, an interesting study showing that in the US, subscriber for, subscribers of major streaming services get HD quality less than 40% of the time. And this is regardless of their internet connectivity, internet connection speed at home. So even if you have more than 100 megabit over fiber, you are still likely to get HD less than 40% of the time. And we've seen these numbers also uh, for other services. And this is pretty amazing fact because, you know, one HD stream is, is what, seven, eight megabit? How come I can't get one stable eight megabit if I have 200 megabit to my home? And whether you believe this uh, study or not, there is a, a problem here. And we argue that the root cause for this problem is that we are streaming 21st century services using a century old paradigm which is the one size fits all paradigm. At the early days of the internet, the one size fits all was uh, a really good um, rule, very robust, but for our services that are very sensitive now and require low latency and real time delivery, this is not good enough. And what we are doing at Compira is that we are harnessing the power of machine learning to boost over the top service delivery and to bring service delivery up to speed with 21st century needs. And how it works, the solution has two software components, one real-time component and the second a non-real-time. The real-time component is installed on the edge of the CDN and it's optimizing quality of experience in real time on each and every user connection. Now, it uses uh, an algorithmic framework that is called PCC. If you'd like to understand what PCC is, join me for uh, the session after lunch tomorrow. But at a high level, PCC uses tools of uh, a game theory of decision making un un under uncertainty. And it is installed on the edge node and replaces the current congestion control logic on the edge node. If it's TCP or UDP or Quick or uh, WebRTC, it plugs in and replaces what is uh, used there for congestion control. Uh, besides uh, adapting the sending rate to be optimal for each and every user connection, the computer edge collects lots of network statistics and pushes them back to the next component that sits in the cloud and is called Compira Cloud. It collects network performance data from all the edge modules and uses this data for two purposes. First, to build a performance map of the network, which we deliver as a, a SAS based uh, dashboard. And the second, it uses all this data to customize the uh, Compira Edge components to the actual network conditions they experience and to the actual services they deliver. So for example, if a node is delivering more uh, real-time services, live sports, then latency is of importance. If a node is delivering more VOD, then latency is not important at, at all. And of course, if one node is connecting a lot of mobile users and another node is connected to fiber to, to the home users, then those two nodes, as the times go by and we collect more data, will start to behave differently with respect to the algorithm that is optimizing the delivery. And what you can do with it for VOD, uh, you can increase the number of HD sessions. You can launch an ultra HD service for live streaming. You can uh, deliver low latency service while maintaining high quality and low rebuffering ratio. 
and you can maintain, maintain a best of class, uh, best in class service on any delivery, be it uh, on net or off net, or on mobile, uh, fiber or DSL. Uh, here I've captured uh, results from recent deployments uh, we had with live streaming networks. What you see here on the left hand side is that we were able to significantly reduce rebuffering ratio, more than 30% on wire networks and more than 14, 50% on mobile networks. And in parallel, we were able to increase the number of HD sessions in more than 30% and also reduce the amount of poor quality sessions in more than 30%. And for service providers, those subscribers who get the most uh, poor quality are those that are likely to churn and to call support and to be unhappy. What does it take to deploy Compira? So for HTTP 1 or 2 over TCP streaming, it takes five minutes. It's an in-service upgrade of the edge nodes. There's no downtime. There's no need to change the applications or the network. There's no change to the client devices or the players. And of course, it doesn't require any other IT investment. And to summarize, uh, we are changing the way services are delivered over the internet by implementing different uh, elements of machine learning, both in real time and not non real time. The solution itself is software only. It's a very seamless upgrade, so we can upgrade any existing CDN solution to support our, our uh, implementation and deliver much better quality. And with that, I'm happy to uh, get any questions. Thanks. First of all, let me say that it's uh, an honor to share the stage with Michael Luby. Uh, I, your work was an inspiration for my PhD thesis. Uh, and to add on top of that, so I'm a little bit stressed out because what we do at Codobal is kind of a, a mix between uh, what we just saw from computer labs and we, what we saw from, uh, from Michael. But, so what we do at Codobel is basically what we make sure that every user, no matter his network conditions, up to some extent, will get a perfect user experience for mobile applications. Oh, sorry. Uh, there we go. So even all, after all of the after efforts that we do today as an industry to provide a perfect user experience to everyone on a mobile phone, we still have a lot of problems. So recent data shows that uh, more than half of the video streaming sessions today still have at least one buffering event. Uh, and the worst part of it is, is that it's highly unstable. So basically, uh, data shows that at least once every user will get 11 seconds just to start playing out a video. And looking at that map that you have over, over there, which is from Uber, so it's not video, but it's a sign of latency. And as, as you can see, like, yes, it is worse uh, in, in regions like South America or India, but you're still facing many, many issues uh, in Europe and in the US as well. So the core reason why we still have a lot of issues is that we do tons of things in the cloud. We compress. Uh, we try to optimize our transport protocols, our application layer protocols. But then 90% of the link instability, so 90% of the things that basically destroy user experience, actually happens between the phone and the antenna. And so today we are not doing anything about that. And the, one of the ways that I see this more often is when you actually look at the tail uh, of user experience. So this is data from one of um, our deployments uh, in India, uh, comparing standard solution with our solution, which I'll, I will tell you a little bit uh, later on. But this is for um, HLS stream um, using standard HTTP2 connections. And as you can see, like the average result and median results are not very bad. But when you look at the tail, like 
We are talking about more than eight seconds to actually start uh, a video. We are talking about more than 34 seconds of rebuffering during a five minute uh, video streaming uh, play out. And one may think that the tail is, well, rare, but actually the tail is way much more common uh, than one would think. So for example, data from Snapchat shows that more than half of the users get a percentile 99 experience at least once a week. And that bad experience, as we just heard, is sufficient for the user to get a very bad impression of your service, to call support, to do many things, and basically to get pissed off. So in particular for mobile applications, the, the, the reason why this is happening is due to the fact that we are communicating, communicating over wireless link. And wireless links are very, very different than uh, wireless links. So for example, packet loss is way much higher even when we are talking about latest edge uh, wireless technology when compared to um, fiber, for example. And it's not only higher, but actually uh, it's highly unstable. So diff same carrier, different time of day, same cell, you can get um, completely different experiences. Same carrier, uh, different days of the week, you get completely different experience. You move further away from the, your 4G antenna and you get a completely different user experience for your mobile video streaming service. Uh, and as uh, Professor Michael uh, mentioned before, so I will try to move this a little bit faster on this part. Basically every, everything that we are doing today is based on HTTP2 uh, or 3 quick uh, that is basically overcoming packet loss using retransmissions, which is okay except when you have latency and when you have highly unpredictable latency, so very high jitter and packet loss. So basically this means that you need to wait for retransmissions to recover from a packet loss. What happens in, um, for the end user, either he gets a buffering event or the quality just drops. Um, so what I'm trying to convey here, and I, I will tell you in a minute how we do it, is that when you look at content delivery, in particular for mobile applications, you have to go beyond the edge. So we actually have to optimize content delivery end to end. So from the cloud to the actual um, end user phone. And this is what we are building at Cordoba. Um, very high level, so we are, as, as the name says, like we are focused on uh, mobile applications. And what we provide is really resilience to latency and packet loss and any kind of link instability for any mobile application. And we do that with an innovative protocol based on network coding, um, uh, sim very similar to Erasure codes that we heard before. It's super easy to set up. You ju just need to drop, drop an SDK into the application, three lines of code, and it's, it's working. It still works with your existing endpoints. And uh, on top of that, it's totally risk-free in the sense that if something goes wrong, for example, our servers are not available, um, UDP is blocked on that network, the SDK is smart enough to detect that and fall back to your previous endpoints. So what's the end result? So less buffering. Um, in a nutshell, on average, we are seeing uh, less 50% of buffering uh, for the average experience. But actually, when you look at the tail we are talking about for the 10% worse sessions, which no, don't necessarily mean the 10% uh, users with the worst connection, right? So for the 10% worse sessions, we are doubling the speed of, or doubling the, the quality of experience for that user. So that also means faster startup time, on average 30% uh, faster. And although we don't touch the AGLS or the Dash uh, protocol or the video codec, as a side consequence of what we do, it also translates into increasing the average quality, uh, average quality that the, the user gets because the, the, the player, for example on Android, the, the Exo player, will detect higher bandwidth available and will request higher quality more often. So how do we do that? Network coding. It's, as I mentioned, I, I will try to skip the details, uh, but basically it's an one form of uh, erasure codes apply specifically for uh, communicating over wireless links. It evolves basically, instead of transmitting a packet, 
waiting for the receiver to be acknowledge the reception and then send the, the next one. You just basically keep sending data to the receiver. How you combine the original data packets by using the li linear algebra. You provide a set of coded packets to the receiver, and then on the receiver side, he's able to recover all the, the original information. Right? So boring stuff, but why is it useful? So if you take this example, you can see that I'm sending coded packets to a receiver. The receiver has lost one packet, but as soon as um, the, the sufficient with the four, sorry, as soon as four successful transmissions reach this receiver, is able to recover all the four original uh, packets. So packet one, two, three, and four. And the beauty of uh, what we are building at Codevel and network coding in general is the fact that we can't, for generally speaking, for delivering N packets, we just need N successful transmissions, so e efficient from the point of view of bandwidth utilization. But the most important part is irrespective of what those transmissions are. So it basically means I don't care which packets get the receiver. As long as I get N, you will be able to recover uh, all the N original packets, which in turn means I do not need to wait for feedback to recover from losses, right? And so this is basically what we do at Codeva. So part number one, we use network coding to recover from packet loss. Part number two, by looking at the way that the coding and decoding matri matrices evolve, uh, our congestion control algorithm is able to disting distinguish packet losses that are due to congestion, in which case we behave just like TCP or QUIC. We slow down the speed so that everyone can get uh, access to the channel. E so we can distinguish those losses from the losses that are due to wireless phenomena like interference, moving around, you just turn your back to the antenna, something like that. In which case, we do not need to decrease the speed. And why? Because we are already use encoding to overcome the packet losses. So as a result, I already mentioned that less buffering, in particular, if, if you look at the tail, the impact is quite significant. But uh, yeah, video quality, if you look at what happens as a side consequence of what we do, for the average user in terms of video quality, the impact is quite, quite significant. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? No, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Lyubomir Burdev from Wave One. Thank you for attending my session. So as Yvette mentioned at the beginning of the session, neural networks have completely taken over our society over the last decade. Everything is done better with neural networks, everything from transportation, finance, healthcare, and so on. In my talk, I am going to focus on the exciting opportunities of reinventing video compression from scratch using neural networks. This is something we refer to as AI native video. First, let me give you a high level uh, of how neural networks are used in compression. There is a special neural network called an autoencoder. It takes as an input frames of the source video. It passes them through an information bottleneck and then it reconstructs frames. And so during training, the objective is to tune the system so that the input is as close as possible to the output. Um, and that's basically how training is done. So unlike traditional methods where you, you, do, you have a dozens of high-level parameters that manually tune, 
Here, neural networks are automatically tuning uh, tens of millions of parameters in order to directly optimize the objective. So after training, the network is now split into two, the encoder and the decoder. And so the, uh, what's interesting is the language of communication between the encoder and decoder is no longer hard-coded, uh, uh, such as H.264. Instead, it is derived with machine learning to be the optimal one. Um, so first, uh, I would like to give you some intuition um, why neural networks are really good for compression. Well, in general, the issue is that the natural world is just very, very complex. And it's hard to put this complexity into an algorithm. And so uh, traditional codecs capture only high-level intuition, such as nearby pixels are similar to each other, changes are often due to motion, similar pixels tend to move together, nearby pixels tend to move together, and so on. And there is only, only so much you can do with, uh, uh, with this approach. Neural networks can actually, uh, with enough training, they can learn to uh, predict complex spatial temporal patterns. So they can predict what will happen as you turn your head sideways, which makes them very powerful predictors. In general, neural networks are very good at filling in the blanks. Um, so for example, we trained a uh, phase a, a super resolution that takes a 32 by 32 input. And this is a real input, and this is the output that it gets. Um, substantially higher uh, resolution. Obviously, uh, a lot of the information is missing from the input, so it combines the input with, with knowledge that it has learned about human faces in order to produce high quality output. So in designing AI native algorithms, we're really starting from a blank slate. And so we're challenging all assumptions that are taken for granted uh, in traditional codecs. For example, um, why should we use quad trees, right? So, uh, so in this example, we train the system that doesn't use quad trees for motion. Uh, and you can see for the same bitrate, it gets smoother motion. Um, why should we encode every frame one by one? Maybe in some cases, well, it's more beneficial to encode the entire spatial temporal pattern together. Why should we have a single motion field? So imagine a train behind the tree and just how complicated it is to represent the motion with a single motion field and how easy it is to segment uh, the data into foreground and background with very simple motion. And so there are so many other really interesting ideas that can lead to breakthrough compression uh, that I won't have time to go over today. We're also rethinking the entire video deployment workflow. So traditionally, there is a single um, codec for all purposes. But, neural, but uh, AI native video allows you to train um, thousands of different encoder-decoder pairs optimized for the particular workflow. So for example, you can have codecs uh, that are really specialized for, for cartoons, and they do exceptionally well for cartoons. Or you can have codecs that are designed for ultra-low latency transmission. So they have built-in error tolerance in addition, so, so that they can handle missing packets or codecs that are uh, uh, different algorithms and architectures for ultra-low band bandwidth situations. So with AI native, we will have the ability to dynamically update the codecs. That means you can improve, you can update, and your workflow gets better over time. And uh, unlike using uh, custom hardware, we can leverage industry-wide DNN accelerators that hundreds of companies are developing that you can see in all the latest phones, surveillance cameras, uh, on the cloud, and drones, and so on. We also tend to rethink the entire um, setup for traditional setup for lossy compression. So what does lossy compression mean? It's a trade-off between bitrate and distortion, right? So what else can it be? So in the case of uh, AI native video, 
there is a third dimension, the dimension of realism. So it is possible with a limited amount of bits to have something that's close to the original or to have something that looks more realistic. And just to give you a sense of what that means, in this example we trained an image compression um, and we tested it at a very aggressive bitrate. So for that bitrate, uh, you can see that it gets uh, sharp quality for the cat. And it's impossible really to, to transmit every single fur of the cat. So the network learned to, uh, to basically capture and synthesize texture and make sure that it looks real. Well, look at these people. Does anyone recognize these people? So these people, uh, they don't exist. They never existed. These are not photos. These are uh, faces that are completely generated from, uh, from neural networks, from scratch, without human intervention. So the task is just make a random face. So imagine how powerful the synthesis of neural networks is. And synthesis is half of compression. And so um, we need to figure out how to tap the power of synthesis for compression. And that will lead to orders of magnitude better compression. Think about what would it take to design an actual algorithm to generate this result. How would you even start? And this is not our work, by the way. If you go to thispersondoesnotexist.com, you'll be able to generate random faces and cats and, and horses and so on. It's also time to rethink the perceptual quality metrics. Um, I hope you agree that all existing perceptual quality metrics are poor proxies to quality. Um, for one thing, they don't take into account semantics. So clearly, faces and text are more important to people than shrubbery, right? Um, and so the truly uh, uh, improved um, metric should take into account not just semantics, but also object saliency, the human attention model, the also the abilities of the human visual system to notice or to be blind to certain types of distortions. And we have a collaboration with uh, both uh, Berkeley and Stanford in building the next generation quality metric. And I believe that uh, coming up with a, a new metric can make a dramatic improvement, order of magnitude improvement in, in in compression performance. We also tend to rethink the compression output. So we all know uh, the value of video compression. It leads to sm a smaller file size, higher quality, lower bit rate, um, reducing transmission cost, and so on. And we heard this morning the talk from Comcast showing how important semantic analysis is. So if you, if you, do, do, uh, if you have user-generated content, you need to make sure that you have moderation in place. You need to make sure that content ranking, ranking is working, uh, there is privacy issues, and so on. And so semantic analysis is becoming a must-have for any modern video workflow. And it's a step that happens after compression, and it's quite an expensive step. Well, the beauty of AI native compression is that uh, compression and semantic analysis can really be done in the same step with, with no extra resources. And that leads to faster, cheaper, and higher quality analytics. I apologize for sometimes the font is off because uh, some missing font problems here. So now let me t uh, talk a little bit about uh, some questions and concerns about the viability of AI native compression. One question is how competitive it is today versus the standards. And that's, of course, a very complicated uh, question to answer. But I will refer you to a paper that we published at, uh, in October last year at ICCB that shows on a standard data set across all the three standard metrics, PSNR, y, um, MSCM, and VMAP, we are outperforming both AV1 and HEVC as long as uh, a, a dozen other deep learning methods. 
Um, Google also has a work in AI native compression and they have also done user study here uh, and they're asking people to choose which video you prefer and they see um, a lot of benefits to AI native compression versus the standards. The ne next question has to do with uh, speed and efficiency. And so the, the model in our paper uh, runs on a now four-year-old Titan V NVIDIA. Um, it can encode in almost real-time HD content and it can decode in faster than real-time. And I, we've also been porting the AI native compression to the phone. And so I have a demo on a two-year-old phone that can play real-time AI native HD content. And it's not the full model, it's a slim version, but it, it works great. So feel free to talk to me about that. The next issue is about standards compliant versus proprietary technology. So there are two components to AI native. One is the codec itself, which is simply a neural network. And here we are using industry standards such as Onyx to represent the neural network. The other one is the actual bitstream between encoder and decoder. And that bitstream has no structure and interpretation. It's just a bit of a stream of bits which we wrap into an MP4. So we're standard compliant throughout, just different standards. And of course, what standards, right? So there are multiple different standards and there are multiple devices that support one standard and versus another. And in fact, what we're doing, we don't require custom hardware and we can leverage all the DNN acceleration that is in all the latest phones. As far as hard hardware support is concerned, the growth in um, DNN acceleration on the phones has been quite dramatic. So over the past years, they have increased by a factor of 10. And this year, there is a model that's twice as fast as the one that's 600. So, it's, so the acceleration is accelerating as well. And then another question is, if this is an interesting direction, do we see other big companies uh, investing in that? And so just over the last year, we see Qualcomm have been um, demonstrating AI native compression running on Qualcomm phones. NVIDIA has a project Maxine, which is the next generation video conference solution. Um, and then Google Starline has a similar project that involves that as well. And there are many more companies that we can't uh, publicly discuss. But, but things are changing and, and in a rapid pace. And then the last question is how, how difficult it is to transition to a native. And so here we have a two phase approach. We are soon going to release a video platform as a service that has what we call AI powered compression. So it's H.264 compliant, but with some of the machine learning, content aware machine learning embedded into this, uh, which will lead to much better compression that still plays everywhere. And over time in phase two, we're going to um, start this new pipeline, AI native pipeline, and, and stream this to uh, the small but growing set of, a of uh, wave one capable devices. So AI native technology is not yet, but it's on the verge of becoming practical. And once it, it does, it will have a dramatic effect on all the video pipelines. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is about latency. So there is nothing fundamental about neural networks that would actually make latency a problem. Um, and there are actually ways that we can, we haven't focused on the latency where our first solution is VOD, uh, but we are gonna go to a live solution. And um, there are a lot of interesting uh, capabilities that, so we saw several talks about how latency is important and how we can change the network to improve the latency. Actually, we shouldn't think of this as a black box, networking and compression. Uh, really, you can design compression that is um, that has some robustness towards 
uh, missing packets, and you can design networks that also can improve the, um, the reliability. So there is a lot of opportunity combining them. Thank you. Yes, question. Yeah, I, 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 have, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is about your AI native uh, approach. You said uh, that uh, you know AI native code could be attacking you know many different things, many different scenarios. Right? You can have a codec that is low bit rate. You can have a codec that is more focused on video yeah. chat, for example. Uh, the path that you're taking for your AI native approach, uh, is there an area that you're focusing on specifically? Um, so first we want to make it work so it's easier to make it work on um, ignoring uh, real time. So first we want to do a video on demand and then we'll get to real time. And uh, phones and other devices are very exciting and eventually TV. And the uh, second question is about the, uh, what you said about quality metrics, right? Mm -hmm. Which I couldn't agree more. I think if we really try to bound an AI native codec with you know, PSNR, you know, you're really just not going to get the potential that the codec can offer. Uh, there are a lot of research work uh, in the academia mm -hmm. uh, on say L, uh, LPIPS, for example, DISTS, number of uh, uh, AI-based uh, quality metrics. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, uh, can you share your view on those? Yes, so I mean, first of all, I think that most people don't realize uh, just how bad the problem is, because uh, it's very easy if you have a metric to just forget about it and just optimize on, on the numbers. And, and uh, but, uh, so there are a lot of exciting approaches um, I'm really, I think that that's a very ripe area for innovation. It's also not very easy because really the right approach takes into account all of these factors. Um, but I really think that there is a, a lot of opportunity there. So, so you, you uh, the, the existing ones that are the quality metrics that try to do better than, you know, these other traditional metrics, uh, they, if you look at the paper, you know, they are, the correlation is higher here and there, right, on large yeah. databases. So your view is that they're, could, they're not there yet? More work needs to be done? Um, the existing quality metrics are uh, not, sorry to say, they're not in a, like where we want them to be. The current work that is emerging is, is better, but it's still like there is like, a, there's a huge opportunity of doing something even more, taking into account semantics, uh, attention model, saliency of objects, uh, human visual system, all of this needs to be taken into account. And, and as far as I know, no metric really does that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Tiberio Ricchio, I'm CEO of and co-founder of Small Pixels, a startup in a mission to uh, improve the video quality. Is, our approach is similar to the previous talk, so I'm very happy to talk about, about it uh, after him. So we all know that there's a growing pain, actually. There's an exponential grow, uh, growth of video conferencing, video that is transmitted on the network, and there are a lot of users, a lot even more. And we already saw that even if you have a very high bandwidth, maybe you, you can not enjoy high quality video. 
In fact, the quality sometimes, as you have seen, <laughs> can be something like this. So who has not been uh, in a call when you, you see the person not in a very high quality? Or who hasn't watched an event, a live event, without uh, having a very good experience? In fact, uh, this is really important, as previously said by, by other speakers and also by Ivan. Uh, the 77% of viewers say that the quality is the most important factor when they were watching a live stream. And there's an estimation that 25% of the revenue may be lost due to uh, poor quality experience. This is a very, very huge problem nowadays. So we are developing a solution, which is using AI, but with a different angle. In our idea, you, you could have a standard encoded stream, then you have a decoder, and then we have an AI answer that we are making. This AI answer is a, a codec on a codec, let's say, more a decoder only, that you can apply over existing technology. So this answer is made by AI, is an codec agnostic. You can apply it to existing pipeline of today, is a software add-on, and it can be software, but it can also be hardware accelerated if the device that you are deploying on has uh, the components that can be, can, can accelerate it. It can enhance any kind of videos, any codec that you want. You can choose whatever you want, and this is applicable today, actually. So you don't have to change anything. Just take this piece of software, you add it, you add it, and you obtain better quality. It's also future-proof with these next-gen uh, next codecs, actually. And it can be general, so it can be applicable to everything, or to content-specific. So the idea is you have a low-quality encoded video, and this technology adds back high-resolution details that are missing due to the compression or other kind of modifications that you have. Basically, how does it work in our idea? So let's say you want to transmit a video. He's on the left, OK? You just, instead of, of delivering it right as it is, you compress it highly, and then you transmit it. So actually, you reduce the bandwidth. And then on the other side, there's a neural network that recovers the missing details and let your end user enjoy the high quality that, that, that wants. Just to give you an idea what is possible, here is an example of a video. Here on the left, there's an original video that is transmitted in 540p with just uh, 60 FPS, 0 0.9 megabits in H264. And on the right is a reconstructed video at 4 key from that videos, exactly. So I'm going to uh, play it. And you can see that uh, you see better on the face. On the right side of the face, there are crisper elements. I hope the, the projector helps me in this <laughs> and show you, but uh, on the left side is more blurry, as, it, as you can expect on this quality, and the right is more sharper, as you see. Here you can see two details. So uh, of the eye, here's an original transmitted and the reconstructed on the right. On the right. And here's on the, on the blouse, on the shirt, you see the details on the original one is very blurry. On the right side, the reconstructed one is very crispy. It's very sharp. We ca I can also show you all the videos. For here, for instance, there's a 720p in HD ready, reconstructed in 1044p. Uh, uh, difference is that uh, uh, this is another kind of video where the motion is very important, as you can expect in a race. And you can see on the right the, the sharpness of the controls of the, the Formula 1, for instance, or all the track. Even the ideas are very much sharper, so they're very readable when you see them. I can also show you even lower bandwidth video. So let's say we are transmitting a 360p only here on the left and want to reconstruct. We try to reconstruct it here at full HD. And you can see 
that the right side, even here, is more sharper. It can, you can almost read, you can read actually the name of the players. While on the left is more blurry. It's like uh, turning, putting on the glasses, I would say. Even on the text on the button down. So there are four key benefits of this technology, basically. So the first one is that you can increase the perceptual quality that the user is, is getting. The second one is that you can increase the user reach because now you need less bandwidth, as you can expect, so you can reach customers that you earlier you couldn't. You can reduce transmission costs, so maybe this is, depends on the media where you are transmitting, but the most important, in my opinion, is that you don't have to change the encoding pipeline, as I said before. So you can already uh, apply it, and it can be a, transi a migration transition technology between here and the AI codec completely. The technology behind you, just to give you some information, is based on generative adversarial networks. And the idea is that you have two neural networks that are competing each other in a game. You have a generator and a discriminator. The discriminator is, able, is trying to understand if a given image is real or is false, is fake, reconstructed by somebody. And the generator actually is trying to, to fool the discriminator. So it gets, it takes as input an image in low quality and try to reconstruct the missing details that they allow the high quality. When the game is finished, the generator is able to fool the discriminator and then you have a, a fully neural network that is able to do this kind of things. The perception of the user is, well, uh, he enjoys the high quality, actually, because uh, the details of the natural things are artificially generated, okay, but they are indistinguishable see, um, to the human eyes in respect to the original content. So it seems the same. And also, if you have text, it can also be uh, reconstructed in details because this technology works in the high frequencies. So uh, just uh, can also be trained to uh, better reconstruct the text. And even if you have a specialized domain, as we saw in the talk earlier, well, for instance, faces, well, you can apply even higher compression ratio and obtain, for instance, uh, in this case, a bandwidth reduction of 98% for faces. And uh, this works actually on, on a mobile phone with a resolution of uh, 500. These are examples of images that are transmitted at 128 pixels, and the reconstructed one are this. So you can see the difference between this and this reconstructed that the user actually see. And I can show you a demo on my phone if you want. We performed several analyses for performance. Uh, one of the metrics is VMAF, as commonly used. Well. Um, if, for instance, we transmit a video at 720p and reconstruct it at full HD, then we can expect a 44% of increase of, math, of VMAF. While we can also achieve a 33% of bandwidth reduction for the same. But the problem is that this metric, as I already highlighted uh, previously, is not very helpful to give you an idea of what is happening really. Because uh, the image actually produced, generated in the end, is different from the original one due to the generated elements. So this metric uh, gives some hint of what is happening, but does not say everything about it. We also tested another one then. So uh, we chose L pipes, which is uh, uh, a metric based uh, on neural networks. The idea here is uh, there's a neural network that is trying to understand which objects are an image and seeks the different, uh, looks at the difference between the, co the original content and the reconstructed one to reconcile the same objects. Even in this case, we can show that uh, the metrics, the distance gets shorter using this technology of the, by 47% and there, uh, there's as well similar reduction in bandwidth. Obviously, metrics have limits, so we also have some users look at this kind of in this kind of experiment, and uh, we saw that actually user preferred uh, choose the content that we were um, 
generating. So having the content at 720p and using our technologies was better for the user in the 75% instead of the original content at full HD. And that is, in my opinion, is amazing. So today, uh, we are focusing on two things, two value proposition in our setup. The first one is quality enhancement. And for this, we are uh, preparing two products. One is a cloud server where you can uh, uh, get video enhanced for offline, in offline fashion. And the other one is a server that can be deployed on premises. And this is a real time video enhancer. So this technology runs in real time depends on the quality that you want, actually, in the end. So uh, is, I would say it's a trade-off between uh, the computation available and uh, the quality that you want to obtain at this time. And the other value is the, value is the bandwidth reduction. So for this, we are also consider the, the same server on-premises, but also we are uh, developing an SDK for video players that anybody can uh, integrate in their players and obtain the better quality directly without changing anything else. So let me show you uh, just a little sneak peek at the, what we are doing. So here is a web player where we integrated all technology. There's a standard player, actually. But we added a button uh, in the bottom right of the player where you can enable the technology. So we can see that, uh, OK, he's playing should be uh, visible on the, I hope, so. yeah. Every time that the button is activated, the quality gets, in, gets improved. I have a demo, so if you want to see it, just contact me. I have it on the, my laptop, but also my phone. I can show you directly the effort is better on, on real life than this video. And also, here's the, uh, a video of the cloud server. So basically, you can just log in. Uh, create a new project, give it a name, okay. Put a video, and then you can choose between uh, an amount of network that we developed for various cases, for a various kind of content. There are general ones and specific ones. Then the servers produce the video, and then you can actually see it, watch it. And you can see the difference in real time. Consider also that this video is also compressed, so the effect is uh, less visible in this. And here is another one for the real-time server. Similar as before, we can, at this time, uh, uh, enable a live processing here. And then you get an address that, with the RTSP, you can use VLC and enjoy your live video reconstructed in real time. So actually, there are, mm, this is another use case. It's like uh, you have uh, some live event, and you want to transmit it to somewhere else, and you're going to pay a lot for bandwidth. Then you can use this server to increase the quality at the uh, end of the receiving end. So thank you for your attention. You can. Okay, you can ask me for the, uh, the demo if you want, or just send me an email, and we can talk if you want, if you're interested. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? Yeah. yeah uh, I'd like to ask something about the codec. Yeah. So uh, I realize that an important dimension is that your solution is codec agnostic. Yeah, exactly. I'm, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, have you looked a little bit into variations, let's say, uh, if you were to apply your solution on Nav1 stream versus an older encoder, what would be the differences in quality? Mm -hmm. uh, this is my first question. And my second question is, uh, have you considered, uh, as part of the, let's say, decoder-like solution that you have, to take into account what the encoder is, so that you can, you know, uh, let's say, have some samples for that specific encoder and tune along? I, I saw that you have some en enhancer enhancer types, so mm -hmm. maybe that's already there, but yeah. Sorry, two questions in one. Okay, so let's start for the first one. Okay. 
regarding different codecs, okay, we tested with uh, H.264, with the HEVC, we are testing now with AV1, uh, VVC, and uh, uh, the results are similar in every case. Uh, even if it's older, actually, if it's even older, the quality gets better with less bandwidth. For instance, we tried also MJPEG, and the results were astonished uh, compared to more recent uh, uh, codec. So uh, I believe that uh, the, the codec actually doesn't, is not very important at this phase. And if uh, also the, in the latest experiment that I told you about VVC and also confirmed this, I guess this um, shouldn't be a problem, actually. <laughs> And, uh, how and about the other one, yeah, sorry? The, yeah, sorry. The other one was about uh, taking into account the encoder mm -hmm. uh, in the yeah. enhancer. Okay, so uh, this is a shorter version of the presentation. I also have one with the semantic awareness of the, of the data. So basically, we have another solution where uh, you also add um, a small software, also a decoder, where you analyze the, the semantics. And that using that, you can, uh, you can adjust the compression of the encoder and the other, other sides get conditioned data about how is the, um, the video encoded. And in this case, the compression is higher and the quality is also better. So yes, got <laughs> it, it but was a nice question. Huh? Got it, so it's metadata based. So you have to send the data to the decoder. It's not like something you can do on the decoder as is. Uh, actually, uh, the experiments we did, we didn't send any data. But we are considering that also. But uh, in the end, if the quality is fixed at the encoded time, if you have some information at the encoded time, the decoder already knows what you did at the encoder. So this is specific about the, the learning that happens when you are deploying, when you are training the decoder and the generator on, in the general adversarial network framework. Got it. Thank you. Welcome. Just uh, a slightly related oh, question. Um, well, uh, regarding the, the application where you were using it as uh, a refinement of a lower um, yeah. compressed um, stream. So do you have applications where you transmit the weights of your GAN um, according to your types of content? Or you uh, plan to have a set library of models in your decoder? How big are your models? You know, uh. <laughs> okay, no. Okay, first, uh, both of them are available. So we have a general solution that uh, doesn't need to know anything about the video, but we can also, let's say, specialize the network, and we can transmit it as well with the media. So if there is not uh, a live streaming, but there's a content library, so you can specialize these networks on the content. Um, also, the models that we deployed actually uh, are very small okay. because uh, the target is running in every kind of um, every kind of computer that we have today. So we are considered also the last five years at this time because uh, if you are going to um, use this technology on the actual codec, you are not only considering the, the future hardware that you get. When you get that, okay, better. <laughs> we will have even better quality. But the target today is even the browser. The browser that I show you uh, wasn't with, uh, is a computer, a laptop without GPUs, if I remember correctly. So it was uh, totally CPU driven and was uh, the model like uh, one, 1,000 kilobytes. I don't okay. remember correctly. 1,000 kilobytes, if I remember uh, correctly. There's Sorry. lots of, of research in academia on GANs for super resolution, and some yeah. models are like. No, exactly. Also, my background is from the academia. 60 million, uh, <laughs> 60 million weights, for example. So they are very yeah. big. and Wouldn't be feasible for yeah. any of the customers that we talk today. So, uh, Makes sense. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Uh, so I'm John Holwick with RDTV. Thanks for... Uh, hanging out a full day here. Still a pretty full room and I appreciate that. Um, I'm our vice president. I work out of San Francisco, but I was born and raised in Denver. And we are founded in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, what I'm gonna show you today is the first augmented reality software built specifically for individual creators. 
And I'm gonna dive in with a demo to begin that. So I'm gonna have audio on this video. Hi everyone, it's John with Artie. And I'm happy to show you the first augmented reality software built specifically for individual creators. So let's dive into the demo. I don't need this laptop to run Artie. So we'll set it on fire. And the reason why I have this nice warm campfire here is because the topic is storytelling. Humans have been storytellers for hundreds of thousands of years. Back to when we sat around the fire and we talked about the mammoth we chased that day and whether we caught it for dinner or need to go out again tomorrow to track it down. The format of our stories have changed. We've gone from movies to stories through television. And now the format has shifted online to platforms like YouTube, or Twitch, or TikTok, or Facebook, or many others, where individual creators, everyday people like you and me, now have the ability to tell stories that might reach millions of potential viewers. But the theme is still the same. Humans want to tell stories that engage their audience, that keep their attention, and include them in the story that they're telling. Augmented reality is a great way to do that, but so far, AR has been very expensive, sometimes over $100,000 for a setup. It's been complicated and it's required a studio to be able to do. With Artie, we've made that affordable, easy, and everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about how we do that. We leverage Unreal Engine as our AR graphics engine. It's the same one behind uh, popular games like Fortnite. Very realistic, very high quality, and very lifelike. And we're able to render that live in the cloud leveraging AWS and WebRTC. Then we allow for our creators to leverage our cloud-based UI to organize their AR content and then present it very simply as an integrated webcam or by sharing their browser in presentation software like Zoom or in production software like OBS. So now let's talk a little bit more about the areas that our customers are benefiting from Artie in their stories. They're doing it for better visualization, better annotation, and better storytelling. And I'll give examples of each. So for visualization, I'm going to bring in my nice new red Tesla that just flew into the room. I'm also going to leverage a marker here. It's very helpful to use AR for visualizing items that are not easy to hold in your hand. So I can't bring a Tesla into my office here, but I can show a very nice AR model of a Tesla. And now with Artie, I can even pick it up, move it around, I can show my audience the front, the sides, you know, the headlights if I want to. And I can even pick up my camera and move it around the room and keep that Tesla in the same place. So I now have an AR model, which functions exactly like a physical model of a Tesla right here on my desk and very easy to set up and very easy to use to visualize things for my audience. Now I'll turn off tracking. I'll put away my marker here and we'll talk about the second topic, which is annotation. So very simply, I brought in a circuit board. Uh, you might have complicated items that you want to better explain to your audience. Annotation is a very good way to do that. Just like I've annotated all of the parts of my circuit board to educate my audience. So annotation is the second way that our customers are leveraging this. Uh, and then last, and probably most important, again, is storytelling. So. I'm going to tell a story about my top five reasons why Californians are moving to Colorado. I grew up in Colorado. I went to the University of Denver. I moved out to San Francisco shortly thereafter. And that's the opposite move of what most people are doing right now. Most Californians are moving to Colorado. So here's John's top five, my story on why I think that's happening. And the first reason is the Great American Beer Festival. 
Now, I think this is the best time that you could have anywhere outside of Munich. Hundreds of beers all in one place and just an absolute blast. It happens every year in Denver. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is ski towns. So everybody has their favorite. It might be Breckenridge, it might be Telluride, but they're all awesome, great vibes, and fun things to do, really friendly people. Colorado ski towns can't be beat. Third reason is that Colorado has the best oysters anywhere in America. If you haven't had Rocky Mountain oysters, definitely have them before you leave Denver, or before you leave this conference. Fourth reason is anybody who's a golfer will appreciate the altitude in Colorado and how much further their golf ball goes. In California, if you expect to hit it 200 yards, it's gonna go 170 yards. In Colorado, if you expect to hit it 200 yards, it might go 230 yards, and that's a fantastic feeling. So that's reason number four. And then reason number five, why Californians are moving to Colorado is to potentially be reunited with Aaron Rodgers, who was a star here in the Bay Area at Cal. And who knows, maybe he'll finally uh, come to, to Denver in the Broncos next year. We can all cross our fingers. So again, this has been my story on the top five reasons Californians are moving to Colorado. And it's been my pleasure to share the first augmented reality software built specifically for creators. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> so a uh, couple key important things about that video. I'm not a technical guy. You can probably tell by the story that I tell. Um, I see people Googling Rocky Mountain oysters all around the room uh, to try to understand what my point was with the bowl there. Um, but I'm able to do this with a very simple Dell laptop and a Sony handheld ZV-1 camera, the same type that I use to take pictures of my family on vacation. So that's the benefit, is to give all creators that have a laptop, a camera, and an internet connection the ability to include AR in their videos. So there's hundreds of millions of, of creators on YouTube. We want to be the AR solution for them to make their stories more interesting. I have a couple more examples of the ways that our customers are using this. Um, because the concept, just like I described here, giving people the, the ability to do this so easily with no hardware and existing uh, equipment that they have in their home, in their, in their home office like me, um, really democratizes this space. And that's our goal, is to bring it to everyone. So, Here's a couple examples of how our customers are doing Hey this sports now. fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. Turns out they isolated more in the first round than they did in any other round after that. I had only one kill, but let's talk about team kills. Before we get going though, a word from our sponsor, Zip Chair. Your team, your chair, your game. You can check out some Zip Chair gear over at zipchair.com. This is one of the villains. He's like a... There's, there's Drac, or there's Batista, and there on the planet is a desert. I'll be back streaming again on more normal games. Lending Club, my lucky number is eight. As you can see here, they are, we're in our five yeah, zone. Thank you for uh, hosting the better. event. Uh, have that shot, much appreciated. So, a very wide variety, from finance to sports to gaming, uh, we also have customers that are using this for things like meditation and CBD. So anyone can benefit from it because it helps you tell a better story. Uh, very quickly how this works, and then I'll take a few questions. Um, again, I'm not technical, but I'll give you the high level. So you start with our UI, which is cloud-based. That's where you're going to organize your AR content. That then goes, uh, you can film the video with any camera you know, even an iPhone. Um, and then that goes into Unreal Engine in the cloud, where then the graphics and the positionings can be controlled. You can actually control it uh, with your cell phone. You can change where the AR is positioned, how big it is, et cetera. Uh, and then that overlays into, uh, it overlays the graphics onto the video in real time. 
to create the mixed reality end product here. So uh, you can do this live like you saw some of our customers doing on Twitch. You can also do live to tape or um, you can do this after the fact. You can add it to your videos afterwards, but the real benefit is being able to do this live or doing it recorded where you can interact with the, the AR like I was doing in my demo. So that is, that's it. I'll stop there. Um, I'd love to give one-on-one -on -one demos, so feel free to just sign up on my Calendly here. Um, and happy to take any questions as well, but thank you for letting me share this with you. Any questions? Okay. Thanks a lot. For this, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Prince. I'm really excited to be here. I traveled all the way out of Amsterdam to Maha Video. First time I'm attending, so I'm really. Uh, already had a really nice day and looking forward to the next days. And as the previous presenter, uh, thanks, thanks for sticking in this session. It's uh, quite a long session, but we really appreciate you being here and listening to all our pitches. So, um, as I said, um, Martin, I'm the head of product of uh, Media Distillery. We are an uh, Amsterdam-based startup specialized in creating new v value out of video content. We do this by analyzing uh, video with AI and machine learning. And to give you an idea to, to the skill we work on, we, pro we analyze 30,000 hours of video per day. We do this on a 24-7 basis, all in real time. And we process content from 15 countries and currently already uh, improve video experiences for 30 million households, primarily in Europe, but also in Latin America. To give you an idea who we are as a company, I have a small video. video gives a little bit of an impression of what we do. I will dive in and give more examples later on in the presentation. Um, yeah, to give you an idea, we primarily active in Europe. We work with a lot of MVPDs in Europe. So the, the, those are some of the customers on the left. And we also partner with uh, yeah, uh, players in the entertainment industry that help us create better experiences. Um, yeah, what we, what we are focusing on is basically uh, what we see is the biggest challenge right now in the video industry. Uh, a lot of video platforms struggle with the same thing that's fighting over the viewer attention. I think currently there are 3,000 video services in the world. People on average might already use four subscriptions at a time in Europe. I recently saw a number that sometimes people use seven services. I think this number will not stay, uh, st stay this high, it will go down. Um, you also see that uh, people spend quite a lot of time searching for content. And I think some extreme cases that we saw in our research is that people might spend 30, up to 30 minutes to looking for something to watch, which, which, is, a, which is a risk for a video platform. Because if people not, uh, cannot find what they are looking for, they might to cho choose to go elsewhere. And another uh, trend we are seeing is that people are uh, cutting the cord or are becoming cord members. So, the, what used to be uh, the case that people had a big TV subscription, uh, people are moving away to this. So this all means that as a video service, you need to make sure you have a compelling experience, make sure people can find content quickly, and have an engaging experience. 
And that's basically what we do. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, we detect the real start and stop time of TV programs that people use in catch up and replay, making sure that if they, uh, they play the program, they always have the right start. Uh, and we see this with our customers leading to 20% more viewing of catch up and replay content. Uh, we enhance metadata for programs uh, by automatic analysis of the video. We can add, uh, for, for a lot of non-scripted live programs, add up to 75% of meaningful data that you would normally not have in your traditional metadata. So we can add a lot of information that can be used to help the viewer search and find content. And we generate appealing descriptive images for each uh, episode so that people have a better understanding of what a, a video is about and help them uh, select the right content quicker, which also leads to an increase of viewing by 10%. So how we do this, I think if you were aware at the, at the session this morning from, uh, from Comcast, you already saw a little bit about how, what you can do with video analysis. We do s similar things. So basically we, we uh, ingest content, uh, we do this in real time, and we have a lot of different AI and machine learning algorithms to extract a lot of meaningful information out of the video and we use, use this to create actionable metadata. That could be accurate time markers of program start, stop, or binge markers or chapters. Uh, that can be appealing descriptive images, and it can be deep uh, metadata for your content. And we do this for any type of content. We do it fully automated, uh, and we do it in real time, because we believe that if you can, do, a lot of viewing has to do with what people watch today, so we wanna make sure that the data becomes available as soon as possible. So we, we, what, with all our products, we try, really try to see how we can improve the user journey. It starts with content selection, so making sure uh, people can select the right content quicker. When they start watching, making sure the program always starts at the program start, if, if you talk about a recording. Uh, if people search for content, make sure that they always find the content they're looking for, so they no more have the situation that they have zero results found while people knowing that the content is in the platform, but just due to a lack of metadata, it cannot be discovered. And the last step is make sure that, that uh, we offer better ad experiences but by enabling contextual relevant ads to the con content. For each of these uh, uh, touch points, I will, by means of a video, show a little bit of what we are doing. So the first product we, we have is what we call image distillery. It's basically replace the stock images that you saw in the video and make sure we get appealing descriptive images in return for each episode. Uh, we do this by analyzing the video, first making sure that we remove images that have a bad technical quality, making sure we have uh, v uh, images that are aesthetically pleasant so that we have nice facial expressions, people in the frame, and then we also uh, make sure that we can remove elements that you do not want to have in a thumbnail, for instance, a logo or subtitles. And then we can also create different aspect ratios to make sure that the images can be used on different playback devices that have different aspect ratios. We also create multiple images for, for, an, uh, for a program, which makes it uh, possible to personalize. So for some people, you could focus for, for this show, for instance, on the cars, while for other people you could focus on the guests. So this brings a lot of uh, flexibility regarding personalization. Uh, the se second product is EPG uh, correction. And what we basically do is try to find the right start and stop of a TV program. Uh, what I already said, the Right now, if you would record a program or you have a catch per replay service, the recording is based on the EPG scheduled start and stop time. But in practice, the real program start stop times always often deviate from the broadcast schedule, which uh, as a side effect has that when people watch content, they will not do not see the start of a program. They might see a part in the content or the previous content or in an ad break, which gives a lousy experience. So we really to try to detect using visual analysis try to detect where uh, one program transitions into another program or transitions from an ad break into a, uh, a program, such to make sure that people have a fault-like experience even when watching catch-up and replay. And for instance, scoring markers are not available to give this timing information. 
The third product we currently have is what we call topic distillery. So we try to analyze video and extract a lot of information. What you can see from this example, there's a lot of information you can get out of a video by, by looking at the, what's being said, what's in the frame, what is being talked about, or visual information. This leads to a lot of the uh, uh, additional topic metadata that you currently just don't have. And if you have this metadata, you can create all kinds of new uh, use cases. So you can make sure that people can find content based on topic, not just a program description or a program title. You can offer personalized experiences where people f follow topics of interest. Or, or something else, what you could do as well is make sure that you have automatic ch chaptering so that people can jump to the content they are uh, interested in and skip the parts that they, uh, they don't care about. So, and this also enables short form viewing even if you have long form content. And the, the last product that we have is what we call context distillery for ads. It's a bit similar to the topic distillery. We try to de detect the context of a video, uh, which can be used to uh, have a better matching of the ads with a program. So in this case, if you have a video of people on the beach, we can make sure we can associate it with a travel ad. And this leads to a higher engagement of the ad adds more v value to the advertiser, is less frustrating to the viewer. And uh, also important, especially in Europe, it's really uh, user friendly because uh, we don't uh, do any user tracking. We just look at the content and uh, have the best uh, matching ads. Um, I will be here for three days. I have some demos. I will give you a quick sneak peek of uh, to two of the things we're offering. So first, the EPG correction. This is an example uh, which I recorded yesterday of uh, a program uh, in the EPG. So when we see the program on the left, you see what you would get if you look at the scheduled start time, and on the right is the, the start time we detected. So we see the Fox logo, and we know that the program starts. So we, we find uh, the real start. In this case, it's 55 seconds. In practice, we see cases going from a few seconds up to 15 minutes. So uh, this is something we can automatically do. We do this in real time. Uh, as soon as we detect it, we give it to our customers, so even when the program is still running, they can offer already offer a better experience. And another demo is in our, uh, in our demo platform where we show a lot of the elements from the topic distillery product. For instance, because we can detect topics, we can also offer uh, automatic trends uh, in your interface. So we can automatically populate the interface based on what's in the programming, not, uh, not based on what's in the description. Or, uh, for instance, give the latest updates on the Ukraine. This is all automatically generated. We, we did not look at the, at the, uh, the program metadata or the program description. We really used uh, speech analysis and visual analysis to determine the key topics in a video, which allows us to automatically populate uh, programs and clips from different broadcast channels. And as you can see already from this picture, we can find a lot of content that normally you would not be able to, f to find because there's just no description. Uh, we also, in, in this demo, I can show uh, chaptering. So we have, for different types of uh, programs, we provide automatic chaptering of the content. That's also something I uh, can demonstrate. I, uh, I do not have the video in this in this demo yet, but uh, feel free to reach out and I can show you what we can do with chaptering. And another example is what, yeah, what I already said, the image distillery. Here you can clearly see if you have stock images, uh, it does not really help the viewer to decide should I pick the program on the left, the episode on the left or the episode next to it. So what we do is um, replace it with uh, images extracted from the videos itself. And here you can also see that we can personalize. So for a food factory, you can either focus on the food or focus on uh, uh, the, the guest. Uh, that's it for, for, for my talk right now. I uh, have another talk coming up on Thursday. I will dive a little bit uh, deeper into our actual detections and the actual results that we get and takeaways there. So please, uh, if you're interested, please join the session on uh, Thursday. But I'm also happy to, to show you a demo, have a talk, and see how we can help you with generating and creating better video viewing experience. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if there are any questions. And if not, uh, then the next speaker can come up.
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Liu. I'm the founder and CEO of NetInt. So six years ago, my partner and I started NetInt. We have a big dream to combine the benefits of the high performance ASIC plus the quality and the feasibility and the flexibility of the software solutions with our own design customized ASIC. I'm so proud that till now, to in the 2021, our customers encoded 200 billion minutes of the video using our VPU. Uh, it's a memorable milestone for our team, and also it's yet it's uh, still a baby, baby step to our ultimate goal that to have to replace the software encoder with our ASIC solutions. So today I'm going to focus on the advantage on the ASIC, uh, ASIC solutions. So you may wonder, so, so what? So let, let's see the, the three numbers we provide here. So by using the ASIC solution, we can provide 20x of the encoding efficiency improvements compared to software running on the general purpose CPU. That means you can reduce your operation cost by 20x. That's just the, the, by the order of magnificent. Right? And also, finally, you can keep the environment sustainability by using our solution, you reduce the uh, CO2 emission by, 20, uh, by 80x. Right. And also, finally, the cost per, final, uh, per channel of the 1080p60 uh, videos is only $100. So you can do your own calculation compared to your current solutions, how much we can save right now. Yeah. But since nothing comes for free, we will dig into a little bit more about uh, how the ASICs compare to the softwares. So here we compare uh, three of the popular platforms that running uh, basically uh, everyone has, that the CPU, the GPU, and also, and also our ASIC. So on the four of the quadrants, like the video quality, uh, bitrate efficiency, uh, operational complexity, and also integration flexibility. The so green is best and the, the yellow is okay, and you want to stay out of the red. And you can see for the ASIC solutions, basically all we can achieve are green, and also for the video quality and the bitrate efficiency, there is a solutions from the low to the medium to the green, or moving towards the green. That's the situation right now. Yeah. And uh, here we can talk about a, little, a little bit more about the different ASIC solutions. That's also part of the misbelievings that people have right now. So we normally see the hardware solutions comes from the consumer electric the devices, right? They put the chip into a, a big board and customize that software to run for the commercial usage. It serves the purpose, right? Especially compared uh, for the cost wise because the, this the standard device they have means for the mass production, the cost is cheap and also the go-to-market is quick. And in the middle, they also have some specialized solutions using most likely like from the security cameras. They bring the chip back and put into some also customer board and try to do that for the live streamings. That also works. Also, there are some drawbacks like the, it's hard to config, it's hard to program, and also liking on some key features like the B-frame or the HDR. And the, the third approach that is uh, we are taking that we customize to design our own chips. We, we break the chip down and also to redesign all the encoder engines, all the data paths, and also the flexible programmer interface. And by doing that, we can provide the best value to our customers. Of course, there are also some of the, uh, the, the, the in spite of the, the cost, we still need to consider a lot because to building that chip, we need to spend tens of million dollars before we shipping one product. But uh, yet, we, we believe this is the right approach and we're doing right now. So here is our uh, product uh, uh, block diagram. It's called the Codensity G5 ASIC. So for the Codensity ASIC, it's the world first the ASIC built on top of the computational storage architecture. So by using this architecture, you can plug the, the device into any server without install any driver, just almost plug and play. Right? 
And also we support the widest adopted the codex from the H264, H265, and AV1. And in fact, we are one of the earliest, or the world first AV1 encoder in the, world, in the market. And also, um, uh, our design also have um, very flexible structure. So you see that we have the uh, microprocessor cluster that can provide a flexible programmability to the software engineers. We, we are working with the top talents in the, in the industry, right? The people working on the algorithms, on the network side, on the protocol side. So we, we provide a flexible interface for them to work with our products. In fact, we can very easily to provide the software plus the hardware solutions for the hybrid solution. And in the chip, we also have the 20 tops of the AI engine that can work with the, a lot of solutions. Even t today, we talk about a lot, right? We can work together to, to bring a brilliant solution to our customer. We also have the 2D engine that can manipulate the pixels to do like the RFO blending or the uh, scaling or a lot of the things that uh, customer needs. So combine the AI to the engine and also the most advanced the codec, we can provide the one shop solution to our customers. So in the morning, uh, the, the Comcast guy talk about their AI solutions when they doing the decoding, then AI and uh, doing the video analytics, there's a, the time is about 10 seconds. We can do that in milliseconds, right? In the same data flow, right? we can do that in the milliseconds. And also, um, a lot of common uh, belief that the industry, that the hardware cannot provide the aspect of the quality as a software. This is wrong. This is maybe for a lot of other suppliers, but not for us, not for codensity products. So here is a BD rate comparison for the 4K60 AV1. You can see clearly that we are much better than the software solution. And most importantly, for the software solution, we're running on this one, the SVT AV1. For a medium to high end server, it can only achieve about a single digit uh, IPS. Right? But for us, for one RU server, we can do 160 channels of 10TP60 AV1 streams. Right? And we barely touch the CPU or memory. So we still can reach, achieve a lot. Right? Uh, yeah, this, this is the power that the, that the ASIC, that the software that cannot uh, catch up, right? And here I also provide some of the AV1 demos. I'm not sure the network connection status, but we can try. Let's see the original first. Okay, seems not, okay. Yeah, this is running on the 264. This is the gaming sequence. Oh, it's now showing on the screen. Okay. Okay, that, that's fun. I think you can check the, the video stream by yourself. So basically, we're using the AV1 to replace the the common use, the H264, we cut half of the, the bit rate and the quality is still outstanding. You cannot see any difference. Okay. And also here I provide more numbers about the different solutions, right? Compared to for the uh, total cost of ownership, right, compared to the software solution, or cost efficiency is uh, about uh, 40x. And compared to the GPU solutions, where cost efficiency is 10x, and about the environmental impact, we can provide, we can reduce the carbon emission about 80x. It's just amazing. And also the server densities to achieve the 10,000 of the 1080p 60 streams, we only need 32 of our servers. But if you're running on the uh, GPU, you need 250. And if you use the software, you need more than 1,000 servers to, to process the same amount of the video. This is why that Google designed their own ASIC to for the YouTube. But since not everyone can have that, can design their own chip, we designed that for you, and it's even better. So here's our product the form factors. We have the first generation and the two generation, but with the major two form factor, U.2 and the PCIe adding card form factor. 
So I bring my um, UDAL2 product here. You can see this is a 2.5 inch SSD form factor. For this single chip uh, version, we can handle 4K 260 IPS AV1 real time encoding uh, by this single uh, device. And here, uh, be beyond the single, single product capabilities, we also provide much advanced feature for the data center users. We can build a data center scale of the transfer, uh, transcoder farm by using the uh, PCIe over fabric technology or NVMe over fabric technology. Basically, we can put, put a bunch of cards as a pool provided to the data center, and all the hosts, all the servers, can access those uh, VPUs just like uh, the local resource. So th think about that, how convenient it is. And there are some data to show that by using that kind of pool technology, you can further improve the efficiency by about 30 to 40%. That means you drop your cost further by 30 to 40%. Okay, yeah, uh, I want to end just like this. It's time to switch to ASICs. Yeah. Thank you for your listening. A uh, question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, so we do see the similar trend that uh, a lot of the encoder they put into the cloud instead of the on-premise or the on the edge. So in fact, m majority of our customers are hyperscalers. They, they use tens of thousands of cars on each data center. Yeah, but uh, in the same time, we also see some trend that big, especially on the edge uh, processing. So they put a lot of the encoder transcoder device to the edge. Uh, in fact, uh, very, very soon uh, there's another speaker talk about the decent decentralized uh, video transcoding. We are all also working with them, right? Because that, that is the also uh, another trend is happening here. Yeah. You ask a question? Yeah. So, so you wrote something about NVMe over fabric. What, yes. What's the benefit of implementing NVMe when you can go PCI Express directly? Uh, why do you want to tunnel everything through a disk protocol? Oh, yeah. So uh, it, it, that, that's a very good question. In fact, we have two approaches. So both the PCIe or Fabric or NVMe or Fabric both works. But since our technology oriented from NVMe technology, so we use that as a default. But, but yeah. NVMe runs on top of PCI Express anyway, right? right? So, yes. So yeah. why, why do you have a layer of pretending to be a disk drive in between? By default, why, why not go PCI Express uh, by default? Yeah, I do see that the uh, NVMe or Fabric provide more easier integration to the customer. But for the PCIe, we do see there's some uh, integration effort, especially working with other partners like the Liquid. You need, there's still some work to do. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can talk after. Yeah, yeah we can talk offline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for uh, staying to almost the end. <laughs> we got this working. Um, my name is Eric Tang, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at LifePeer. Oh, here we go. Well, thanks, everyone, for staying until the end. Uh, almost the end. We're almost, we're almost through. Um, my name is Eric Tang, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at LifePeer. Uh, LifePeer is building the world's open video infrastructure. Uh, so you, uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what LifePeer is uh, and on a high level how it works. Uh, and hopefully within the next 10, 15 minutes you get a sense of uh, how it works and, and how it relates to you know, what you do. So what is LifePeer? Uh, first of all, LifePeer is transcoding infrastructure. Right? Everyone in this room knows what, what transcoding is. Uh, so what's so special about that? Uh, well, one is um, that you know, life, the, the LivePeer network supports all the common video codecs and formats or you know, um, video workflows like live, live streaming or VOD transcoding. Uh, 
but more importantly, it's a blockchain coordinated and decentralized global network uh, where no one owns this infrastructure. Uh, it's completely um, owned by the community. Uh, it's decentralized uh, in a way that uh, Bitcoin is decentralized or Ethereum is decentralized. Um, and secondly, um, LivePeer is a set of video tools for developers. Um, there is a uh, affordable video API service that's built on top of the LivePeer network that gives you the full end-to-end -end video streaming um, capability for anyone to build a, um, a, a, like a full video streaming application. Uh, there's also an open source media server uh, that has all the components that you will need to build a scalable and accessible video infrastructure yourself. And thirdly, LivePeer enables uh, a bunch of really interesting new Web3 video features uh, by integrating into other types of decentralized technologies. For example, LivePeer has a native integration into the Ethereum blockchain or the Polygon blockchain that allows you to kind of use smart contracts to control uh, the video streaming experience. Uh, it also has native integrations into decentralized storage systems like IPFS or Filecoin uh, that allows you to store videos into, uh, into those uh, storage solutions and also stream video from those solutions. And on top of that, you can start to build new types of Web3, uh, interesting Web3 uh, ideas like video-based NFTs or streaming uh, videos in and out of the uh, blockchain-powered metaverse. Um, you know, there are lots of cool, interesting ideas that are coming out of this new ecosystem. Um, a little bit of history about us. Uh, we've been building LivePeer since early 2017. Uh, we started building the protocol back then. Uh, we launched the alpha version of the network in 2018. Uh, we launched a streaming service on top of this network um, through a simple set of APIs. Uh, that was 2020. And finally, uh, very recently, we open sourced this really powerful media server that I'm gonna go into a little bit uh, to talk about. So, so how, does this, how does this work on a high level? Well, at the core, LivePeer is a set of protocols uh, that's encoded into a set of smart contracts and deployed on the layer two Ethereum blockchain. Uh, in this case, the Arbitrum blockchain. Uh, the two types of participants are you know, either broadcasters, uh, which means you have video that you want to get, to get transcoded, uh, and or orchestrators, which means you have capacity that you want to transcode other people's video uh, and, and, and be paid in cryptocurrency, right? And, and there's a set of economic securities in place to make sure the participants can participate in this protocol and make sure uh, and be sure that uh, they're not going to be cheated, right? So if you are sending video in the, into the network, um, the security guarantees that uh, your video will be transcoded correctly, and vice versa. If you're providing capacity, uh, this, the protocol guarantees that uh, as long as you do the work honestly, you'll be paid according to the work that you do. Um, the workflow works something like this, right? Um, if you are an orchestrator or you have computation capacity, you can run the LivePeer open source software uh, and send a transaction to the Ethereum blockchain that declares that you want to do work for the network. Uh, and you send it a, a service URL. Uh, and and other, uh, other broadcasters can go through a discovery protocol to discover all these service URLs uh, and also figure out who is the closest to them, uh, who, has, uh, who has the lowest latency. Uh, and, and the broadcaster will always be working with a set of orchestrators so that um, if any of them just goes offline all of a sudden, there's always plenty of backup. Uh, and there's no kind of interruption of service uh, in this case. Uh, in order to create these economic security that I talked about, uh, there's, uh, we have these fast and, uh, and full verification mechanisms uh, to, to, to verify the, the result of the transcoding. Uh, the fast verification path is a heuristics and perceptual hashing based path uh, and it can be done in a synchronous way because it's, it's not very computationally intensive. Uh, and the full verification path is based on cryptographic proofs of um, kind of signed signatures that can identify people's uh, on, uh, blockchain identity. Uh, and that combined with this multi-round uh, AI algorithm that um, allows you to, to do a much more thorough check 
of the transcoding result that comes back. This verification is more, in, uh, is more computationally intensive than the actual transcoding process. However, you don't have to do this very often, and it can be done in, a, in the asynchronous way because of uh, all the cryptographic proofs are already uh, in your hands. Uh, so you can, you can do the sampling uh, approach. Uh, so so with, this, with this type of approach, uh, you can use then on-chain dispute resolution to essentially uh, have the proof to uh, economically punish someone who is cheating uh, in, this, um, in, the, in this scheme by taking away their, their token deposits. Uh, so we've been running this network for about three years. Uh, so far, the results have been pretty interesting. There's a global network of GPUs, uh, transcoding nodes, um, there's lots of spare capacity around the world, it turns, turns, turns out, and uh, there's, they're transcoding this work uh, at a fraction of the cost to what you can see on, on the like, on market today. Uh, and, and because of this, we've been able to build this video service uh, on top that you know, d d delivers video globally in uh, North America, Europe, and the APAC region. Uh, here's a little case study about one of, one of the users uh, of this streaming uh, platform. Uh, it's an art stream, uh, live streaming platform that streams about 84 million minutes uh, a month uh, in video. They have 75,000 broadcasts a month. Uh, and by switching over to LivePeer, they saved about eight times the cost savings from uh, a transcoding perspective. Uh, another uh, re recent development in LivePeer is that we open sourced a piece of media server technology called Mist Server. Uh, Mist Server is actually a, a software that's been in development for a long time, uh, over 12 years. Um, the, the team came, uh, joined the LivePeer team through an acquisition last year, and we recently just open sourced the whole thing. Uh, it, it's a really interesting uh, piece of technology. It's written in C++. Uh, it can uh, kind of function in you know, the, the data center environment all the way down to like an embedded device environment. Uh, it has a lot, uh, supports lots of inbound and outbound video protocols, uh, and it has this deep integration into the LivePeer network so that uh, you can run a single instance of this media server and be able to run hundreds of concurrent live streams on it, uh, all fully transcoded, full ABR ladders, uh, and, and you, can, you can kind of utilize the, the transcoding capacity at the LivePeer network to scale up and down uh, depending on the demand of your, of your service in the moment. Um, by fully open sourcing um, this software, uh, anybody can use it for free, uh, but in case when people want to get additional support, uh, we've added kind of uh, support, con uh, support contracts for people to be able to get um, kind of better support. Um, another open interesting um, area that we've been doing research on is uh, around video AI, uh, and this is uh, attempting to uh, combine the video transcoding and AI inference process into the same pipeline onto the same silicon, right? Uh, so for example, on the same GPU. Uh, we recently did a more in-depth talk uh, at the MUX 2021. I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, basic high-level idea is that um, we have this kind of inference backend that virtualizes the, uh, the hardware that's under, uh, underneath. Uh, and from there, uh, the backend can uh, dynamically load different AI models uh, to do different types of inferencing. Uh, and the AI filter that's already built into FFmpeg can kind of utilize this inference backend uh, and, and be able to fit into the FFmpeg workflow. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Um, we, uh, everything's open, everything we work on is open source, so I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, we're also hiring across marketing, engineering, um, you know, developer, uh, um, developer evangelism. So uh, yeah, if you're interested, check out lifehere.com slash jobs. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so, so we are built on a layer two solution called Arbitrum. 
um, which is a kind of a proof of stake system that uh, that anchors the blo uh, the security on the main blockchain, but it's you know kind of a uh, it's, it's not GPU mined per se. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you. Last presentation of the afternoon. Let's give it up for that. That was uh, some masochism that you've all endured over the last uh, little bit. Some really interesting talks, but this, this uh, I'm happy to be wrapping up tonight. I'm going to be really quick, I promise. <clears throat> My name is Jeff Denworth. I'm uh, uh, co-founder, chief marketing officer for a company called Vast Data. Happy to kind of debut or showcase what we're doing at today's startup event, but I think it's probably fair to say that we've kind of graduated from the startup pantheon. Um, Vast is a, a, an enterprise and a cloud scale data center storage provider. Uh, we have a distinction of already being the back end of two of the world's leading OTT services, uh, providing all of the back end for origin services, all the back end for their transcoding. And what we built is a next generation storage architecture that's really designed for highly scalable video delivery, uh, but also with a mind towards what people want to do in the future with respect to AI inference and from the perspective of AI deep learning. And so what we've kind of, <clears throat> the core mission of the company, when we started the company, we, we basically charted a path to build a simpler storage architecture than what's come before us. Uh, and a lot of what we think about actually foots back to a white paper that was written in 2003 by Google about the Google file system. Basically an idea that you could build distributed storage systems out of nodes that have direct attached disk and you scale things out using these concepts. And for the last 20 years, that's kind of been the way that people have done things. This architecture has taken the world to great levels, but at the same time creates a lot of challenges for organizations with respect to resilience. None of these architectures were designed in an era of flash. And what we realized when we started the company in 2015 is that you can build something different. And so what we've put together is a next generation systems architecture that we call disaggregated and shared everything. And imagine a distributed system that um, via connection over NVMe over fabrics, you can build storage architectures that can scale to thousands or tens of thousands of processors, all that have shared access to thousands or tens of thousands of NVMe devices. These processors become stateless Docker containers that manage your infrastructure over the network and can be completely composable. And the SSDs underneath are the lowest cost SSDs that people can get their hands on. And so what we're building is a system that provides next levels of resilience, scale, and ultimately simplicity. Our job is to take the parameters away from customers that they have had to historically design storage by and make things so much simpler than what they've dealt with in the past. It starts with those containers. And as I mentioned earlier, they're stateless. So you can build machines to the thousands that don't have any, any metadata in them. They don't have anything other than functions that they run and basically expose a large scale namespace out to your applications, out to your consumers using cattle principles, not pet principles. So if you lose one, if you lose a hundred, if you lose all but one, you don't care because your service is still online. Uh, and when you lose a machine, in our case, you never have to rebuild data from a latency perspective, from a system load perspective, it's such a more elegant way to build distributed storage infrastructure. Now everything connects over ethernet. On the back end, there was some discussion earlier about uh, NVMe over fabrics running over top of PCIe. We love it because it can run at web scale. And so you can now start to build web scale distributed clusters where all of the CPUs have basically PCI levels of access to all of the flash. And underneath, from the flash perspective, these systems that we call disaggregated shared everything systems, these days systems, have the most affordable flash that you can build upon. We use a type of flash that's only otherwise being used by hyperscalers called QLC flash. Today you can buy this flash for roughly about three times the cost of a hard drive. We take these devices, 
We manage them such that you can get 10 years of utility from them. We add on top of them erasure codes that have only 2.5% overhead. And then we apply a next generation form of global compression that allows you to take all of your files and compress them together using Z standard. And what you get from that is an architecture that comes in at a price point that is not any different than what you spend for hard drive based storage. And so to date, we've delivered about three exabytes of this infrastructure around the world. Uh, media is one of the key places that we focus. And what we believe we're building is one of the, um, the next generation cloud storage infrastructure for basically the back, backbone of your streaming environments. Archive economics, we're already operating at six nines of availability in the field. And there is no mechanically induced latency in the system. Once you can get to that true end state that customers have been working to get to for the last five, 10 years of building all flash data centers where you don't worry about the cost of infrastructure anymore, then you just have flash. The power of flash in terms of aggregate bandwidth, the power of flash in terms of aggregate IOPS, and never a spinning disk that trips up and adds latency into your, uh, into your streams. And so today, this is commonly used in the media market in, as a distributed S3 storage system. We also have other protocols that we support, such as NFS. Uh, and what we've become with the power of this platform is the fastest growing infrastructure company in history. Uh, as of last spring, we announced we graduated our Series D funding, um, invested in by companies like NVIDIA, General Atlantic, uh, and we have about $3.7 billion valuation, which establishes us as the most valuable private storage company in history, and we're just getting started. And so happy to answer any questions that you have today or uh, any other days. We have a booth over there, and uh, look forward to talking with you all. Thank you. Specializing in brevity. It's my new thing. Any questions? All right, let's go drink. Thank you. <laughs>